Mr. Darcy and the Governess, written by Alex James, narrated by Stevie Zimmerman. No AI training. Without in any way limiting the author's, publisher's or narrator's exclusive rights under copyright, any use of this audiobook to train generative artificial intelligence, AI, technologies, to generate text or voice is expressly prohibited. The narrator reserves all rights to license use of this work for generative AI training and development of machine learning models of any type. Introduction In 1814, Napoleon Bonaparte was finally defeated after a tumultuous series of battles that had dominated Europe for over a decade. The Treaty of Fontainebleau was subsequently signed, forcing the abdication of Napoleon and his exile to Elba, a small rugged island in the Mediterranean Sea. Though stripped of his vast empire, he was still granted authority over his new dominion. Under Napoleon's brief reign, Elba began to thrive, and the exiled emperor's presence turned the once obscure island into a curious attraction. Many tourists, diplomats and dignitaries travelled to this little island off the Italian coast, some out of loyalty, and others driven by sheer curiosity, eager to glimpse the fallen conqueror. Many were received graciously. However, this relative peace was short-lived. In February 1815, the cage was shattered. Napoleon, with his insatiable ambition, was free, igniting a series of events that would shake the very foundations of Europe once more. 1. Darcy, January 1815 Darcy, you simply must stop being so pig-headed about this. Georgiana will do perfectly well in Bath with Lord Palmer and his family. Why do you insist on sending her to Kent to suffer Aunt Catherine? Bath is five times more thrilling for a girl of her age. I glanced up from the letter I was writing at my cousin, Colonel Richard Fitzwilliam, as he paced a hole in my new Turkish rug. The location is immaterial. Georgiana has had a most trying year, and I prefer something of a respite for her, before your lady mother begins preparing her for her come-out. So, why not let her stay with you at Pemberley? My pen paused. Because I will be in Scotland. Scotland? What the devil for? I shook my head and resumed my letter. I did not expect you would understand. It is something I must do, that is all. Richard kept pacing, sending hisses and dark looks my way. Oh, you're right. I don't understand. In fact, I don't understand almost anything you've done all summer. And why are you and Bingley suddenly no longer speaking? I carefully dipped my pen, hoping Richard had not perceived the flinching of my cheek or the quaking of my hand. Who said that? We simply have not seen one another since summer. Ah, and I suppose that was not the cut direct Miss Bingley gave me when I passed her in London, but merely an instance of bad timing. Undoubtedly. Do try not to manufacture intrigue where none exists, Richard. I'm going north for a period of privacy and reflection. A privacy and misery, you mean? I arched a brow and dipped my pen again. And while I am away, I wish for Georgiana to visit our aunt. She will be quite happy in Kent. Look, you may put whatever suffering you like upon yourself, but why punish Georgie? I thought Lord Palmer's daughter, Lady Sophia, was her particular friend. Has she not invited Georgiana to attend the pump rooms with her? An invitation Georgiana only accepted to be polite. You and I both know how she loathes large gatherings of frilly, frocked fuss budgets. I dipped my pen and continued writing. Which is why it will do her good to become used to such environ, for such will undoubtedly be her future. Oh, come, Darcy, if you would have her ever learn to be at her ease in much company, she must be permitted to experience it before her come out. Now, if you send her to Bath, out of the question. Richard braced his hands on my desk and dropped to eye level with me. If this is about what happened in Ramsgate last year... I glared up at him. Nothing happened in Ramsgate. Nothing at all. Are we quite understood? He rolled his eyes and straightened. Of course, but this is nothing like... Of a pity's sake, man, she would be escorted by one of the most distinguished families of the temps. I ask you to name a more auspicious opportunity. I thinned my lips and continued my task. Do you see what I'm writing here? 
It is a letter to Lord Palmer, declining his family's gracious invitation. My mind is quite made up. Richard heaved himself into a chair and crossed his knees, a vulgar posture he employed whenever it suited him to aggravate me. Then I see I have no choice but to inform you of something most awkward. I raised a brow and continued to write. Oh, it uh, concerns Lady Catherine's parson and a certain young lady. My hand twitched, depositing an unsightly pool of ink in the middle of my letter and spoiling the page. I sighed and wadded the paper up to toss it in the hearth. There, you have achieved your end. I am listening. What is this about? About a young lady? Richard cleared his throat and crossed his legs the other way. Well, you must remember the Reverend Collins. He is expected to become a family man. I dropped my pen into a jar on my desk. How is that any of my concern? Oh, come now, Darcy. Your memory cannot be so short that you've forgotten his cousin from... Richard stopped, squinted, then shook his head. And do you know, perhaps it is as well that you do forget. She was rather fetching, after all. My cheek flinched. If it is Elizabeth Bennet to whom you refer, I cannot think why you believe I would be troubled in any way by her relation to Lady Catherine's parson. I have no connection to her. Oh, very well, then. In that case, I suppose the rumours I have heard could not interest you. I pulled open my drawer to search for another sheet of writing paper, keeping my eyes carefully averted. And what rumours have you heard? Huh? Oh, oh, it was probably nothing of import. Silly stuff from Lady Catherine and Anne's last letter, you know. But our aunt seems to have it on good authority that the family was in some disgrace, over her younger sister or something of the kind. And then Miss Elizabeth topped it off by turning down something of a remarkably eligible suitor shortly afterward, and you have got it backward. She rejected. I blinked and closed my mouth. Never mind. You said a sister was disgraced. Richard squinted, then cleared his throat. Ah, yes, I have few details there. Like enough, that little tidbit was made up. But Lady Catherine spared none of her disdain for Miss Elizabeth's refusal of some advantageous match. And the story goes that Mrs. Bennet was so greatly put out about it that she vowed to disown her daughter. And as the Collinses will soon welcome their first olive branch, as Lady Catherine put it, the general assumption is that Miss Elizabeth will go to live with them as a companion of sorts. But of course, that is only hearsay. I tapped my fingers on my desk, a shiver travelling up my spine. Elizabeth Bennet, back in Kent, where she had humiliated me beyond reason. I swallowed and tried to still the trembling of my hand. Hearsay, I repeated. I should call that entire story a figment of Lady Catherine's spiteful imagination. And even if it is not, I cannot imagine why you think it would affect me, or Georgiana for that matter. Oh, you don't say. It would not trouble you a whit to have Georgie stranded in Kent— where her only friend is like to be a woman with a disgraced family. A charming one, I grant you, which will make it all the more difficult when... I laced my fingers tightly on my desk and tried to steady my breathing. Georgiana and Elizabeth, friends. Could the torment be any worse? But what if it availed me of an opportunity to see her again? I shall not suspend any pleasure of theirs by refusing to let them associate with one another. Richard pinched the bridge of his nose and growled. Oh, very well. If you will not be hinted to, you will be forced. Darcy, you cannot send Georgiana to Lady Catherine because I need her to go to Lord Palmer's family. And I must have you in Italy by order of the General. Me? In Italy? I snorted. What the devil for? And I thought this conversation was about Georgiana and Kent. It was when I was trying to be subtle... But there is no chance of such nicety with you, for you will do as you bloody well please, no matter my efforts. So, allow me to be blunt. I need a way to send messages through Lord Palmer that will not attract suspicion. As for you, the General requires someone in Livorno, and he's asked for you by name. I chuckled and shook my head. You forget I've not served His Majesty's colours since my brother George died. I am a private gentleman now. I leaned forward to dip my pen again. The general has no authority over me. No, of course not. And by what possible means could he influence a man of your stature? Surely money would be no inducement. And as you have said, he cannot order you to comply. Quite right. But... 
I raised a brow. Here it comes, your trump card. What is it this time? Our old friend on Elba, that is what. While all Europe sighs in relief and tries to return to the way things were a generation ago, we are hearing rumours through official channels that things may not be so peaceful and settled as they appear. And what am I to do about that? You know people, Darcy. You have the distinction of a gentleman of leisure, like all the other tourists who are even now flooding the channel to fawn at the feet of that bloody tyrant. But you are not so easily fooled as some. I stiffened in my chair. You want me to visit Napoleon, take tea and crumpets with him as if he were some old comrade? That I do. And to what purpose? Richard caught up my marble paperweight and tossed it in the air, catching it idly and tossing it again. Why, I want you to use that aristocratic charm and that perceptive head of yours to learn if he is hiding anything. He's been too complacent for a man of his temperament. Surely he has something planned. The general needs a man who can lounge about and drink like a fop, yet still keep his wits about him enough to spot anything amiss. I cross my arms. And if I decline, what happens then? Richard caught the paperweight one last time with a flourish. Oh, possibly nothing. But if we are being fooled and things are as I fear... He turned his palm over, and the paperweight dropped with a crash, gouging a dent into the polished wood of the floor. We may all suffer. Elizabeth. You have few enough qualifications and no connections of note. Were it not for Mrs. Goddard's recommendation, I doubt I should have even agreed to see you. I shifted in the hard back chair and tried to sit half an inch taller, squaring my gaze with the woman opposite me. Mrs. Goddard hardly knew my name, save as a friend of Charlotte's. Hopefully the lady would not question my references too closely. Charlotte knew I would not go to live with her, and could only offer so much help, apart from the reference, and the tip about the position. I wetted my lips and sucked in a breath. Baroness Holt was an imposing creature, fair-complected and adorned in the finest fashions, with an air of supremacy about her. But I was not lightly intimidated. Moreover, I did not mean to let this opportunity pass me by. Oh, surely, my lady, the interests of the children must take precedence over connections and fashion. You mentioned a desire for your daughters to be governed with a gentle hand and to learn their languages, and what I want is a governess who will make them presentable when I call for them and who knows her place well enough to keep them out of the way the rest of the time. Baroness Holt dipped her fingers into a little gold box and delicately sniffed until her eyes watered. Then she sneezed, and carried on as if nothing at all had happened. "'You must know that I have spoken to a dozen other young ladies, and you have little to recommend you by comparison. They are all gentlewomen by birth, and all fallen into reduced circumstances, but none of the others are tainted by scandal.' My ears burned, and I twisted my fingers in my lap. "'The scandal you speak of is no more than a malicious rumour, my lady,' My younger sister did marry hastily, but there is nothing... Oh, you may spare the excuses, Miss Bennet. We both know these things cannot be hushed up, but they can be conquered if one is bold enough. She frowned and sighed, shaking her head as she looked me over again. I suppose I may as well try you. I had it in my mind to bring on a governess whose looks would be a credit to me, but now that I see you, I quite like the notion of someone a little plainer... "'My heavens, but you are a dark little slip of a thing. "'Goodness knows I do not need Lord Holt's eye to wander. "'There, my mind is quite settled. "'I shall call the maid to prepare your room. "'You shall meet the children on the morrow after their morning tea.' "'I blinked. "'Er, uh, th thank you, my lady.' "'That was the first time I had ever thanked anyone for insulting me. "'But with a sinking ache in my stomach, "'I realised it would probably not be the last.' Baroness Holt was known to be scandalous in her own right. The Baron was, after all, her third husband, and rumours persisted about the parentage of her eldest daughter. But she was also offering almost double what most governesses earned. Because despite the pomp and prestige of the Holt name, everyone she had hired left within a fortnight. It was probably because of the children. Three girls, I was told, ages six, nine and twelve. The youngest was said to run and hide from her governesses, 
leading them on merry chases lasting for hours. The eldest was reputed to leave nasty surprises, such as garden snakes and dead rats hidden among her previous governess's undergarments. I knew nothing of the middle child, save that she had a ghostly frightened appearance in the family portrait hanging in Baroness Holt's sitting room. It could be worse, I assured myself. I could be trying to govern someone like Lydia. I followed the maid through the spacious corridors of Holt House, trying not to look as awed and quaint as I felt. Truly, this house was one of the gems of London. If I had to give up the life of a gentlewoman to become a governess, there were far less splendid places I could have found myself. What would Jane think when I wrote to tell her of this place? The plush carpets, the soaring windows, the endless columns of marble. I knew perfectly well what she would think. She would cast herself over her bed and weep for me, as she had when I told her my decision to leave Longbourn. She would mourn for the future I had given up, when I determined to go into service, as starkly as if I had truly died. And she would grieve for herself, because unless I could secretly put away enough savings for us both, her fate would eventually be the same as mine. But this would not be so bad. I looked around the little room the maid had shown me. It was larger than my room at Longbourn had been, though not half as comfortable. The bed was narrow and hard, the furnishings threadbare, and the floor rough. But it had its own window, and even looked over a treed patio, with the golden ash leaves hanging low over a stone seat. And there was a shelf in the corner of the room, large enough for a few books of my own. Indeed, I could make do here. It was a far cry from all I had once hoped. It was far from my family, in every sense of the phrase, and far from my heart. I might never spend another winter morning curled in the window seat at Longbourn, watching my mother with her darning, or my father reading his book by the fire. I might never walk again to Oakham Mount, or hear my sister's laughter down the hall. I might never find love, or have a family of my own. But I could make a way for myself after all that had been lost, and God willing, perhaps I could prevent Jane from making a disastrous marriage, just to save our younger sisters. It was not Jane's fault that all eligible suitors had turned from our family. It was not she who had been heedless of all warning, and deaf to all reason, and it was not she who might have prevented the disgrace. The burden ought not to be hers. I was the one, after all, whose pride had led to this dreadful fall. 2. Darcy, Paris, one week later. Fitzwilliam Darcy, to what do I owe the pleasure? Mary, come and see just what washed ashore. I tugged off my gloves and gave my hat to a servant at the door. Uh, Calvin, you haven't aged a day in ten years. Wendell Calvin, a minor official of the British consulate in Paris, had been a friend of my father's in his youth. Bald and rail thin, even as a young man, time had done little to change his appearance. He beamed and clapped me on the shoulder as he welcomed me into the house. Ah, that's very kind, lad, but I hardly recognise you. Mary, look how this one sprouted. I suppose you still take your tea the same way. A dash of cream and no sugar, if I recall. I smiled and allowed him to lead me to the sitting room of his flat. I do, and thank you. I was surprised to find you here again. Where else would I be? As soon as they got that Corsican put away, Stuart himself came to me and asked me to return to Paris. So, he spread his arms and grinned, here I am. He could not have done better, I assured him. Calvin was not born of gentility, a fact attested to by his manner, but he was a renowned expert in finance. His talents were such that for twenty years his advice had been sought by tradesmen and nobility alike, and he possessed the unique ability to socialise with all strata of society without stigma. During the Peace of Amiens, he had briefly attended the Lord Whitworth, the British ambassador in Paris, with the task of stabilising the flood of British currency into the continent. And it was then, at the tender age of seven and ten, that I had first met Calvin, in June of 1802, with my father's blessing, I joined droves of my fellows across the Channel to resume the tradition of a grand tour of Paris, and like the generations that went before us, we sought lodgings and met our material needs at the homes of our countrymen. But our tour was interrupted when war broke out again, less than a year later. Calvin had been the one to see my companions and me safely from Paris to Guernsey, where we were able to pay a British smuggler to take us home, 
He remained in France himself, however, to help others, and was captured for his efforts, but with some lenient treatment by Napoleon's officials, he managed an escape some months later. And here he was again, lodged in the same house even, called by his country to lend his considerable talents to the financial problems at hand. Calvin summoned his house servant to bring the tea, and gestured for me to choose a seat. Scarcely had I touched the upholstery when I sprang up again to greet Mrs. Calvin. She was a direct contrast to him, scarcely higher than my chest, with apple-shaped cheeks, an ample girdle, and jet-black hair that was as glossy as I remembered. I bowed as she came to grasp my hand. "'Young Master Darcy,' she bubbled. "'Fancy you turning up at our door. Oh, and I've just given up our last room to a pair of students.' I kissed the lady's fingers and waited for her to take a seat beside her husband. "'That is very kind of you, Mrs. Calvin, but I am only in Paris briefly and have already secured my own lodgings.' "'Ah, a gentleman of leisure these days!' Calvin leaned closer to examine my jacket, his old-fashioned monocle pinched tightly to his eye. "'The last I heard of you, you broke your old father's heart by donning the king's colours. You were on the peninsula, I believe. A lieutenant?' I nodded gravely. "'But do not paint me as a hero. I was the general's aide, and my weapons were not balls and muskets, but pen and paper. But I resigned my commission in 08, when my father and brother were both killed.' Calvin's monocle dropped from his eye. Good Lord, I had not heard. I nodded, turning the teacup on the saucer as I stared into its amber depths. A carriage accident. I drank in a long breath. They were trying a new pair of horses, and a storm came upon them. My host sat back, his brow furrowed, as he sipped from his cup. By Jove, I am sorry to hear it, and sorrier still that I did not know sooner— You've a sister, do you not? Georgiana, she is well, sixteen, and as beautiful as my mother. And you will be the master of Pemberley now. Is there a Mrs. Darcy waiting for you back in Derbyshire? Aye, all the fine ladies have been missing the French lace these ten years. You will have a tall order to fill when you return home, I shouldn't wonder. I shook my head and took a long draught of my tea. No. I did not miss the glances exchanged by the Calvins, but they said nothing more as I set my saucer aside and straightened my cuffs. I am come to Paris on an errand for my cousin. You remember Fitzwilliam, do you not? How oh, could I forget? Calvin scoffed. Nearly drank my larder dry. Indeed, I fear you recall correctly. He is now a colonel by virtue of meritorious service to his country, and he has asked a, a favour of me, if you will. And that is? A matter of secrecy, I'm afraid. But before I embark upon his errand, I wish to see for myself what the prevailing sentiment is regarding the present state of the monarchy. Calvin leaned back in his chair with a hiss and a huff, and glanced at his wife. Did you wish for the official version? Uh, the reality, if you please. Well, then. He scratched his chin in thought. Some people say the Bourbons are sure to bring peace back to the continent— a restoration of stability in France, some return to sanity and normalcy, dignity and tradition, you understand? I nodded. And the other people? Calvin grinned and shook his head. Ah, the very reason you came to me rather than some other. Those who matter already miss Napoleon. He's good business, for French and English alike. Say what you will for the old tyrant, but he has a head for economics and public opinion— and if he should manage to set foot on French soil again, why, I shouldn't wonder if he were able to march on Paris itself with scarcely a shot fired. I thinned my lips. That was what I feared you might say. Elizabeth. Ah! Uh, ah! Uh, I held my breath and scrunched my eyes tightly shut. Ah! Uh, I pressed my knuckles to my nose as the back of my neck tingled in protest. But it was no good. The maid finished shaking out the coverlet for my bed and looked up as she smoothed out the downy surface. Do you have a cold, Miss Bennet? I sniffed and blinked the water from my eyes. No, Alice, I'm not ill. Feathers make me sneeze. And flowers, particularly daisies, and grass and willow trees. I sniffed again. Actually, almost anything with dust or pollen. So you get sick whenever there's a bit of dirt? I cleared my throat. Not sick, just a little itchy and sneezy. 
Shall I send word to Baroness Alt, ma'am? You oughtn't meet the children in such a state. I caught a sharp breath, stifling another sneeze, and waited for the shivers to abate. Another deep breath, and I felt safe enough to speak again. There, see, it is already passing, but I wonder if I might trouble you for a coverlet not made of goose down. I'm afraid I was sneezing most of the night. Alice glanced at the bed she'd just made, then back at me with a bewildered look. But there's a fearful nip in the air, Mum, and the mistress said to send up a nice thick one, you being a gentle lady and all. Yes, I appreciate the gesture, but if I am to have my wits about me during the day, I shan't wish to spend every night until May sneezing under that coverlet. Oh, there's no fear of that, Alice said brightly. You'll have to do something smaller for your cabin, Mum. I narrowed my eyes. Oh, of course, for my cabin. I sniffed and rubbed the last of the itchiness from my eyes. Likely my head was still foggy enough from irritation and lack of sleep that I wouldn't make much sense of anything Alice said. But did she mean to imply that I would be sleeping in a woodsman's cottage? Surely not. Alice helped me dress, and I confess I heard less than half of what she said. A stiff cup of Hill's lemon and ginger tea. That was what I needed just now. But I would have to make do with limp, colourless tea leaves that had already been steeped too many times, and not nearly enough cream and sugar to make the entire endeavour worth my while. I downed the tasteless brew in a few hasty gulps, squared my shoulders, and brushed the curls off my face. "'Are you sure you're well enough, Mum?' Alice asked, as she began to collect my breakfast tray. "'To be no shame in waiting. Oh, don't be silly, I was not brought on to idle in my room now, was I?' I brushed down the front of my gown and set my hand on the doorknob. Time to face my new task, and truly I was looking forward to the challenge. After all, how much trouble could three young girls really be? I stared back at three stony faces and forced a smile as the door clicked behind me. I'd barely been given their names, and now I was on my own, and I'd not the slightest notion of how to begin. Well then, I chirped as brightly as I could manage. I'm sure we will get on famously. You may call me Miss Elizabeth when it is just us. Will that suit? The only answer was the ticking of the clock. The youngest sister sniffed loudly and wiped her finger across her nose, without the benefit of a handkerchief. But otherwise there was no response. Hmm, well, I suppose we ought to get to know one another. If you don't mind, would you tell me a little about yourselves? I looked expectantly at Emily, the eldest. She had sleek black hair, eyes that were flat and dark as jet, and a scowl that pierced like daggers. I'm certain that was the intent. She blinked slowly, stuck her lower jaw out, and hissed a sigh. I'm too old for a governess. I should be away at school studying with the masters. I arched a brow. I suppose that is for your mother to decide. As we are presently here together, let us make the best of it. Do you enjoy reading, painting, or perhaps you play the pianoforte? Emily's expression was deadpan. No. She flicked a long black braid over her shoulder and turned away to sink into the window seat. She set her chin on her fist and gazed out on the lawn. I sucked a short breath between my teeth, holding on to that false smile for all I was worth and moving on to the next girl. Well, then, I believe your name was Beatrice, is that correct? Beatrice had milky blue eyes and a wild mop of blonde hair that looked as if she had just tumbled down a hill, despite the pins and ribbons her maid had stuck into place, with more optimism than success. Beatrice's eyes widened and her mouth worked, but no sound came out. Yes, I asked, leaning close and cupping my ear. I did, did, did. Beatrice stopped with a gulp. That is, I... She wants you to call her B, the youngest sister interrupted. She hates being called Beatrice ever since Mrs Topher. I turned to six-year-old Penelope, with her equally untamed locks of fiery auburn and the most impertinent rash of freckles over her nose. And who is Mrs Topher? She was here last spring. She used to slap a pointer stick on her skirts whenever she said our names. It scared B something fierce. And then Emily put something in her tea, and she went away. My mouth ran dry. Went away. Penelope nodded with a proud jerk of her head. 
The minister came and waved his hand over her, and then they took her away with a blanket over her, and then we had Mrs. Grayson. Her brow furrowed. Then Miss Ashford and Mrs. Wilcox, and I do not recall the next two. Then there was Miss White, but she was only here for a few days. She got sick. Penelope rubbed her stomach and popped out the front of her dress to mimic a woman heavy with child. I think she ate something bad, you know. I blinked. Is that so? Penelope flashed a toothless grin. Yes. Oh, and everyone calls me Poppy. Poppy? I repeated. Does, sir... Uh... I gestured for her to lean close and whispered into her ear. Does Emily often put things in the governess's tea? Oh, no, only twice or three times. Her forehead wrinkled, then she shrugged flippantly. Actually, I do not remember how many times, but she only did it if they were bad. I swallowed. Right, Three. Darcy. Are you certain you must leave so soon? Surely there's no rush. I allowed Calvin's manservant to help me with my coat, then turned to him with a reluctant smile. I'm afraid I must. I have already delayed my travel by a week, just in coming to Paris to speak with you. I'm flattered, Darcy, but I understand the weather has several ships stopped in port as it is. Already I'm hearing of delayed shipments from some of our merchants, Oh, you can gain nothing by hurrying off to Le Havre so soon. Perhaps not, but I would prefer to secure a berth on the first available ship. And please give Mrs. Calvin my respects. He thinned his lips and shrugged. Ah, very well. I never saw anyone change your mind once you made it up. Farewell, Darcy. I tipped my hat and thanked him. The carriage I had hired was waiting on the street, with the door open and the step already down. I nodded to the coachman, then turned for one last glance at the house. Calvin waved cheerfully, and I touched my hat as the carriage door closed. Perhaps I might return for a more extended stay on my journey home, whenever that would be. Allez, s'il vous plaît, I called to the coachman. The carriage jerked, and I removed my hat to rest against the squabs. It would be three and a half days back to Le Havre. The fool's errand to come first to Paris, Richard had said. Why add a week of travel just for an hour's conversation with an old man? But as I had refused to venture on to Italy without first speaking to Calvin, Richard had swallowed the rest of his complaints. Just send word as soon as possible, he had admonished. And perhaps it is best if you do not tell everyone in town where you've gone. That, I assured him, is the farthest thing from my mind. After all, it was not as if I had grand plans for the festive season— a dozen invitations to balls and soirees, of course, surely attended by a score of debutantes all hoping to ensnare some poor sop with a ring and a smile. I'd already refused all such invitations, for I had previously intended to flee to Scotland. What did it matter to any of them that I'd gone to the continent instead? Bingley might have found me out, though. It was not by design, more by happenstance. I'd passed his carriage near the dockyards, and seen the flash of his face in the window as he went by. He would have heard that I was supposedly gone to Scotland, but I was sure he'd recognise my carriage, though I'd taken one that did not bear the Darcy crest. Not that it mattered. Bingley would be the last man to care whether I sailed south or took a north road. We'd not spoken since he had discovered my part in keeping him from Miss Bennet last year, and to my eternal shame it was not because I had confessed my actions like a man. No, Instead, he had overheard his sister boasting to a friend how it had all come about. And I, coward that I was, had missed my chance to make it right before my honour was blasted in public. How he had stormed into my study that afternoon to scorch me for my wrongs. It was, perhaps, the first time in his life that Bingley had lost his temper. And I had done nothing to absolve myself. Perhaps it was my penance of sorts. My arrogance had already cost me Elizabeth. I deserve the censure of the world for my errors. I closed my eyes and sighed, pinching the bridge of my nose. There was no recovery, and nothing ahead of me but the long teeth of time. My dearest Georgiana, I arrived in La Havre this afternoon, and I'm trying to secure a berth to Lisbon. The harbour master informs me that while the channel remains passable, severe weather in the North Atlantic has been turning back ships this past week, and more winter storms are expected. I fear it may be some days before the tide is favourable. 
I found my friend in Paris in good health. He sends his regards, as does his lady wife. His business is not flourishing so well as he had hoped, but he believes matters will begin to improve early next year, should fortune smile upon him. I think you will like this sketch I include of the new oriental rug his wife has purchased. Perhaps we may consider one like it for the blue drawing room at Pemberley. Pray, do try to enjoy yourself in Bath. I am sorry to miss the ice skating in Hyde Park and all our winter traditions, but I trust you will have a merry time with the Palmers. I enclose a lace handkerchief that I purchased from a charming Parisian shop. I know little of such matters, but I am assured the lace work is in the latest fashion, and I trust you will think of me when you keep it with you. Yours most affectionately, Fitzwilliam. I sealed the letter carefully, and called for a messenger to carry it to a ship waiting in port. In a mere two days' time it would be across the Channel, and in the hands of Lord Palmer, who would give it first to Georgiana, then to Richard, and hopefully with her help, Richard would understand my veiled comments regarding the Parisian's outlook on changing politics. I ought to have written more to Georgiana. She had been distressed at my leaving, and nervous about being sent to Bath with the Palmers. Some words of comfort and reassurance on my part would not have gone amiss. But just now my heart had little strength for more than the simplest of greetings. One day, perhaps, it would be whole again. But I could not make it so myself. Elizabeth. Poppy! I clutched my skirts and charged down the servant's staircase, my shoes scrambling on the uneven steps. Come back this instant! A giggle echoed below me, followed by the clatter of tiny shoes, lightly tripping down the staircase. But Poppy didn't stop. She rounded the corner at the narrow landing, and I heard a maid yelp, and a bucket sloshed. Momentum carried me around the bend in the stairwell, and time seemed to slow as my feet recoiled in horror. The maid, Alice, was struggling to keep her balance, her eyes widening in panic, as she attempted to steady the overflowing bucket of steaming bathwater. In a futile attempt to evade the collision, she sidestepped and stumbled, her feet tangling in the hem of her apron, taking both of us down. I don't recall precisely how it happened. I only knew that in the next second I was howling in shock and pain, and the front of my gown was all but smoking with scalding water. Ah! Oh! I hissed, trying to pull the clinging hot fabric from my skin. I'm sorry, miss, Alice cried, her voice filled with panic as she knelt beside me, eyes wide with horror. She scrambled to find something to help, fumbling with her apron and offering it to me in a futile attempt to dry off. Are you hurt? Ouch, that was my hand you just stepped on. Alice jumped back. Oh, begging your pardon. Can you stand, miss? I sat up, brushed fresh tangles out of my face, and tested each of my limbs. I don't think anything is broken. Are you well? Aye, but I'll have to fetch another bucket, or the mistress will be right put out with me. She offered me her hand, and I took it, swaying and tottering in the narrow staircase. I expect that will be the least of our worries. That little urchin will be the death of me, I'm sure of it. I tugged at the front of my gown to cool off the burning sensation, and struggled to regain my composure. My face flushed, and my dignity in tatters. It was then that the sound of approaching footsteps caught my attention. I turned my head, and there, standing at the kitchen threshold, was Lady Holt herself, her brow furrowed with disapproval. Her eyes widened in dismay as she took in the sight before her. Alice, whimpering softly and mincing away with her empty bucket, and me, dripping wet, my gown steaming and clinging to me like a second skin. I could only imagine what she must be thinking— I had failed to keep track of a six-year-old child, and now I stood in her presence with the translucent fabric of my gown, leaving precisely nothing to the imagination. With a sigh, Lady Holt shook her head. Miss Bennet, I had hoped for better from you. Surely I do not need to remind you of the decorum and control expected of a governess. We cannot have the children embarrassing us on the ship. My heart sank at her words, and confusion clouded my mind. The ship, I stammered. She hissed in exasperation. Yes, of course, on the ship. Why do you think I was in such a rush to take you on? Can you or can you not keep the children in hand on our voyage? I blinked. I, I wasn't aware of any voyage, my lady. 
Lady Holt lifted her nose and peered down the length of it at me as she replied, "'Well, it seems communication is not your strongest suit, Miss Bennet. We have been making preparations for weeks. We sail for Italy tomorrow on board the Flambeau. Surely you were informed?' The revelation hit me like a gust of wind. A voyage? Italy? How had this information escaped me? I... I must apologise, Lady Holt, I mumbled. I I must have neglected... I assure you I will do my utmost to rectify this oversight. Lady Holt let out a frustrated sigh, her tone dripping with condescension. Well, there is no time now to seek another governess. We depart soon, and we must make do... I trust you will be more attentive in the future, Miss Bennet. I gulped, my eyes blurring for a moment. How the devil was I to keep track of Poppy on the open ocean? She'd be overboard before we even left port. I could only nod, my mind racing with scrambled thoughts, and a sinking feeling of impending disaster. Lady Holt turned away, muttering something under her breath that I couldn't entirely catch, about not being able to find good help. My gown had cooled somewhat, and now it felt heavy and humiliating. I made my way back upstairs to my room, so stunned that I was searching for a banister that wasn't there in the servant's staircase. Poppy would resurface eventually, for now I needed dry attire, something that didn't cling to my bosom with the transparency of one of Lydia's threadbare stockings. As I ascended the stairs, my mind still reeling, I noticed Emily, the eldest daughter, She was standing in the doorway of my room, peering curiously out. Her sullen expression turned into a scowl at my approach. A prickle of indignant rage raced over my skin. Even Lydia had never been that bold. "'Miss Emily,' I snapped. "'A gentleman's daughter should not go snooping where she does not belong.' Emily's glare met mine as she straightened herself, her hands hidden behind her back and an unmistakable glint in her eyes. I stepped closer. "'What have you hidden there, Miss Emily?' I demanded. "'Return it to me immediately.' She puckered her lips, then sighed and held out her hand, with a note crumpled in it. My heart nearly stopped, as I recognised the familiar paper with that broken red seal. It was the letter Mr Darcy had given me last April, when he confessed his feelings, and I had rejected him. "'Couldn't she have snooped through Mary's boring letters, or the last word I had from Charlotte before I left Longbourn?' the one where she went on and on about that olive branch of Mr. Collins. No, of course not. She had to find that one. So much for my first job as a governess. I snatched the letter from her hand. Have you read it? Emily's gaze shifted away, and her scowl deepened. No. I started breathing again, but I was still angry enough to spit. I closed my eyes, trying to calm myself before speaking. A governess ought to be calm. Collected. Miss Emily, I seethed. It is not your place to pry into other people's personal correspondence. Snooping is impolite and disrespectful. What do you mean by looking at my personal belongings? Emily's gaze met mine once again, her eyes brimming with rebellion. I don't trust you. Your gowns are far too fine for a governess. The sting of her words hit me and for a moment I hesitated. Lady Holt knew very well who I was, and from where I had come, and my story was hardly unique among governesses. But it was still so raw. Why, I had even packed my old ball gown and dancing slippers in that trunk I'd brought from Longbourn. It was not so very long ago that I had nurtured the same girlish dreams as Emily probably did, and I didn't care to explain any of it to anyone. But then, a sense of pride surged within me. I straightened my posture, meeting Emily's gaze squarely. You are not wrong. I am the daughter of a gentleman. But circumstances have required me to shift for myself. I am here to fulfil my duties as your governess, and I expect to be treated with respect. Now tell me, why is your family sailing to Italy? Emily shrugged. My father enjoys the warmer weather. Is there no other reason? Emily sneered. Oh, there is one more reason, if you must know. Mother is a great admirer of Napoleon Bonaparte. I think she'd marry him if she could. She's always writing him letters and sending him gifts. She wishes to pay a visit to him on Elba. 
Napoleon, did I hear you correctly? Is something wrong with your ears? I thinned my lips. Apparently not. Are you quite serious? They want to visit Napoleon. She lifted her shoulders. I don't actually know. Mother never tells us anything. But I read some of her letters. I sighed and levelled a dark look at her. At least I was not the only victim of her snooping. But he was our enemy. Why in blazes would they want to do such a foolish thing? Emily quirked a brow. If I answer, you will say I am being disrespectful again. Well, she had a point there. I glanced down at my clothing and waved her tiredly aside. I'll just go to the library or somewhere. I need to change. As she left, closing the door behind her, I sank onto my bed, a hundred troubles swirling in my mind. Italy? Seriously? What about my family? How could I write to them if I was to be thousands of miles away? I wouldn't know how Jane was. I wouldn't hear any news of Papa's health. Wouldn't hear how Lydia fared with that cad of a husband she'd ensnared. Wouldn't... I tugged at my laces and stared at the floor. I wouldn't have any chance of seeing him. Probably ever again. But I'd already known that, hadn't I? It was a pointless fancy that made me look over my shoulder each time I walked the London streets. Not that Mr Darcy would ever. Men did not return to women who had refused them, and gentlemen of Mr Darcy's station would never speak to a lowly governess. But I'd rehearsed the words in my head so many times, it felt like a cruel injustice of the universe, that I should never have a chance to utter them. Perhaps I could never return the feelings he claimed to hold for me, but I could retract some of my venom. He didn't deserve that, not so much as I had given him at any rate. I walked back to my trunk, and my fingers fumbled with the worn edges of the paper as I unfolded his letter and read it again. Each line was etched with regret and longing. My heart thudded, and I traced the familiar script with my fingertips. I knew each word so well, even down to the peculiar lift of certain letters, the curious scroll that marked his capital E's, and the odd little smudge he'd left at the bottom, just under his signature. It just wasn't right that I would never have a chance to tell him that, at least in some matters, I owed him an apology. 4. Darcy I was stuck in the port of Le Havre for the fourth day in a row, the unrelenting North Atlantic storms casting a gloomy shadow over my hopes of securing passage to Lisbon. By heaven, would this wind and rain never cease. Water dripped from my hat as I plodded through the bustling port again, the biting winter wind cutting through my coat and leaving me chilled to the bone. Richard was not high in my books just now. I greeted the harbour master with a curt nod. Any news on ships sailing to Lisbon? I asked in French. The harbour master sighed, his breath visible in the cold air. I'm afraid not, sir, he replied in perfect English. The weather shows no sign of easing, and most captains are refusing to brave the storm. I clenched my fists. Surely there must be someone willing to make the journey, and trade cannot simply grind to a halt for a week or more because of a storm. The harbour master shook his head. Nay, but it does. I understand your predicament, sir, but it will be another day or two before this storm abates. However, a ship just arrived from the Channel, the Flambeau. They're bound for Italy, and the captain sounded just as impatient as you. Italy? I wouldn't have to even bother with finding another ship from Lisbon to Livorno. What luck. Where can I find the captain? He's on the deck of the Flambeau, down by the East Dock, the harbour master replied, pointing in the ship's direction. But be warned, the captain is selective regarding passengers. Selective? I'd see about that. No one turned down a Darcy of Pemberley. I hastened towards the flambeau and paused momentarily before crossing the plank that took me aboard. The ship's deck was bustling with activity, crew members scurrying about, preparing for the voyage ahead. The captain was easy to spot, standing at the helm and watching his men. A captain, I called out. I've been informed of your voyage to Italy. I require passage to Livorno. I'm prepared to offer a substantial sum. The captain turned his gaze towards me and looked me up and down. I'm afraid, sir, that we have no available cabins for a gentleman of your calibre. 
I am willing to compensate generously. Surely there must be a way. And the captain cast an eye over my attire, and a brow went up. Your name, sir? Darcy, Fitzwilliam Darcy of Pemberley in Derbyshire. The captain shifted his jaw, glanced about the deck, then shook his head. Oh, gentlemen, you may be, but I'm already filled with lords and ladies who outrank you. The best I can offer you is a bunk among the commoners. A bunk? I demanded incredulously. What, with the merchants and labourers? He shrugged. Oh, you can still suck with the quality, but the bunk is all I have to offer you for a bed. We mean to sail on the evening tide, so if you'll take the berth, speak now. I hissed under my breath as I drew the coins for passage from my pocket. Very well. I trust your ship is capable of managing the seas. The captain took my coins with a grunt. Oh, she'll do well enough if you've the stomach for it. Did I? I'd never sailed on the high seas unless one counted that frenetic journey from the coast of France to Guernsey in a mere cutter. But I'd fared well enough then, so I nodded, my breath forming icy clouds in the wintry air. I returned to my temporary lodgings, the cold winds biting at my skin until my face felt as if it would freeze that way. Before I did anything else, I took a moment to write a letter to Georgiana, informing her of my impending departure. Leaving the missive to be sent back to England, I called for a boy to carry my trunk aboard the ship. Since I would not have my own cabin, I had not seen my trunk again until we reached Livorno, so I kept back a satchel with a few fresh shirts, a couple of handkerchiefs, and a few grooming items. Barbaric, but at least I would not likely encounter anyone who cared about my appearance on the ship. Half an hour later, I boarded the flambeau. The sailors were still taking cargo aboard, but one of them paused long enough to point me to a downward ladder. My quarters for the journey. My lip curled, but there was no help for it. Once I returned to England, I'd pay a little visit to Richard and inform him in no uncertain terms precisely what a pig-headed lout he was. I tossed my bag down the ladder and turned to make my descent when a shout drew my attention to the foredeck a small child running and screaming, causing chaos in her wake. Sailors scrambled and dodged, and one poor lad nearly dropped his cargo overboard. As it was, he pinwheeled against the ship railing and bumped into one of his fellows. I stopped, staring in awe at the pint-sized she-devil racing amid decks. Hot on her heels was what I assumed to be her governess, but it was obvious to anyone looking on that she lacked any sort of discipline over the child. I scoffed to myself, shaking my head, and this was one of the fine families the captain said outranked me. Such a scene would never have been tolerated at Pemberley. Determined to put the frustrations behind me, I descended into the depths of the ship, my nostrils assaulted by the mingling scents of salt water and unwashed bodies. The dimly lit space was far from the comforts I was accustomed to, but exhaustion weighed heavily on me. Relieved to finally be aboard a ship, I found my assigned bunk and settled down, willing sleep to claim me. Elizabeth. The flambeau swayed beneath my feet, and my stomach turned inside out. I clung to the cabin wall, my knuckles turning white as I tried to steady myself amidst the ship's relentless pitching and rolling. With each exaggerated movement, the vessel groaned and creaked, as if echoing our collective disbelief at the whims of the sea. Oh dear, I gasped, as another wave of dizziness washed over me. I thought the captain said we would be through the worst by morning. I closed my eyes and breathed in and out, in short, sharp bursts. If I could just control that, I might survive. Who in blazes thought of a sea voyage in late January? Sheer lunacy. A groan caused me to open my eyes and look round again. Poor B clung to her bunk, her face pale and filled with agony. I steadied myself against the cabin wall and approached her with what I hoped was more of a sympathetic smile than a grimace of nausea. Miss Lizzie, she whispered, I'm g g gonna die. Then she spasmed forward and retched. I caught a basin off the floor, just in time to catch her heaving. There, there, B, I cooed, stroking the sweat-stained hair off her brow. The sea sickness shall pass. Think of the adventures that await us in Italy. B mustered a weak smile. I, I'm trying, miss, but everything f f feels d d d upside down. On the bank just above B's, Emily rolled her eyes and crossed her arms. 
This ship is a floating casket. What a stupid idea. Why couldn't we have stayed in London? Well, she was right about one thing, at least. This journey was a stupid idea. But her attitude wasn't making it any less miserable. Oh, come now, Emily. Surely there's something that could make us marginally less miserable. What do you say? Shall I tell you all a story? She scoffed. It's morning, not bedtime. Besides, I'm too old for fairy tales. But Poppy is not, so you may feel free to cover your ears. Now, let me see. Oh, I pretended to brighten as if just recalling something, but in truth I was pulling threads out of thin air. What about the tale of the dancing dolphins and the foolish seagulls? Emily rolled over on her bunk to frown at me. There's no such story. You're making that up. I feigned a look of mock offence. All the best stories are made up by someone. Would you like to hear it? No. Are you sure? It's perfectly scandalous. She sat up and narrowed her eyes. Her interest peaked despite herself. I suppose we have nothing better to do. But mind you, it had better be good. Scandalous, I had said. Very well, I could try to think of something scandalous. I leaned in closer, lowering my voice theatrically. Once upon a time, just after a storm very much like this one, something extraordinary occurred. The king of the dolphins commanded a feast, and they invited their old enemies, the seagulls, to dine with them at the edge of the sky and the sea. Bee's eyes widened, her voice filled with wonder. R really, miss, D dolphins and the seagulls are enemies? Shh, just play along. Their old rivalry temporarily forgotten, the two great societies held a ball so dazzling and splendid that even the balls held by Prince George could not compare. Dolphins leapt from the sea, twirling and swirling with the rhythm of the waves, while white-winged seagulls swooped down, performing daring somersaults in the air. Poppy, who had been listening intently, clapped her hands with delight. Dolphins and seagulls dancing, I want to see. I'm afraid that is impossible, though, I sighed sadly. For you see, a bitter feud began after the final dance of the night. What's a feud? I smiled and rolled my eyes up in thought. It's like when you are very angry at someone, so angry that you cannot forgive their offences against you. Like Mamma and Papa, Emily clarified. Oh, Poppy's eyes rounded. Would they marry too? I couldn't help a chuckle. Well, why not something like that? I was making this story up as I went. They, um, they might have been. The king of the dolphins was a prideful creature, more beautiful than all the rest. But he was also arrogant and entirely persuaded of his own importance. But he fell in love with the plainest of the seagulls that night, a willful soul with a sharp tongue who was offended by his manners. He wished to marry her, but she refused to believe he was truly earnest in his request. Why not? Poppy demanded. He wouldn't have asked if he didn't mean it. But what if his request made no sense? He wanted her to live with him at the bottom of the sea, and he said hurtful things about her beautiful home in the sky. Emily rolled her eyes and flopped back on her bunk. It's a fib, Poppy, just a stupid made-up story. Oh, I wish it were, I sighed. For if it were only that a dolphin and a seagull could never live together, it would be simply a sad tale. But you see, the seagull was rude right back to the king, spiteful even when she refused his suit. How could he be so cruel as to ask such a thing, she thought, for that was not the way it was done, and she was ready to believe the very worst of his intentions. Poppy was staring at me unblinking, and even Bee had rolled over on her bunk and was trying to listen with interest. So, so w what happened? B asked. Oh, they had this tremendous fight. And since then, dolphins will have nothing to do with seagulls. And seagulls feel very much the same about the matter. But, I grinned and held up a single finger as my voice dropped to a whisper. Rumour has it that one night, when the sea was quiet, the king of the dolphins came to the water's surface to catch a fish to eat. And who should he see? There but the gull who had captured his heart. No one knows what was said between them. But sometimes, if you are very lucky, you might find a dolphin and a seagull sharing a meal in secret before returning to their homes. Bee sighed, and a weak smile formed on her lips. 
that that was so r- 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 it was sweet. Then her eyes crossed and she vomited all over the floorboards. Oh, good Lord, I muttered. It seemed nothing could ease the girl's suffering. Perhaps there was nothing anyone could really do about it. But shouldn't her mother at least show some concern for her sick daughter? And perhaps Lord Holt could secure the services of a doctor on board. At least if I could find someone with some peppermint for her tea, it would be some comfort. I got up and made my way through the narrow passageways, bracing myself against the relentless motion of the ship. I rapped on the door of Lady Holt's cabin, but there was no answer. Perhaps she was also unwell. I hesitated momentarily, then gently pushed the door open, calling out softly, Lady Holt, it's Elizabeth Bennet, the governess. May I come in? The sight that greeted me was far from what I expected. Lady Holt lay sprawled on her bed, a handkerchief clutched to her forehead, moaning with a theatrical flair to put Mama to shame. Oh, woe is me! This wretched voyage has brought upon me a dreadful case of seasickness. Oh, my lady, I apologise for intruding, but Be- Beatrice, that is, has been suffering greatly from the same malady. I wondered if there might be something to ease her discomfort and yours. Lady Holt waved me off. Oh, can you not see? I am in no condition to be bothered. Seek out the steward, or perhaps the ship stopped. I believe they are all above deck at present, my lady. I shan't wish to leave the girls for that long. I wonder if Lord Holt would... Lord Holt, she says, her ladyship lamented, as if I have seen that useless man since yesterday. Send for my maid and tell her to fetch me something. I glanced around and saw the maid pressed against Lady Holt's cabin wall, silent and looking a little green herself. Um, what would you like, my lady? Anything. Just have her fetch me something. I cannot be troubled to speak just now. I thinned my lips. Yes, my lady. With a polite curtsy, I turned to leave, but a sudden jolt of the ship sent me off balance. I stumbled forward, narrowly avoiding a collision with a nearby chair. I'd be lucky if I were not black and blue by morning. Back in the cabin, I informed the girls there would be no help from their parents, and B promptly begged for the bucket again. You have to do something, Emily demanded. She's sick. Yes, I noticed that, I retorted dryly. Well, if no one else can help us, we roll up our sleeves. Do we have anything with us? Anything at all? I bent to rummage through my trunk, but I knew very well there would be nothing but... Well, hang on. I did keep a dried sprig of lavender from Longbourn. Would sniffing that help to calm their stomachs? B pointed listlessly toward her trunk. M- m- my my ma- maid packed me some l- lemon for m- my throat. It d- d- doesn't help, though... I still talk broken. I set a hand gently on her forehead. It might not help for that, but it could help with seasickness. Emily, the least seasick of us all, sighed and marched over to her own trunk. She dug to the bottom, then handed over a sachet of mint leaves. I stole them from the kitchen. I took the sachet, my eyebrows raised. She shrugged. They make my stockings smell better. No judgments here, I muttered, eyeing our collection. Let us see what we can do. I had no mortar and pestle, but we made do with a spoon and a teacup to blend our little concoction. I could not say that the mixture helped, but it did no harm and kept our minds more agreeably engaged. When the meal bell rang, we were still a sorry lot, but maybe, just maybe, a bit less miserable. Do you girls feel well enough to walk to the galley? I asked. Poppy, naturally, was the first to unbolt the door. Me, I want to eat. B shook her head and squeezed her stomach. N- not, not y- yet. I felt her forehead and nodded. I will bring something back for you, in case you feel like eating later. Emily? Emily was idly tossing the vial of lemon oil between her hands, and she looked up at me through the fringe of black hair. Only if they have coffee. Coffee? What kind of child was this? I lifted my shoulders. I cannot say for sure, but I understand there is almost always coffee on a ship. Come on, let us go find some breakfast. Five. Darcy. I awoke with a start, smacking my head on the bottom of the narrow berth above me. 
Ugh. I pinched my nose and lay back, trying to let my eyes adjust. But it was no use. There was nothing to see but a wall and a board six inches above my nose. I groaned and rolled to the floor, where at least I could feel my feet again. My heart was still racing and my shirt drenched in sweat. The remnants of a vivid dream clung to my mind, refusing to dissipate. In that sweet reverie I'd found myself back at Rosings Park in April. The grand drawing room came alive, filled with the sound of Elizabeth's laughter and the music of the pianoforte. She was bent studiously over the keys, the tip of her tongue peeking through her lips as she worked out a tricky bit of the music. Then she was smiling at the room, as she deflected some comment from Lady Catherine, and in such a subtle way that I alone perceived her amusement. At last, her eyes lifted to mine, the gentle twist of her lips betraying her true thoughts, thoughts that she would share with none but me. Curse it all! I was a fool! Bitterness washed over me as I raged against my weakness for allowing her image to seep into my thoughts again, even in slumber. Would I never be free of this torment? I shook my head, determined to banish the lingering traces of that tantalising illusion. The rocking of the ship mocked all my attempts at equilibrium. I rubbed my temples, trying to calm the seasickness that had churned my stomach since we left the harbour the night before. Every rise and fall of the vessel intensified my discomfort, amplifying the smells that permeated the air. The tang of salt water mingled with the damp wood, while the pungent odours of the sailors and their meals filled my nostrils. The ship had become a sensory assault, and I wanted nothing more than a pinpoint of clarity to anchor myself to. The captain told me breakfast would be served on the upper deck at eight bells. In my present state, I could not imagine forcing food down my throat. Some of the men in nearby berths had advised me only to take broth, that sounded a reasonable notion, but I needed a change of air more than anything. I pulled my coat off my bunk, tugged it over my arms, and made my way up the ladder, two decks above my stinking berth. As I entered the dining area, my gaze swept over the room, weariness aching in every bone and sinew. The captain had not exaggerated when he spoke of the need for a strong constitution on this voyage. With the ship's constant pitching and yawing, and my own unfamiliarity with the sea. The only moments I'd caught any slumber at all had been lavishly tormented by visions of Elizabeth. Far from restful, I hadn't the stomach for the salt pork and boiled eggs, but a few bites of oatmeal might rebuild my strength and set my head right. The low hum of conversations blended with the clinking of cutlery and the occasional burst of laughter. I eased into a seat, nodding at the gentleman nearest me, but scarcely glancing at anyone else. The conversation was too much, the noise too much. My hand shaking, I poured a cup of tea, and tried to tune out all else. Yet amidst the din, a sharp gasp pierced the air, cutting through the background noise like the call of a bugle. My eyes snapped up. A woman sprang from her seat and spun away in a twirl of petticoats. She desperately sought to whisk two young girls away from the table. The girls resisted, one of them pouting and the other whining. My eyes were dull, my senses still thick and numb, but the unexpected scene captivated my attention, curiosity and instinctive recognition coursing through my veins. And then, as if the world had shifted on its axis, the woman turned, her gaze meeting mine. Elizabeth. The very ocean itself drew to a standstill. The breath caught in my chest, my heartbeat thundering in my ears. Our eyes locked, and a jolt of fire shot through me, reigniting embers I had desperately tried to extinguish. I jerked to my feet, my lips parted, ready to utter her name, to bridge the expanse of months and separation with a single word. But before I could shape the syllables, the ship lurched violently, tossing me off balance. I fought to steady myself, my fingers gripping the table's edge until my knuckles turned white. And when I finally regained my balance, when I dared to look up once more... Elizabeth had vanished. I staggered with the ship's rocking, my mouth agape in stunned silence. Had I truly seen her? I glanced around the dining room, but no one else seemed troubled by the disappearance of a woman and two children. Who was that? I cried. Anyone? Does anyone know that woman? A few shook their heads, but one woman sputtered. Would that be Lord Alt's unruly brood, as they say? We saw them when we boarded. Near to knock me over, they did. Halt, 
I repeated. The name meant little to me. Surely some relatives of hers. Please, God, she had not married this Lord Holt. No, she would never. She couldn't. She belonged with me. But my voice croaked unsteadily when I barked. Where is their cabin? Shrugs and empty gazes were my only answer. I hissed as I tossed my napkin on the table and tried to squeeze out the door the way I had come. But Elizabeth, if that was really her, had gone out the door on the table's far side, fleeing into the labyrinth of corridors on the lower deck. Panic swelled in my heart. How was I to find her? Had I merely taken a breath, stilled my mind for a moment, reason might have prevailed. She could not be far. Surely someone on board would know about her. But reason was the farthest quality from my brain at the moment. I spun round at the sound of a door slamming somewhere below, and my feet clattered after the noise. Was it truly her, or had I merely imagined her? Could it be that I had conjured her from the depths of my longing, only to have her vanish like a phantom? I quickened my pace, calling out her name, my voice reverberating through the narrow corridors. Elizabeth, wait! The ship's constant rocking tested my balance, the dim lighting casting eerie shadows upon the walls. The flickering lanterns taunted me, their dancing glow playing tricks on my eyes, and doubt crept in. Was it a cruel illusion, a figment of my imagination? But Elizabeth herself had diagnosed my greatest flaw, and I was too obstinate to quit, least of all now. Around each corner I expected to stumble into her, once I caught sight of what looked like the crown of a woman's head descending the ladder, but the instant I gained the opening the ladder was bare. The corridors extended like a maze, hiding secrets and plying me with false hope. The ship's other occupants, sailors and passengers alike, cast curious glances my way, but I never slowed. I continued to call out Elizabeth's name, my voice echoing through the corridor like a desperate plea. Then a sudden commotion erupted nearby, just as the ship pitched up on another wave, I caught a glimpse of a small figure hurtling towards me. Before I could react, a dash of red hair shot across my path. For an instant my mind recalled the naughty girl who had been the cause of so much havoc the day before. But then my feet went out from under me. The impact sent shock waves through my body. I stumbled, my limbs flailing to regain my balance. But the deck seemed to tilt beneath my feet, and the world spun around me. And then... I shook hands with the force known as gravity. My body pitched forward and my head connected with the wooden boards of the ship. A sharp, searing pain radiated through my skull, momentarily eclipsing all other sensations. The world blurred, shifting into darkness, as a shroud of blackness enveloped me. Time slipped away, erased by the throbbing ache pulsating in my head. Brief flashes of sound and movement danced at the periphery of my fading consciousness, a cacophony of voices and footsteps. After that, all went silent. Elizabeth. I snatched Poppy from the corridor and yanked her into the cabin. For the love of Pete, stay. Emily, hold her and do not let go of her hand. It was the first time Emily had even attempted to cooperate, and it was probably an accident on her part, but she grabbed her younger sister and gaped at me, her eyes wide. Who was that man chasing us? I sagged against the door frame and rolled my eyes up in a silent plea for strength. He's... I swallowed and peered around the frame. He's unconscious. Good heavens. Poppy, I hope you haven't killed him. Fitzwilliam Darcy was blocking the passageway, a crumpled heap of humanity, with his arms and legs all akimbo and his mouth hanging slack. One eye was half open and a trickle of blood on the floorboards testified to how hard he had hit his head. I rushed to kneel over him, my heart in my throat. Tussy, I hissed, swatting his cheek. He made no response. Fitzwilliam Darcy, wake up! I cupped his face and squeezed, then shook his head to and fro. Come on, you impossible man. You would be disagreeable enough to die on me right here. Are you even breathing? Wake up! I took hold of his jacket lapels and jarred him something fearful. I must have rattled his eyes open and shaken some air into his lungs. Perhaps I even brought him back from the dead. He spasmed and coughed, then groaned as his hands groped empty air, then landed on my cheeks. Elizabeth. His eyes fluttered, and he groaned again. 
I didn't even bother brushing his hands from my face. For the moment I was simply relieved that he was alive, and I would not have to explain to his family how he had perished. What was that? Say something. You are sitting on my stomach, came his hoarse whisper. Good heavens, how had I... My cheeks heated under the weight of his hands, and I scrambled away from him, rather clumsily, I'm afraid. He barked out in pain, clutching his stomach and groin as I tottered to my feet. "'It only serves you right,' I huffed, trying to smooth back my hair. "'If you had not insisted on chasing me through the ship like a madman, you would—' Darcy's eyes were fixed dazedly on my face, as I scolded him with the first few words. But then they crossed, and he rolled over on his side, and vomited— I massaged my temples and fought to take a few slow breaths, but the very air was sour, and now the floor was slippery. Oh, for the love of all things holy! I recoiled as Darcy retched on the floor. The stench assaulted my senses, and I couldn't help but gag in response. Not on the floor, you provoking man! He held his stomach and moaned. Then his head turned, his eyes rolled up to me, and he tried to smile. I sighed. You might as well get up, I muttered, extending my hand towards him. We shall have to find someone aboard to clean up this abomination. Darcy grimaced as he accepted my hand and attempted to rise. It was a clumsy endeavour, given his weakened state and the lingering effects of his fall. The ship was still heaving under our feet, too, but with some effort he managed to stand, albeit unsteadily. As I gingerly guided him away from the vomit-covered floor, the girls watched with a mix of curiosity and apprehension. Poppy's eyes were wide with wonder, while Emily clutched her sister's hand, her gaze shifting between Darcy and me. "'Who is he?' Poppy whispered. I glanced at Darcy, his dishevelled appearance and dazed expression, and made a split-second decision. "'He's, uh, a friend,' I replied. "'Someone who... "'Got a little too carried away in a game of chase. "'Don't worry, he won't harm us.' "'Emily's eyes narrowed suspiciously as she looked at Darcy. "'Are you sure, miss?' "'Positive. "'Now let's get him into our cabin. "'We can clean him up there. "'You and Poppy sit down on Bee's bunk with her "'so we can make some space for Mr. Darcy.' "'I led Darcy inside, "'his arm groping for my middle, "'in a way that seemed at once desperate for my help, "'and also curiously intimate.' I plopped him on my bunk and grabbed a damp cloth and a basin of water, gently dabbing at the blood on his forehead. Darcy winced, his eyes fluttering open and closed. Eliz... Oh, forgive me, uh, Miss Bennet, what are you doing here? I could ask you the same question, Mr. Darcy. I never thought to see you again, least of all on a ship, bobbing through the North Atlantic like God's plaything. He shook his head. Believe me, I didn't choose this floating purgatory willingly. I was put up to the task by... He hissed as my cloth dabbed a particularly tender part of his scalp. Someone who sticks as close as a blister in my shoe. Colonel Fitzwilliam, I guessed. His cheek flinched, and he shot me a sheepish glance. The very same. But what brings you here? Who are these? Someone said they were Lord Holt's children. Uh, cousins of yours? A flush of embarrassment heated my cheeks. Oh, yes, I recently discovered that I do, in fact, have noble relations. Would not Miss Bingley be pleased to hear it? His eyes narrowed in bewilderment. You do? I scoffed and set a hand on my hip. No, of course not. I'm their governess for the time being. His attention wandered to the floor, still processing the situation. Governess? You've become a governess. When? When? And why, in heaven's name? I shrugged, returning my full concentration to his head, to hide the furious blush that ran from my forehead to my chest. Things change. His hand closed over mine, and he turned to murmur into my ear. Elizabeth, I need to speak with you, privately. I stiffened, my gaze dancing over the girls, still huddled together on one of the bunks. I'm afraid now is not the time, Mr. Darcy. Surely we can locate a doctor on board to attend to your ailments. I wrinkled my nose. And perhaps they will find some way for you to clean your coat. 
It is not that, and you know it very well, he insisted in a low voice. I gave his head one last dab with my cloth, and spoke at full volume. There, I think the bleeding has stopped. You are very lucky, Mr. Darcy. Do try not to take another fall, for your head will only take so much abuse. Miss Bennet, he whispered, please, I beg of you, a few moments are all I ask. I let my eyes touch his for half a pulse, those deep brown eyes that had always held so much confusion and mystery for me. Then I turned away. Girls, I must speak to someone about cleaning this. Please behave while I'm out. And Poppy, stay there. I mean it. Mr. Darcy's sigh of relief was audible. Thank you, he murmured as he got to his feet. I flashed him a deadpan look. I said I meant to talk to one of the crew. That is all I intend to do for now. His jaw tightened, disappointment flashing across his features, but he nodded. Very well. But it is a long journey, Miss Bennet. Six. Darcy. As the rain pelted down on the main deck, I followed Elizabeth up the steps. I had no intention of letting her slip away now that I'd found her again. She marched ahead, her arms swinging and head high as if she could outpace the storm itself. I caught up to her, my voice nearly lost in the wind and rain. Elizabeth, wait! She slowed but did not turn around. We need to find some way to clean up that mess before it becomes a permanent part of the ship. I don't want to spend the rest of this voyage smelling it. Then let me help you. It was my fault after all. She glanced back at me, raindrops clinging to her lashes. I'll find a swab bucket or something then, but don't think it changes anything between us. I nodded, rainwater streaming down my face. I never expected it to, I replied, my voice almost drowned by the roaring wind. But Elizabeth, can we not speak, just for a moment? She huffed and crossed her arms, raindrops glistening on her cheeks. What could we possibly have to say to each other, Mr. Darcy? I shook my head and tossed my hand in the air. Let us begin with why you ran from me. The Elizabeth Bennet I knew never ran from anything in her life. Are you in trouble, or is it myself who offends you so? She lowered her eyes. I... She sniffed and crossed her arms. It was all very unexpected, seeing you again, and here of all places. I suppose I... Panicked, and perhaps I was ashamed. Of what? I whirled, pointing down the ladder towards the girls she had left. Of being a governess. Her lashes lifted and her chest rose as she drew in her breath. That, and a hundred other things. There is a great deal you do not know. I took a step closer, raindrops mixing with the sweat on my brow. Then explain it to me. She hesitated, drawing her lower lip between her teeth. Then her mouth opened, her breath caught as if she meant to speak, and she shook her head. I cannot. It is too much. My shoulders sagged. You will tell me nothing. Her face turned away. Please, Mr. Darcy, I lived through it all once. I do not wish to regurgitate it. Then her mouth crumpled from a pout to an involuntary giggle, and her eyes flashed to mine. Poor choice of words. I sighed and could not help a short chuckle of my own. <laughs> the very worst. Miss Elizabeth, did you at least read my letter? She bit her lip again, this time with enough force to leave little white indentations in the soft pink flesh. Yes, I did, she admitted. And I must acknowledge that I misjudged you. That was something. I could work with that. Then you understand. You know the truth now. She gave a bitter laugh, and a curiously fat drop of rain rolled down her cheek. Yes, I know the truth, but understanding doesn't undo the damage. I reached out, wanting to touch her, but I didn't dare. So, like a coward, I let my hand drop again. I regret my past actions, Elizabeth, the way I spoke to you. Egad, I have never been so ashamed of myself— I could hardly look at my own face in the mirror for months. I was so outraged at my behaviour. I'd cut off my own arm for the chance to make amends, to show you that I've changed. Her eyes met mine, raindrops cascading down her face. 
For an instant they held softness, even absolution. Then she blinked impatiently, and the muscles of her jaw flexed in resolve. Oh, how typical! Don't you understand? None of this is about you. Do you think I am trying to punish you? I'm just trying to live my life, Mr. Darcy, and the last six months have shown me that... She stopped and covered her mouth with a sniff. That nothing is as it seems, not even the people you thought you could count on. What the devil? Alarm bells were clanging in my head, and I reached for her hand. Elizabeth, please, I begged, my voice barely audible over the wind. Give me a chance. Let me make it right. If it's not about me, then what? Who? Her lips thinned. Right now it is about three little girls who are afraid of a storm. They are trapped here just like we are, but they have even less control over their circumstances. And unless I'm mistaken, a messy floor is presently the least of our worries. She pointed at the scrambling mass of crewmen nearby, all shouting and tugging at ropes. My eyes focused at last on something besides Elizabeth's face, and a pit opened in my stomach as understanding dawned. The clanging bells I'd been hearing were not in my head. They were real, and the crew were desperately trying to furl the mainsail. Oh, the storm must be getting worse, I mumbled dumbly. As if I needed more clarification, the captain rose behind us. What are you two doing on deck? Get below, you fools. I'll not send anyone after you if you're swept overboard. I gave Elizabeth a gentle shove in the arm. Go, I'll be right after you. She glanced at me, raindrops glistening on her face, a flicker of something unreadable in her eyes. Then, without a word, she nodded and hurried toward the down ladder, disappearing through the trap door. I followed her down the creaking ladder and through the narrow corridor, the ship was bobbing around the open sea like a wine cork in the current, and each step was now a battle against gravity. Rainwater dripped from our sodden clothes, and I felt my shoes slipping on the worn wood. Suddenly a powerful jolt sent Elizabeth careening toward the wall. Before she could collide with the unforgiving surface, my instincts kicked in, and I lunged forward, catching her just in time. Our bodies crashed into each other, but it was my shoulder that bore the brunt of the impact against the wall. Oh, I groaned. Elizabeth's lips parted as she looked up at me, her eyes wide. Did you hit your head again? No, but I think I wish I had. I tried to squirm against the wall, but the rocking of the ship had me pinned fast. I could do nothing but stare back, down into those fine eyes I'd thought never to see again. Even in the dim corridor there was a light in them that tugged at something deep in my core. How did she do that to me? Turn me into a mute and stammering fool with the merest glance. I slid my hand up her back and nodded down at her. Are you well? Elizabeth blinked and nodded back. Tolerably. She shifted against my arms and tried to straighten, but the ship was still listing to the side, pinning her weight against me, and she could not catch her balance enough to break free. I could think of many things I would endure to keep her there unbalanced, clinging to me, her cheeks flushed with exertion and feeling, and her soaked gown moulded to her like. I swallowed and closed my eyes. Madness! This was madness! The same sort of mania that always overtook me when she was near. Except never before had she been pressed against my chest, her hair working loose from its pins with the soft sheen of rain on her skin, and both of us clad in almost transparent clothing— Wet and miserable. I was wet and miserable, damn it. But my brain had not yet received that message, and the ache through other parts of my anatomy only intensified as the warmth of her skin against mine ravaged what was left of my sanity. So I opened my eyes, and she was still there, still gloriously dishevelled, and gazing up at me with that look of delicious uncertainty. I thank you for catching me she whispered. I sucked in a breath. Here, let me. The floor rocked beneath us again, and the bow of the ship reared towards us like a spooked carriage horse. Oh, look sharp! I tightened my grip around her, wedging my shoulder against the bulkhead and keeping her steady. Elizabeth ducked her head, her hand coming up to brace against the wall as she collapsed into my chest once more. She squeezed her eyes shut, her teeth clamped into her lower lip. I think I'm going to be sick. 
Well, don't hold back on my account. My coat is already ruined. She lifted her head and cocked an eyebrow at me. Did you just make a joke, Fitzwilliam Darcy? Not a very good one. You didn't laugh. Oh! She pressed a hand to her stomach, her eyes crossing as the floor dropped sharply under us. I don't think I dare. I'd be afraid of dying, but I'm too queasy for that. I slid my arm down her shoulder to wrap around her waist and pushed off the bulkhead. Come, let me see you to your cabin. We should be out of the storm soon enough, and then it will be smooth sailing down the coast of Portugal. Um, which way was it again? She pointed. Oh, down that way, I think. Where is your cabin? A prickle raced over my skin at that question. Why would she care? Unless she wanted me to take her there. I glanced down at her in awe just as the realisation of what she had asked dawned on her face. Her eyes widened and the blood drained from her cheeks. I didn't mean that, she cried. I only thought that if yours was closer we could... Oh, bother, it still sounds wrong. I shook my head. Oh, fear not, I do not even have a cabin. I boarded at the last minute at La Havre, and all that was left was a common bunk in the belly of the ship. She stopped and stared at me like I was speaking gibberish. You? Don't have a cabin? What about your valet? I don't believe it. Why would you even board the ship if they didn't have the kind of accommodations you're used to? I tightened my arm about her as the ship lurched again. I suppose if you would like an answer to that question, you will have to answer some of my questions. Her eyes narrowed and her lips puckered. I'm not that curious. I shrugged. More's the pity. But come then a little farther, and I shall leave you at your door, not to disturb you again. Elizabeth The storm raged most of the day, until the light outside our cabin's portal faded into dusk. No more meals had been served in the dining room, owing to the rough seas, but I wouldn't have wanted to eat anyway. Finally, the ship was riding somewhat level, and it had been at least two hours since the last time I had my head in the bucket. The girls had finally collapsed in exhaustion. Poppy and Bee lay curled up together, their breath soft and steady. Emily must have also dropped off, because she hadn't moved in half an hour. Yet, as darkness began to settle in, sleep was the last thing I could think of. A riot of conflicting feelings tumbled through my head as I held the lantern and Darcy's letter in my hands. How dare the man be so blasted nice to me! Why, he was almost humble. He was probably ill. But how vexing it was that he had been so charming, so helpful and, dash it all, so wretchedly handsome, with his hair all wet with rain and his jaw unshaven. I had worked hard to brick up that wall around my heart. A governess had need of such a thing— Yet here was Fitzwilliam Darcy, picking away at the very foundations. Maybe he had lost a bet. It was stupid to think that anything could ever come of the lingering fascination I had for him. For he did fascinate me, and he always had. I could not deny it, even to myself. But to what end? The gulf between us was vast enough when I was a gentleman's daughter of good repute. Now I was but a governess— even if I'd wished to follow the path that he had once offered me, it had vanished now, demolished beneath the crushing blows of fortune and the weight of my own choices. I had to avoid him. He would not make it easy, the confounded man, but for his sake and mine, for the hope of any sort of a future for either of us, I had to keep him at a distance. My fingers trembled as I extended them to count out the days. Ten to fourteen days to Italy— one of the sailors had estimated. We'd already passed two of them, but there were so many left. I could not possibly avoid Fitzwilliam Darcy for that long. He was impossible in every way, impossible to get on with, and impossible to ignore. Lost in my introspection, I failed to notice Emily's piercing gaze until her challenge cut through the quiet cabin. Reading his letter again, aren't you? Instinct jerked my hand, and I secreted the letter under my skirt, before my head snapped around. This is a private letter, and of no concern to you. Emily's eyes flashed in the glow of the lantern. It's from him, isn't it? Mr. Darcy. I saw his name on the bottom. My mouth dropped. 
You said you did not read it. Not only are you a sneak, but you're a liar. I didn't read all of it. I just saw the signature. I was curious because it was such an impressive seal. Is he your lover? Did he sneak aboard the ship to be with you? My blood ran cold with horror. No. How could you? Emily, you will never repeat these accusations. I care nothing for my reputation, but you would do him a tremendous injustice if such rumours were to spread. You cannot imagine the damage you would do. Do you understand? She shrugged. Well then, who is he? I hastened to my feet and tucked the letter in my trunk. It is none of your business. I'd say it is if you want my silence. I turned to glare at her. Are you blackmailing me? So, what if I am? It is indecent, that is what. For a girl of your age to flaunt such dark proclivities is... It's frightening. Have you no shame, no thought for your character? She frowned, cast her eyes upward and shook her head. No one cares what I do, so why should I? I narrowed my eyes. If no one cares, then they will pay you no heed if you try to ruin me. A sly grin tugged at one corner of her mouth. You say that, but don't you know why my sisters and I have had so many governesses? I could make you go away like that. She snapped her fingers. I could make Mama strand you in Italy, and don't think I couldn't. Panic tickled the back of my neck. She was probably exaggerating, but I had no cause to doubt her words. The child was a demon, a calculating little fiend, who ruined people for her own amusement. I stared at her for a few seconds, seething. Then inspiration struck. I blinked, drew a breath and straightened, and I conjured up some tears. It wasn't as easy as Lydia had always made it look, but I managed and hoped it was convincing. A sigh escaped my lips, and I congratulated myself that it sounded like it carried just the right degree of heartache. I sank back down on my bunk, then met her gaze and spoke, my voice tinged with weariness. Very well, Emily. Yes, it was Mr. Darcy who gave me this letter. The same man who chased us through the ship today. He and I... I sniffed and let my voice waver for emphasis. Old friends. Emily's eyes widened, her defiance momentarily softened by curiosity. Good. She was finally playing into my hands. Her voice was thick with scepticism, but not so much hostility. What kind of friends? The kind... She puckered her lips and raised her brows. The kind where you are sent away in disgrace, where you have to become a governess because your family cannot bear the sight of you. I shook my head with a little smile. At your age, you always fancy it is something like that, don't you? But no, you could not be more wrong. Mr. Darcy was... is a man of honour. It was I who did not see it in time. Then what? Why would he jump up and chase you through the ship when he saw you? I suppose because I ran. She narrowed her eyes. Honest people don't have to run. Sometimes they do, I whispered. When the truth is too much, or when someone could be hurt, or when you care, but you cannot afford to care. Emily shifted on her bunk and propped her chin on her fist. So that's it. You're in love with him, but his family disapproves. I chuckled and looked away. No. Then your family disapproves of him. This time I could not help a throaty laugh. You would have it be so simple. It is nothing like that. Besides, I really don't see why it should matter to you. Well, it's obviously something. You have to tell me what it is or I'll talk. Oh, indeed. And what are you going to say? that your governess knew a gentleman once. My, what a scandal. Do you truly think anyone cares? Your mother is too seasick even to know what day it is, and your father... Why, I've hardly seen him for more than three minutes together. I do not even know where he is. Emily's expression cooled, and her jaw tightened. I'd struck some sort of a nerve. He's in his cabin with his mistress. I blinked. What? You didn't see her when we boarded. She was the one wearing a maid's dress and too much face paint. Emily flopped over on her bunk and folded her arms, staring up at the ceiling. We won't see him until we reach Italy, and we'll hardly see him then. 
My breath left me, and I stared at her profile in the dim glow of the lantern. I am sorry for your mother, was the only thing I could think to say. I heard a snort. Oh, Mamma finds amusements of her own. Don't think I don't notice that my sisters and I look nothing alike. All the same, it must be... I squinted in thought. Disappointing for you. She grunted. I don't care. No one else does, so why should I? And that was when I realised it. Emily's dark defiance, her manipulative ways. It was all in an effort to make someone care about something. It didn't even matter what, or who, or why. She would push and poke, and cause as much ruin as she could. And if no one drew her in, she would just keep shoving the world away. What would it take to shatter that brittle surface, to find the little girl beneath? I had no answers. Well, then, I murmured, my voice cracking in earnest this time. I suppose not. Good night, Emily. Seven. Darcy. Twilight hues danced on the horizon as the ship sailed closer to the coast of Portugal, leaving behind the rolling wrath of the open ocean. The air carried a gentler breeze, and the passengers, no longer plagued by seasickness, had begun to wander the decks and mingle with one another. Each day I'd looked for Elizabeth walking the decks, or even in the dining room. I'd promised not to accost her in her cabins again. It looked desperate on my part and could reflect poorly on her as well. But apart from glances of her retreating back when I'd hunt the corridors, I'd seen nothing of her. Of course she would be occupied with the family, the children. She would do her duty by them before she made a moment to speak to me. But after the second day it was clear that she was avoiding me. She never came to the upper decks, save when all three girls were clustered around her like a guard. She chose random times to slip into the dining room, seemingly always just after I had given up on finding her and gone back to my berth. I started to wonder if she had someone spying on me. Why? Did she think I would shun her because she had taken a position as a governess? Did she hide some shameful secret? Or did she truly still dislike me that much? There were no answers that could satisfy me, but if I had at least known why she refused to be in my presence, I could have... Well, there was probably nothing I could have done about it. It was no wilting lily who had stolen my heart, but a sharp-tongued wit with a will of iron, a queen, who would extend her scepter when she saw fit, and not one moment sooner. But we were halfway to Italy already, and the ship would be putting in at Lisbon soon. I did not even know where she would be disembarking, and my chances to speak to her were flitting away. It was my fifth evening on the ship, with darkness descending over the Portuguese coastline, and the air in my berth had grown sweltering and stale. Everyone else was trying to sleep, but I could not, so I ascended to the deck. I'd lean over the gunwale, drink the cool air to clear my head, and gaze at the shores before dusk cloaked them entirely. But as I nodded to the man on watch and stepped round to the stern rail, I drew up short at the sight of a woman standing in my usual place, looking out over the parting waves. She wore no bonnet under the starry sky, and tendrils of hair fluttered about her cheeks and whisked against the nape of her neck. She was petite, draped in a dark grey cloak, with the white edges of her muslin gown drifting gently in the breeze. Before she even turned her face at the sound of my steps, I knew Elizabeth's figure in the darkness. Her mouth opened and her hand slipped to her skirts, preparing to gather them and flee. "'Wait!' I begged, holding up my hands in a sign of truce. Please, don't go. She let her skirts fall again, but her shoulders were pulled back, her chin high, her dark eyes almost violet in the weak moonlight. I should be with the girls. But you are here. I drew cautiously to her side, my gaze helplessly slipping over the lines of her face. Why? Her lips pressed into a faint smile. Probably the same reason you find yourself here. I raised my brows in question. She tilted her head a little closer and whispered, It smells down there. I chuckled. It does that. And I did not help matters, did I? Elizabeth dropped her gaze, but I could see her cheeks dimpling in a smile. You did not, but the blame is not yours alone. Her eyes lifted softly. For the smell or for other things? 
Miss Elizabeth, I... The words died on my lips when her eyes flashed up to me in warning. I caught my breath, letting it out slowly, measuring whatever I might say against the wariness in her face. I swallowed and started over. I never heard why Lord and Lady Holt were venturing abroad. It's an odd time of year to be sailing so far. Her lashes fluttered in relief. Oh, well, as to that, I did not hear either. She forced a smile. Not officially, at any rate. Oh, what is the unofficial story? Her eyes darted over her shoulder. I do not know if it is wise. I turned, following the direction of her gaze. It is only the watchman. Are you worried about being seen with me? He wouldn't give two straws for that. She shook her head, and her voice dropped to a whisper. But he's a sailor. He may have fought battles at sea, and he might care very much about an English lord and lady who wished to pay a social call on Napoleon Bonaparte. I stiffened. They what? I only heard that from one of the girls, a spiteful creature who enjoys causing mayhem, but a sharp observer nonetheless. She shrugged. I think we are bound for Elba. My eyes narrowed. Surely not. Why would they bring their children on such a journey? Oh, as to that, I think Lady Holt uses the children to put on maternal airs, and also to oblige her husband to comply with her whims. But I know none of this for a fact. Lady Holt said something about Italy, but she is as flighty a woman as ever I saw. We may be putting off in Lisbon or sailing on to South Africa for all I truly know. Ah, I breathed. For her sake, I hoped she would be passing the rest of the winter in sunny Portugal, but for myself, I hoped not. That could be tomorrow, then. See, there, we are passing Porto even now. She turned to follow the direction I was pointing. I was wondering if that was where we were. Are you sure? I nodded and stepped closer to the rail, extending my arm over it. You can see the lanterns from the ships in the harbour. And there, oh yes, that should be it, there's a sandbar at the mouth of the harbour that looks a little like a dolphin. Elizabeth turned to me, an odd smile on her face. A dolphin? Are you being imaginative, Mr. Darcy? On my life I am not. I was posted here five years ago, and I saw it often enough. She tilted her head. Posted? You were in the army. Impossible. But I was. A lieutenant, if you can believe it. I turned to lean against the rail where I could admire her face a little better. Perhaps because you do not travel in London circles, you may not have heard. It is not something I relish talking about. But I was not born the heir. That honour fell to my brother George. He was killed with my father in a carriage accident while I was in the army. She shook her head gently, her eyes lined with doubt. I never heard that. Her hands fumbled inside her cloak and she stared at the deck in thought. I'm sure I would have heard. My aunt would have known, surely. Your aunt? She was from Lampton. She knew of... of Pemberley. And she remembered your mother. Elizabeth's voice faltered. She showed me... last summer. Showed you what? Elizabeth's lips sucked between her teeth. Pemberley. She and my uncle, they took me on a tour of Derbyshire last year. I stiffened and caught her hand. You've seen Pemberley? She swallowed and nodded. Yes, she whispered. When? Last summer? I was there. Is it possible? How did I not know of your visit? Oh, I... Uh... She looked away, and only then did I realise that she was trying to tug her hand from mine. I released her and waited, my heart in my throat. The housekeeper said the family were all expected the day after we came. Frustration stabbed my gut like a knife. She was there, in my home, and I'd missed her by less than a day. And you could not have come back? I heard myself ask. Why would she come back? We had no connection, no ties. Oh, but if she had, what could I have done with five minutes alone with her in Pemberley's garden? Elizabeth drew her cloak more tightly around her. No, we... Uh, there was a letter from Longbourn. We had to return home. A broken line appeared between her brows, and her eyes drifted to my hands, as if she might have liked to reach for them once more, 
but before I could offer, she sucked in a breath and grasped her skirts again. I'm sorry, Mr. Darcy. The hour is late, and I have stayed longer than I meant to. My chest fell in a sigh. You'll not tell me, then, what it is that has you running in shame whenever you look at me. Her lips thinned as her gaze met mine, and I saw tears glimmering in the corners of those fine eyes as she shook her head. Very well. Say nothing. Only do not go, Miss Bennet. I would not wish to be the one to run you back to your smelly cabin. Her face stuck to the side and that bashful smile battled to return. You are all politeness, sir. Not at all. I simply cannot sleep. I'd be much obliged if you did not leave me out here to look the pathetic figure all by myself. Elizabeth. Mr. Darcy, lonely, and the very idea. My mouth dropped in wonder, and my feet stilled, before I quite knew what I was about. Fitzwilliam Darcy asking for a few moments of companionship, like a weary old soldier. This was too curious to pass up. Could he, then, know something of the emptiness that I carried every day? I sucked in a breath and nodded. Very well, Mr. Darcy, just a little longer. Darcy's smile. I shall never forget it, no matter how I might try. He always had a way of looking so lordly and superior, even when something pleased him. But there was something else there that I'd never noticed. There was a kindness that had a different flavour than I'd known before. Appreciation from one who needed nothing, benevolence from the man who had it in his power to give almost everything, and he was smiling at me. I chewed my lip nervously and settled beside him at the rail, more than a foot from his elbow. Our gazes fell from each other to search the coastline, even now disappearing in the darkness. After a moment, his voice drifted to me. Are you warm enough, Miss Bennet? My mouth tugged into a smile. Quite, Mr. Darcy. Though I wondered what he had meant to do about it, if I'd answered otherwise, would he have offered his coat? Perhaps it smelled like bay rum and leather, the scents I remembered from that one dance we'd shared at Netherfield. I am very glad to hear it. We seem to have lost the light. I squinted as the last of the flickering lanterns from the port fell to our stern. It seems we have. I can hardly make out the land now. Indeed, but there is more yet to see. Darcy's gaze shifted upwards, his outstretched hand tracing the constellations that adorn the night sky. And Perseus, he saved the princess, killed the sea monster. I remember. He was the son of Zeus, was he not? He was. Darcy's eyes scanned the horizon. Ah, and there, just over the edge of that hill in the distance, you can see the tip of Orion. See that bright star? I wasn't looking at the star, but I nodded. Yes. Darcy grunted in satisfaction. My father made me memorise the names of all the brightest stars in most of the constellations when I was a boy. That one there is Betelgeuse. Betelgeuse, I murmured, turning the name over in my mouth. It sounds exotic. It means armpit. I snorted a chuckle. You're teasing me. On my honour, that is what it means. I would not lie to you over something as important as a hero's armpit. I laughed as he turned slightly toward me, holding a hand over his chest, and dipped a gallant bow. His eyes lingered on my face, his smile warmer than I'd ever seen before. The heat of it was too much, and I stiffened and looked away. I heard him clear his throat and felt, indeed, I truly felt the coolness when his gaze withdrew from me. I closed my eyes and gripped the railing until my fingers ached. This was madness. Why was I standing there with him, laughing with him? Nothing could come of it. Nothing but the rise of false hopes on his part, and perhaps a deceptive sense of consequence on mine. I really ought to go. The Hydra. His low voice interrupted my thoughts. There to the southwest. Do you recall, Miss Bennet? I sucked in a breath and opened my eyes. Tell me. Darcy leaned more deeply into the rail, his face beaming with pleasure, as his arm described the shape in the sky for my eyes to pick out. The many-headed serpent cut off one head and two more grew in its place. Ah, I breathed. What a good thing it was only a legend. Only think if something like that were real. Are you sure it is not? 
I laughed and cocked an eyebrow at him. Oh, come, Mr. Darcy, the idea is preposterous. The mythical being, perhaps. The concept, very real. He ticked his head toward the south. Since we brought up Elba a few moments ago, why do you think Napoleon was deposited there, almost within sight of the Italian coast? Any number of islands would have proved a safer exile. And, of course, a sentence of death, as befits a tyrant, is a permanent solution. So why was Elba chosen? I frowned. I had not given it much consideration. He fumbled in his pocket with something, his watch, I believe. I am afraid I have had to consider it a little too much of late. What happens if... His voice trailed off. Oh, forgive me, Miss Bennet, I am being something of a melancholy companion. I leaned forward on the railing and studied his face. Is that why you are here, then? You, too, are thronging to pay court to a deposed tyrant. He shook his head with a soft laugh, his eyes on the waves beneath the ship. I suppose you could say that. And not willingly, I see. Colonel Fitzwilliam must hold you very greatly in his debt. He turned, his arm resting on the railing. It should not be so very difficult for you to imagine what I owe him, what he has done for Georgiana and for myself. I might have been hanged for murder by now, had it not been for him. I offered a weak smile. I am sorry to say that I don't even have to try very hard. Indeed. So when he worked his persuasive arguments on me, I found I had little with which to resist. So, what does he want you to do? Offer a bribe? A quiet deal on behalf of the English army? And what do you suppose would tempt the man who once ruled the civilised world? Not being executed seems like a passing fair bargain. He laughed aloud. You are very pithy tonight, Miss Bennet. I touched a hand to my throat. Oh, more so than usual, and here I feared I had fallen out of practice. He smiled and fumbled in his pocket. This time he withdrew his watch, turning it over and over in his palm, as if it helped him to think. Heaven forbid you should lose one ounce of your quickness. I... I always enjoyed listening to you, and I suppose I have... I have missed that. His eyes hesitantly sought mine. Every nerve in my body trembled and ached at his look. I knew I ought to leave at once. But just for a second, to be with someone who remembered how things once were, who knew me as I was. Do you know, I murmured, I often think about that ball at Netherfield, how dazzling it all was, bickering with you on the dance floor. That was one time when I would have done better for my courage not to rise to the occasion. He chuckled, his eyes dropping back to the watch in his hand. You have nothing to regret. I drank in a long breath and let my hand drift from the railing. I wish I could feel the same. Good night, Mr. Darcy. He stepped back and bowed. Good night, Miss Elizabeth. Eight. Darcy. A salty breeze ruffled my hair and threatened to send my hat flying out over the open sea, but I was too lost in my thoughts to care. The flambeau now traced the warm Italian coast. The duty Richard had so rudely pressed upon me drew near, and yet my mind was locked stubbornly on her. Elizabeth. Three days had passed of an awkward stalemate between us, with no further ground gained. Still, her passing smiles had become water and air to me. At least she wasn't hiding from me any longer. I had seen her every day in the dining room, or leading her young charges out on the upper deck for some air. She would glance my way with a faint smile, but that was all the recognition I received. And she never permitted me to find her staring over the stern by twilight again. What was she so ashamed of? Richard had mentioned rumours of a sister's ruin, but I had dismissed it as more spiteful talk from Lady Catherine. But perhaps there was something to it. Could one of her sisters have lost her virtue? It took little imagination to pull up a name. That youngest sister was a tart if ever I saw one. Had she fallen into disgrace? But surely that alone would be insufficient to send Elizabeth from her home and keep her from confessing the matter to me. I had to conclude then that the rest of the hearsay from Richard bore some weight as well. Elizabeth had rejected what her mother saw as a means of redemption for her remaining daughters. And if that was true, then it was my fault that Elizabeth's mother had driven her away. 
even if the timing was not quite right. The revelation of my failed proposal must have led Mrs. Bennet into a fit of righteous hysterics. How could I make it right? The obvious answer, the one my body and soul longed for, was to win Elizabeth's heart. But what if I could not? She was too wretchedly obstinate just to accept me because I asked, even if I managed to ask politely. Footsteps from behind snapped me back to awareness. I was hardly alone on the deck, but it was rare that anyone approached me. But when I turned, I recognised Lord Holt. I'd begun watching for him since I first heard his name, and asked one of the crew to point him out to me, but rarely did the man emerge from his cabin. Now, however, he seemed to be making directly for me, his hand upheld in greeting with, "'Who's that following him? A maid?' "'Mr. Darcy, I presume?' "'You presume correctly, Lord Holt,' I replied with a bow. "'The Darcy of Derbyshire. I only just heard you were on board, and I desire to meet you. I understand you were the second son of George Darcy, a former Lieutenant Darcy, as I understand. You are well informed.' "'Ah, as to that, Lord Matlock was something of my political rival, so I kept apprised of all his affairs.' "'But I've no patience for such things now, "'and I shan't hold your uncle's hot-headedness against you. "'Are you travelling alone, Mr. Darcy?' "'I am. "'Oh, more is the pity. "'One does value a bit of conversation on a long voyage.' "'His gaze flickered to the woman beside him. "'Her eyes darted, evading mine. "'May I introduce Miss Clara, my, uh, companion?' "'The pause was telling. "'Miss Clara,' I acknowledged, and she curtsied almost shyly. I trust you have had a comfortable journey thus far. Oh, most assuredly, Lord Holt agreed, with a suggestive smirk playing at his mouth. Then his expression dropped, and his eyes flashed with annoyance. Oh, good Lord, there is that woman again. Which woman? I asked innocently as I turned around. Lady Holt, of course. You seem a sensible man, Darcy. A word of advice. Don't marry. "'I beg your pardon, sir.' "'But there was no time for Lord Holt to reply before the storm struck. "'Spotting her husband in quiet conversation with me, "'she made a beeline for us. "'The heavy scent of perfume hit me first, rich and overpowering. "'Then, in a whirl of cerulean silk and gaudy feathers, "'Lady Holt approached as a tidal wave in human form. "'Damn,' muttered Lord Holt. "'Clara, walk on with Darcy here and keep him entertained, love.' But Lady Holt was upon us before the maid could take my arm, and I was not sure which would have been the greater discomfort anyway. Lady Holt made an expansive gesture as if kissing the air before her husband. Oh, my darling, there you are. I had begun to think you forgot our walk. She cast a caustic glance at Miss Clara, then happened to notice me. Oh, won't you introduce me to your dashing companion? Her voice was a practised trill, and her lace-gloved hand found mine. Baroness Holt, so delightful to see someone of breeding amongst this crowd. I bent slightly. Fitzwilliam Darcy at your service, my lady. Darcy? Her brow wrinkled and she sniffed the air. Never heard the name. Of course you have, her husband scoffed. You accosted young George Darcy some six or seven years ago at Lady Matlock's dinner party. I had to unseat you from the poor lad's lap. Oh, she waved a hand. I cannot recall such things. I'm sure it was some parlour game or other. I'm sure you were in your cups, grumbled Lord Holt. I was finding myself of a similar mind to Miss Clara, who was looking longingly over her shoulder toward the down ladder. My brother did not play parlour games, my lady, nor was he inclined to frivolity of any sort. Her eyebrows arched, and she scanned my person from top to bottom. "'It must run in the family. "'Ah, where was your estate again, Mr. Darcy?' "'I hail from Derbyshire, my lady.' "'Indeed, you speak almost like one of the Teutons, "'and so tall, too. "'Why, if I do recall Master George Darcy, "'I dare say he did not cut half so dashing a figure.' "'I felt my eyes growing redder. "'My brother and I were of the same height, "'but he was regrettably killed five years ago.' Oh, that is a dreadful shame. She sighed lightly, spared one more scowl for Miss Clara, and then spun her parasol over her shoulder. What brings you to Italy, Mr. Darcy? 
are the same as others, I expect? The weather, I answered quickly, for my health. Lady Holt gave an amused snort. Indeed, such is the case for many. But you look like a gentleman who knows how matters truly stand. Tell me, what gift have you brought? I narrowed my eyes. A gift? She tusked and rolled her eyes. Oh, for the Emperor, of course. The poor man missed Christmas tide in his home country. I found him the dearest little gold chest set, inlaid with rubies and sapphires and... Oh, for mercy's sake! Lord Holt hissed as he reached for his maid's arm for support. My gout is ailing me. Lady Holt's eye sharpened. Oh, poppycock, you do not have gout. I just contracted it. Lord Holt harumphed and turned away, pulling his companion behind him. Well, Lady Holt began a suspicious inspection of her garments and looked as if she was twisting her ankle under her skirts. Something amiss, my lady? I asked. Oh, tis nothing. Well, only that I, too, was suffering the most peculiar aches and pains earlier. Surely I cannot have also contracted that abominable condition. I do not think that is quite how gout... Oh, never mind. She laughed. How very silly of me. Now, as I was saying, the Emperor often fancies a game, and I thought, what better can I gift the poor man than an hour or two of entertainment? And so I have applied myself to learning the game. But it is ever so troublesome to keep the names of the pieces straight. But I am certain the Emperor would be only too happy to assist me. He is quite the gentleman, they say. I declare, have you ever heard anything so monstrous as... As she rambled on about Napoleon Bonaparte and all the hardships of his exile... I had to focus to keep from rolling my eyes. How could one woman spout so many words about nothing? Perhaps I ought to feign illness myself. After what seemed like half an hour, she took a breath, long enough to glance towards the down ladder, and huffed in annoyance. Where is that governess? A governess? My skin prickled. Elizabeth was expected. I whirled around to scan the deck, and found it devoid of any young halts. She clicked her tongue. I told that lazy girl to have the children presentable for their father. And look, my lord has already gone and they are nowhere to be seen. She gave an indignant huff as she swished away, leaving a trail of perfume in her wake. Alone again, I sighed and grasped the railing to fight off a wave of nausea, whether from the perfume or her inane chatter or her careless insults of Elizabeth, I knew not but I did begin to understand the meaning of Lord Holt's precaution against marriage, at least marriage to the wrong woman, but to the right one. Moments later, a commotion arose on the deck when Elizabeth appeared, herding the noble brood, while Lady Holt sashayed on ahead. Elizabeth glanced my way for an instant, meeting my eyes with a look of mortification that squeezed something in my chest. But she had enough troubles and could spare me no more than that brief look. She kept the youngest girl's hand firmly clasped in hers to prevent her from darting off, while the middle girl clung to Elizabeth's skirts in such a way that I wondered how she did not trip. Only the eldest seemed to be causing no trouble, and it was because she appeared to be making a study of aloofness that would have done any Darcy proud. I thought Lady Holt would pass me by, parading her brood about the deck to show them off to other passengers, but I was mistaken. She made straight for me, sweeping a generous hand over the forms of her daughters, and all but ignoring Elizabeth. "'Mr. Darcy, I could not walk on without introducing my darlings. May I present Lady Emily, Lady Beatrice, and Lady Penelope?' Rather pompous introductions for three children still in the schoolroom. My gaze flashed quickly to Elizabeth, but I schooled my features and made a bow. "'Charmed, ladies.' Emily met my gaze once, and gave a cool, distant nod. Then she looked away. How much did the child know? This was the one Elizabeth had called perceptive, and they had all borne witness to my humiliation in their cabin. She was certainly sparing no effort in reminding me that she felt herself to be my superior. The littlest of the Holt children, Penelope, peered up at me with such wide-eyed wonder that I had to suppress a chuckle. "'Mr. Darcy, do you like dolphins?' Well, that was an unexpected question. I find them enchanting. Have you managed to spot any during our voyage? Penelope shook her head with a pout. 
Not yet, but I keep looking. I heard they like to play with ships. Miss Lizzie says. Miss Bennet, Lady Holt interrupted. She sent Elizabeth a scathing glance. Mind your manners, Penelope. We shall have a word about proper address. The little redhead looked abashed for the first time. Her eyes widened, and she drew back slightly, but did I see it properly? It looked as if Elizabeth squeezed her hand in reassurance, and the child grew bold once more. Miss Bennet says they... She glanced up at Elizabeth. They come up to share meals with the seagulls. Well, keep a keen eye, I replied. Perhaps you might see that very thing. Stuff and nonsense, Lady Holt huffed, narrowing her eyes at Elizabeth again. That is the trouble with having so many governesses. One cannot depend on them to have any sense at all. Penelope, you mustn't bother Mr Darcy with such silly things. Elizabeth's lip was caught between her teeth in an effort to maintain her composure. I wanted nothing more than to lock eyes with her, soothe that worried lip with a caress of my own. But naturally that would not have been quite the thing. One day, perhaps one day. But Lady Holt cared nothing for Elizabeth at the moment. Beatrice, address Mr Darcy properly. Don't be shy now, she demanded. The child hesitated, her eyes darting between her mother and me. With a deep breath, she tried. Good day, sir. That effort proved insufficient to satisfy her mother. And, continued Beatrice, tell Mr Darcy about your studies. I caught a flash of panic in Elizabeth's eyes as Beatrice looked down, her face turning a shade of deep pink. The poor child tried to form the words, her voice quivering. I... "'Study f f French and—' "'Lady Holt clicked her tongue in irritation. "'Honestly, Beatrice, such stammering is unbecoming of the daughter of a baron. "'Speak clearly.' "'I wanted to speak for the girl, for it was obvious that her stutter embarrassed her. "'But at that precise instant, Emily's bonnet blew off. "'Odd, for it had been withstanding the breeze quite admirably only a moment before. "'Elizabeth spun and watched it go, her mouth dropping open.' before she turned a strange expression on the dark-haired girl. For her part, Emily only lifted her shoulders. "'Oh, dear,' she said flatly. "'Miss Bennet,' huffed Lady Holt, "'I asked you to see that the girls were quite ready for their airing. Honestly, could you not have tied her bonnet? Mr Darcy, I assure you that such incompetence is not the norm. I... I tipped my head slightly, just a touch, and the wind caught my hat. And no doubt blew it halfway back to Spain. I watched it go, my hand shading my eyes, and was rewarded with the faintest snicker from Elizabeth. Oh, dash it all, I said mildly. Oh, forgive me, Lady Holt, but I fear I am now quite out of countenance, if you will excuse me. I made my bow to her ladyship, then to each of her daughters. Beatrice blushed, Poppy grinned, and Emily appraised me with a curious light in her eyes. Then I tipped my head to Elizabeth. Her parting greeting was the warmest smile I'd yet received from her. A pity we would be disembarking on the morrow. Nine. Elizabeth. The vibrancy of Livorno burst before us. The sun cast a warm golden hue, making the stone buildings lining the port shimmer. Whistles of sailors echoed, mixed with shouts of merchants hawking their wares. Stalls laden with olives, cheeses and fresh bread filled the air with an intoxicating aroma. To the left, a fisherman proudly held up a large catch, its scales glistening, causing Poppy to giggle and Bee to hide her face in horror. Emily simply shrugged. I've seen bigger fish in England. A pair of women walked by, their skirts swishing and hands dancing in the air, engaged in a molto allegro conversation in Italian, the music of their language made me wish I had paid more attention when Papa first tried to teach me. Had I done so, perhaps I would understand what was being said around me. And perhaps he would not have given up on the education of the rest of his daughters so easily. But that was a regret for another time. B tugged at my skirts. M -m Miss L Elizabeth, I have to g go. I looked down. Oh, can't it wait until we reach the inn? B shook her head. Very well, I sighed. We were only a dozen steps off the ship. It wasn't like we'd gone far, 
and I had no better ideas to secure her privacy. Run back on board and use the chamber pot. We will wait for you right here. Bee nodded and raced back up the plank, clutching the front of her skirt. Goodness, she was serious. It was a good thing she'd said something before we got far. No hardship to wait for her here. Eagerly I peered about me, taking in all the new sights and smells. Carts drawn by strong-looking mules clattered on the cobblestones, narrowly missing a group of children who darted about, laughing and chasing a stray cat. High above, the fluttering of laundry hung between windows, and my stomach sank. Why did I suspect that I'd be responsible for laundering the girls' clothing when we got to our inn? Lady Holt had never yet permitted her maid to minister to the girls, so unless the family had secured lodgings where such services were provided, they would have been in England, but here I did not know. It seemed the duty would fall to me. I sighed, and wished for the thousandth time that Mr. Darcy had not been the one to witness my Stella fall from grace. Lady Holt paused at the bottom of the plank, adjusting the lace shawl draped over her delicate shoulders, as she gestured to a waiting hand-drawn conveyance. "'Miss Bennet, I have arranged for a sedan chair to take me with my maid to our lodgings. Do try not to be tardy.' I blinked. "'And for the girls, Lady Holt?' I pulled Poppy closer to my skirts. Her ladyship snorted. "'Miss Bennet, that is why I hired you. You cannot possibly expect us all to take a carriage. The streets are very narrow. Do see to it that they do not soil their skirts on the cobblestones.' "'I... what?' I scanned the port, panic rising in my chest. "'But Beatrice went back aboard for a moment. We cannot possibly follow you now.' Lady Holt tugged at her long gloves. "'Well, you have the direction, have you not? Honestly, Miss Bennet.' My eyes widened. Do you mean we are to find our way alone? I assume you can read, she scoffed. Upon my word, it is simply impossible to find good help. She mounted the little conveyance, her ample form dipping the poles for the poor man who was to draw it. Oh, Lord Holt should be along soon if he can tear himself away from his strumpet long enough to find the inn. You may follow him if you are entirely lost. But, my lady, I... It was no good. Lady Holt's little cart rattled away, with a donkey-drawn drayage cart in tow for all our trunks. Well, at least we did not have to carry our trunks. But I wanted to utter a string of black words that would have scorched the ears of everyone within half a mile. No help for it. I bit back my indignation and looked down at the crumpled piece of paper she'd hastily thrust into my hands earlier. Lucanda della Rosa, I murmured trying to make sense of the cryptic directions. Three streets to the right, down a twisting alley, whatever that meant. If I took three right turns, wouldn't I end up in the same place I was now? I blew out a frustrated sigh. "'Sorry, miss!' B cried. I looked down as she appeared at my side once more. "'Think nothing of it, dear one, but I'm not sure.' I traced my finger over the directions again. If only I could read those Italian words." And that was when I realised that Poppy was no longer beside me. A cold panic seized my chest. Poppy? My voice wavered, hardly louder than the buzz of the busy port around me. Fantastic, Elizabeth. Just let a child wander off in a foreign port. I swivelled around, trying to peer over bustling heads and barrels. Poppy! I called again. The sharp tang of fish filled my nostrils, and the distant sound of vendors, shouting their goods, cluttered the air. There was no way she could hear me if she'd gone more than twenty paces. Bee tugged at my skirt, her eyes round as saucers. Miss Lizzie, where's Poppy? I shook my head, my eyes scanning the tops of hats and trying to peek through the crowd. I clasped Bee's hand tightly, afraid of losing another. Stay close, Bee. Emily, I called, you hold my hand too. Emily looked down at my hand as if I hadn't washed it, but made no complaints before letting me take hold of her. She must have been worried. Does Poppy like flowers, foods? What could she have seen that would make her wander off? Emily looked up. It's Poppy. She doesn't need to see something interesting to run away. I hissed. Blast, but the streets were crowded. Oh, you have a point. Very well, we'll retrace our steps. She couldn't have gone far. 
And if anyone tries to sell you a fish or an alabaster statue, just keep walking. Poppy! My vision blurred at the edges, every cry and shout amplifying in my ears. What if she'd been taken? The thought was too horrible, but my mind wouldn't let it go. I had one duty, one duty, and now Poppy had probably been whisked off by some Italian pirate or black market trader. People jostled past me, unbothered by the distressed governess trying to push through their midst. I could see the scandalised headlines in the London broadsheets already. Foolish governess loses baron's daughter on Italian adventure. Scusi, signore, la polizia, I desperately begged of a passing merchant, hoping he might point me to the local authorities. My Italian, which was practically non-existent, must have been worse even than I thought, because he just stared at me blankly and went on his way. Of course he doesn't understand. Why would I expect anyone here to speak fluent Meryton? Miss Elizabeth, Emily's voice cracked in fear. What do we do? I was shaking and numb, imagining all the hideous things that might befall a child of six lost in a harsh world. She might already be sold as a slave for all I knew. But just as the world seemed to close in, a deep voice rumbled behind me. Lost something. I whirled around to see Darcy, an amused smile playing on his lips, holding a very sheepish Poppy by the hand. I rushed forward, flinging my arms around her. Oh, Poppy, where did you go? Don't you ever do that again? Relief, anger and sheer embarrassment mingled as I looked up at him, tears of relief pricking in my eyes. Mr Darcy, I began, my voice shaky. I can't begin to express my gratitude. I thought, oh, I don't want to even repeat what I thought. Darcy extended a hand to help me to my feet, a hand that I gladly took, because I was still quaking from head to toe. It was nothing, Miss Bennet. She wandered over near a fruit stand, probably hungry. When I heard your voice calling for her, I knew what had happened. I tugged Poppy close to my skirts and kissed the top of her head, my heart still racing. Thank you, I whispered, inhaling the comforting scent of her hair. He tipped his hat ever so slightly. Now, where were you going? And where are Lord and Lady Holt? Uh, I flicked my eyes over the girls. They are not... That is, we were expected to find our lodgings alone. Something dark kindled in Mr Darcy's eyes, putting me very much in mind of our days in Meryton, when he could brood so thoroughly that even Mr Bingley seemed hesitant to approach him. Is that so? he growled. Well then, let us see. Where are you to meet them? Embarrassment welled up again. If I were a proper governess, experienced in the ways of the world, and fully in command of my charges, this would not be such a bother. Ah. Uh, I pulled out the crumpled note and squinted at the instructions as if I could make sense of them. We're trying to find Locanda della Rosa. I glanced around and realised that in my frantic search for Poppy, I'd lost all sense of direction. The landmarks and starting point no longer aligned with where I now stood. Though at this point I must confess I've no idea where we are, let alone where we're going. His eyebrows arched in amused surprise. Lost in Livorno already. Come, let me see those directions. May I? He extended a hand, and I passed him the crumpled note. Darcy flattened it between his hands, his brows furrowing as he examined the scribbled directions. Well, I've never been to Livorno either, but languages and streets have patterns, don't they? He scanned the surroundings, identifying a few vendors who seemed like they might be locals. Approaching one elderly gentleman, Darcy exchanged a few words in Italian, occasionally gesturing to our paper, and then in various directions. After what seemed like a polite yet animated discussion, he returned to us with a more confident stride. "'You'll want to continue straight down this path,' he began, pointing ahead. "'Then, after the aromatic embrace of the fish market, trust me, your nose won't let you miss it, make a left.' Follow that road until you're tempted by the scent of freshly baked bread, and look for a bakery with a vibrant blue awning. That will be your cue to take a right. Turn right again before the street dips. After that, Locanda della Rosa should be just a short walk away. I blinked, both impressed and slightly taken aback. Well, 
Aren't we suddenly the native guide? Thank you, Mr. Darcy. We were quite lost. He tipped his hat. Always at your service, Miss Elizabeth. I was about to walk away, but something made me pause, just for a second. I see you have secured another hat. A shame about the other. A smile played at his mouth. Indeed. How fortunate for me that Livorno has one or two decent haberdashers near the dock. Haberdasher, indeed. This hat looked like he had bought it off a passerby, because it looked nothing like Fitzwilliam Darcy of Pemberley's taste. But I rather liked the way he had lost his last one, so I let it go. You certainly wasted no time about it. Have you already secured your lodgings, too? But I expect you did that before you left London. As a matter of fact, I have not yet settled on my lodgings. But given that there will be familiar faces at Locanda della Rosa... He glanced at the paper in my hand, and then back at me. I might just knock on their door and hope for the best. That's rather spontaneous for you, isn't it? He favoured me with a long look. I cannot say but that my most spontaneous decisions were the best, although perhaps I could do with a little more practice on my execution. My cheeks grew hot. He still thought about that proposal, and he was not sorry he had offered it. What does La Canda de la Rosa mean? Poppy asked, interrupting my rather inconvenient thoughts. I drew a breath, recalling myself, and shook my head. I wish I knew, Poppy. I looked questioningly at Darcy. Emily chimed in with a smirk. You don't know what it means either, do you, sir? I do, in fact. It translates to the Inn of the Rose. It sounds lovely, I breathed. Darcy's gaze lingered on mine, his smile widening just a fraction. Indeed, I hope it is. I always fancy a fine English rose. With a nod and a suggestive twinkle in his eye, he said, Perhaps you will allow me to escort you, Miss Elizabeth. Ladies? With that, he extended his arm and led us through the bustling crowd. I could only stare at his profile in awe as he walked. What had happened to the severe gentleman who used to stare so disapprovingly at me? He had to have come down with some sort of tropical disease. Ten. Darcy. Flickering candlelight from the common room did little to cut through the haze of cigar smoke and laughter that bubbled over from the raucous conversations inside. Everyone was loud, with voices and hands, and hardly any respect for a polite distance between persons. The people I had spoken to in the street had assured me the inn was intimo. It appeared intimo was a poetic way to say, so cramped it would flatter a rabbit hole. I extended my hand to steady the door for Elizabeth and the girls, trying to catch her eye in the process. However, before our brief exchange could evolve into anything more meaningful, the innkeeper bustled forward, cutting between us. The signorinas, yes, le filia di Hille di Holt. Your room is this way. Maria! Without waiting for their affirmation, he summoned a housemaid and shepherded them towards the stairs. Elizabeth hesitated for just a moment, glancing back. Our eyes locked briefly, and then she stumbled, catching her foot on a step. She recovered with a slight grimace, and something muttered under her breath, then hurriedly turned her attention back to the staircase. I watched their ascent for a moment longer. Then, drawing the innkeeper's attention back to me, I inquired, "'Signor, my name is Darcy, and I am seeking a room as well. Something spacious, quiet, perhaps with a view.' The innkeeper shook his head. "'I regret, Signor, but Lady Olt has just claimed the last of our larger rooms. They have uh, extensive needs.' "'Extensive?' I repeated. "'They brought us so many trunks.' The innkeeper gesticulated with his hands. I think the floor will break. How do they walk around? No more rooms upstairs. English. I glanced back toward the stairs, but Elizabeth was already gone. Well, what else do you have? He hesitated. You are alone, signor? Yes. He glanced around, then beckoned me to follow through a narrow corridor that had plainly been added to the building some time after its original construction. In fact, there appeared to be multiple additions. He pushed open a narrow door and gestured inside. Di mia madre, my mother's a room, but she is gone now. 
my condolences. Oh, no, she is visiting my brother. My wife, she is very happy. This way, signor. I ducked inside and looked around. The room was a far cry from what I had hoped for. Stuffy, with a bed that practically shouted back pain, and a desk that looked ready to collapse under the weight of its own history. Richard was going to pay for this when I got back to England. As I scanned the room, trying to find a redeeming feature, my gaze landed on a window, small and rickety, but it opened to let in the mix of salt air and the tantalising aroma from a bakery around the corner, and the blankets over the bed did not look too soiled, a small solace, but to stay in the same inn as Elizabeth Bennet, that made it all worthwhile. I will take it. Si, senor. Ah, you would like some café, a vino? No, thank you, but I might trouble you for some paper and ink. He gestured with his finger and went to the desk to open the drawer. All you need, a senor. I thanked the man and extracted a few coins from my pocket for him. Then I was alone, in a room too low for a man of my height to stand in and too dark to properly see the letters I must now write. This was fast becoming an unfortunate pattern. For the journey home I would most certainly see to better accommodations. But uh, perhaps I would inquire with Lord Holt what his family's plans were. Or perhaps fortune would smile on me and I would find some way to sail home with a bride. And perhaps Napoleon Bonaparte would prove to be simply a docile old man who liked to play chess. I snorted. None of this would be smooth sailing. I seated myself at the desk and unrolled the letter of introduction I'd brought with me for Lord General Neil Campbell. He was the unfortunate soul tasked with supervising Napoleon on Elba, and according to Richard, Campbell might be just as much of a Bonapartist as the silliest English tourist. But I had to appease him to gain an audience with Napoleon. The letter of introduction was handsome, certainly, but insufficient— I would have to put down a few words of my own. I dipped the quill, thought for a moment, and began. To Lord General Neil Campbell, I hope this missive finds you in good health and spirits. I am Mr Fitzwilliam Darcy of Pemberley, Derbyshire. Having recently arrived in Livorno, I humbly seek the honour of an audience with Napoleon Bonaparte. I believe that such an encounter would be enlightening and of mutual interest. I shall await your esteemed guidance on a suitable time for such a meeting, should you deem it appropriate. With the utmost respect, Mr Fitzwilliam Darcy. And now to assure my blasted cousin that I had arrived safely. Dearest Georgiana, I trust this letter finds you in good spirits. I am pleased to report that I have completed my voyage without any incident. The journey over the sea was remarkably tranquil, and I met with one or two previous acquaintances— Perhaps some day I will have the pleasure of introducing them to you. Upon setting foot on land, I was fortunate to find accommodations that, while not as grand as Pemberley, possess their own unique charm. I'm looking forward to sampling the local cuisine, but you may assure Mrs Reynolds when next you write that her cooking shall remain my preference. I wish you could see the views from here, my dear sister. They remind me of some of the landscapes we admired in Mother's paintings, I'm sure you would find much inspiration for your piano compositions amidst these surroundings. I've included a sketch of the harbour for you, for words fail to describe the scene sufficiently. I think I've mastered the way the sails set over the masts on the various ships, but no doubt you could have done them better justice. I am in hopes of speaking with my friend here as soon as he has liberty. I've notified him of my arrival, and wait only on his pleasure. But I heartily look forward to our reunion— and hearing all about your endeavours in my absence. Do write soon, and keep me apprised of any news from home. With all my affection, Fitzwilliam. I sealed and addressed both notes, and carried them out to the main room to seek the innkeeper. Signor, I asked when I found him, will you have these sent? He nodded and took them, and I paused, looking up at the ceiling before retiring back to my room. What would Elizabeth be doing now? no doubt settling the children. She would not appreciate an interruption from me, nor would her employer. I sighed and returned to my room for a bit of rest on a bed that did not rock. Two hours later, a knock at the door woke me. Signor! A young boy, probably the innkeeper's son, stood there with a folded note. Per me? I asked. Si, signor! That was a refreshingly quick reply. Campbell must be presently on the mainland rather than Elba, that could prove fortunate. 
Unfolding the paper, I scanned the contents, my hope sinking faster than a lead weight in water. Denied. The general had no time for unofficial British diplomats. My status, my reputation, none of it seemed to carry weight here. I handed the boy a coin, my mood souring further. Grazie. I dropped back on the bed and scrubbed my face with my palms. The inn, the room, Elizabeth refusing to explain what she was hiding from me, and now the general. This trip was going spectacularly. The room I could bear, but the rest? I needed a new plan, and quickly. Changing Elizabeth's mind was worth every concession, and Napoleon was not going to introduce himself. Elizabeth as the sky outside flirted with twilight hues, the rooms I shared with the girls lit up with a more immediate anticipation. Dinner. My stomach was practically composing its own opera with how it growled. A real meal with hot food and no rocking table to chase my fork over. That sounded decadent. But only if I could stop sneezing. I closed my eyes and sniffed in a sharp breath as the shivers overtook my spine again. Uh, uh... Is it the d d dust, Miss El Elizabeth? B asked. I don't think so. I wiped the water from my eyes and tried to steady my... Ouch! The sneeze was followed by three more just as loud, leaving me gasping and wiping my nose. Oh, I think perhaps it is the flowers. Well, they do smell wonderful, though, don't they? A sharp rap echoed in the room, and before I could utter a word, the door creaked open. A housemaid, cheeks flushed from climbing the stairs, stumbled in with trays stacked precariously in her arms. The scents wafting from them hit me with the force of a runaway carriage. Warm bread, something tangy and spiced, a hint of seared fish. I put away my handkerchief. "'May I help you?' I offered, rising from my chair. She sent me a grateful look, shaking her head as she began laying out our feast. "'Tutto bene, signorina?' she replied with a quick smile before exiting. Poppy's eyes grew as wide as saucers. What in the world is that flat thing? She reached out a curious finger, pressing it into the soft, oily surface of the bread. I believe, dear Poppy, that is what the Italians call focaccia. It smells wonderful. Here, try dipping it in the olive oil. Emily held up her fork, a suspicious-looking greenish-black tidbit stuck to the end. Does anyone have the faintest idea what this is? With a delicate wrinkle of her nose, she turned the shiny nodule around, inspecting it. I think it's a snail without a shell. I shrugged, equally baffled. It looks like some sort of a seed, but your guess is as good as mine. Maybe it's a local delicacy. How does it taste? Emily cautiously opened her mouth and touched her tongue to the thing. Salty. She attempted another taste, then another, and soon she was happily chewing and reaching for more. It's tolerable, she decided. I filled a plate for myself and began sampling everything. No matter how odd or heavily spiced, it was all wonderful to my shriveled stomach. And it seemed to clear my nasal passages, which was a pleasant relief. I particularly liked the seared fish, and I was helping myself to another portion of the pasta when a sudden knock made my hand jump. Before I could muster a response, the door was already swinging open to reveal Lady Holt in all her Mediterranean opulence. "'Miss Bennet,' she began, eyes darting quickly over our half-finished meal, "'I do hope those aren't their nightgowns they're wearing.' I stifled an exasperated sigh. "'No, Lady Holt, we were just—' "'Oh, it doesn't matter now.' She flapped her hand dismissively. "'I've had a marvellous idea.' We are going out for the passeggiata. It's like the fashionable hour in Hyde Park. Everyone does it here, even the rabble, but it is simply the place to be seen. Quickly now, the girls need to look their best. Emily peered up. But, Mother, we're still eating. Oh, we can eat any time. There's a delightful cafe on the promenade, and they serve the most delightful pastries. Maybe even a gelato or two for you girls. Poppy glanced longingly at her plate. I like this, though. B was still chewing, but her eyes darted between her mother and the almost forgotten meal, clearly torn between the two prospects. 
Lady Holt made no attempt to smother an impatient sigh. Miss Bennet, do help the girls get ready, and be certain they look smart. I'll not tolerate any food on their frocks or wrinkles in their skirts. She leaned close to me with a loud whisper. I've heard Lord General Neil Campbell is currently ashore, and I do think it's the perfect opportunity for us to introduce ourselves. I especially wish to court his favour, so that we may take our gifts to Elbus sooner. I resisted rolling my eyes. Of course, Lady Holt, I responded dutifully. Her face brightened even further. Splendid! I shall tell Lord Holt to be prepared. He will be accompanying us without his maid. She made a bitter face. Oh, do hurry, Miss Bennet. I trust you have already aired the gowns. No time to lose. The cobblestone streets of Livorno echoed with the voices of vendors hawking their wares and the distant laughter of children playing by the bay. I trailed behind Lord and Lady Holt, keeping a watchful eye on Poppy, who seemed a little too intrigued by the bustling walk and the birds floating over the bay and, well, pretty much everything. Now and then Lady Holt would attempt to weave her arm through her husband's, looking for all the world, like a cat, seeking affection. Lord Holt, however, seemed to possess a particular talent for evading her. At one point, he executed a rather dramatic stumble over an invisible obstacle, freeing his arm from hers. At another, he paused suddenly, turning to admire the sparkling waters of the bay, conveniently slipping from her grasp once more. I barely suppressed a chuckle, when, out of nowhere, a yank on my arm nearly sent me sprawling. Poppy's eyes, drawn to anything that moved or shone, locked onto a sparkly trinket at a nearby stall. Oh, not again. Poppy, I scolded, you are going to get me knocked down underfoot. Hurry up or we will be separated from the others. She reluctantly let me tug her along, but no one seemed to notice our delay. Lady Holt was surging on ahead with conquest on her mind. Pray tell, the lady inquired of a passer-by, with a flutter of her fan. Where might we find Lord General Neil Campbell this evening? With a few directions, as well as numerous grumbles from Lord Holt, our little parade set off again. The streets grew more crowded as we neared our destination, for it seemed Lady Holt had heard aright when she declared that everyone turned out for the evening promenade. It wasn't long before we came upon Campbell, standing tall amidst a group of equally well-dressed individuals, engaged in what appeared to be a spirited discussion. Lady Holt marched straight up to the group, her chin held high, and her husband dragging along behind her. "'Lord General Campbell,' she greeted, her voice dripping with honeyed sweetness. "'What an unexpected pleasure! I am Lady Holt, and this is my husband, Lord Holt.' The general made a slight face at having his conversation interrupted, but he dipped his head and exchanged pleasantries with Lord and Lady Holt. Finally, I was able to draw a breath for a moment. I stood slightly behind, letting an anxious bee clutch my hand, and ready to grab Poppy should she decide to dart off. But as the introductions went on, I couldn't help but notice Campbell's gaze shifting to me. Lady Holt made a great show of presenting her daughters, Perhaps she thought the presence of children could carry the general's favour. Though I waited for my introduction, it seemed Lady Holt conveniently forgot about my existence. The omission didn't escape Campbell's notice either. His eyes, sharp and inquiring, lingered on me a moment longer. An embarrassed flush threatened to climb my cheeks, and I drew the girls closer. Well, what did I expect? The role of a governess was often an invisible one, even when under the scrutiny of a curious general. After all, what need had I for my pride any longer? At least he was not here to see me being so categorically dismissed. That was when my heart did a perilous somersault. Perhaps I am jinxed, because every time that inconvenient Mr. Darcy flitted through my mind, the man turned up in the flesh, blast him. Lord and Lady Holt, that all-too-familiar voice echoed from behind me, making my spine tingle. What a pleasant surprise to find you partaking in this delightful evening. I swallowed hard and wished I still had my parasol from Longbourn. It would have been convenient to hide behind. Of course, Darcy would be out this evening. Lady Holt fluttered her fan, feigning surprise, but clearly pleased. Mr Darcy, oh, why, you must not have met the General. Allow me to perform the introductions.' 
Darcy gave a short rumble in his throat as he bowed, that deep, warm sound that resonated right through to my very core. Why did he have to sound so... Darcy-ish? And why did his voice have to be the only thing on this whole rotten continent that felt familiar and comfortable? General? Campbell's gaze had finally left off picking me apart, and now he was looking quizzically at Darcy. Darcy, did I not have a letter from you only this afternoon? I believe so, General. Lady Holt beamed, grabbing Darcy by the arm and turning her full attention to the General. General Campbell, Mr Darcy and I share a mutual interest in visiting Elba. Perhaps... She fluttered her lashes. You could assist both of us. It would be such an honour. I couldn't help but roll my eyes. Really? Darcy's brief, strained smile told me how great was his discomfort at being forced to play along with this charade. Campbell seemed a bit taken aback by Lady Holt's forwardness, but he was not called a Lord General for nothing. He studied Darcy for a moment, then bowed. I will see what can be arranged, Lady Holt. As for Mr Darcy, if he expresses the same interest, perhaps something can be discussed. I will have someone contact you in a few days. Darcy, with that imperious grace that he used to employ with Caroline Bingley, disentangled his arm. Thank you, General. Your consideration is most appreciated. The glance he shot Lady Holt, however, said volumes more than his words ever could. Poppy tugged at my arm, no doubt preparing for another escape attempt. I tightened my grip on her hand until my fingers ached, and she squirmed in protest. It would be just my luck that she would try another escape now, when I was trying to remain unobserved. But at least no one was presently looking at me. Lady Holt had found some way to force her husband to speak to the general, and they were already deep into a conversation about the local frutti di mare and certain selections of the fine vino. Darcy had not yet been dismissed, or he did not wish to permit himself to be excused, so he simply stood silently by, attending the conversation as his eyes roamed the speakers. Eventually they lit on mine and stayed there. Oh, heavens, he did not mean to address me now, did he? What would everyone else think? Miss Bennet, he greeted smoothly with the tip of his hat. Well, maybe no one would notice. I was, after all, invisible now. Mr Darcy, I answered in a raspy voice. Taking the air this evening. I see. I hope you had a pleasant meal. I swallowed. Yes, what we had of it. He inclined his head. I am very glad to hear it. I recall how you always enjoyed your constitutionals. I nodded, and something of the old Elizabeth Bennet flickered to life under his gaze. Indeed, but I am afraid there are no mud puddles for me to soil my skirts in here. An odd light kindled in his face. Just so, but there is a very pleasant public garden, only three streets to the north of the inn. I heard of it on my way here. They say it is rarely frequented in the morning hours. I narrowed my eyes. Was he suggesting... I will bid you all a good evening. Darcy lifted his hat, and he was gone. Something squeaked in my ear, and I flinched and turned around. Emily was looking innocently away, but her lips were puckered in a fake kiss, and she was making the most abominable sucking, squelching noise with them. Emily, I hissed, stop that at once. She blinked slowly, a smirk growing on her face. Stop what? You know very well. I pointed at Lord and Lady Holt, still immersed in their conversation with Lord General Campbell. What will your mother say? Her smirk widened to a positive grin. I don't care, and you don't either. You're too worried about what Mr Darcy just said. And streets as I trod their well-worn paths. I always relished a morning walk, purely for fresh air, of course, but as the public gardens loomed, an unbidden image of Oakham Mount in Hertfordshire flashed in my mind. Elizabeth, her hair in playful disarray from the wind, cheeks flushed, a vision I'd stumbled upon more often than mere chance would allow. Gad's teeth, and there she was again, not a memory, but very real, as she paused to smile at two boys playing stickball in the street beyond the garden. 
A few steps further on, she let her hand hover over a cluster of oranges from a nearby fruit stand, and I forgot how to swallow. Great heavens, but she took my breath away. The distinctive tilt of her bonnet, the way she stood half-poised to walk on down the way, or to stay and listen to the fruit vendor. He offered her something, trying to barter with her, but she did not fall so easily. Her voice drifted to me, that sweet music punctuated by laughter, the sort that could either soothe a restless soul or set it aflame. I scoffed at myself. Fresh air, Darcy. Who was I trying to fool? I'd been lurking in this public garden every morning for five days, wondering if she had understood my hint, and if she was willing to do something about it. And finally, here she was, alone for the first time since we landed. Had she come to see me, or was she simply out to purchase some fruit? One way to find out. I shot my cuffs, tugged at my cravat, it never did look quite right without the benefit of my own valet, and studied how best to approach her. A little from the offside, I should think. Pin her between the fruit stall and that tree there, so she could not so easily escape. Or perhaps I should just fling myself at her feet and have done with it. No, slowly. That was the right idea. She was skittish as a young colt for some reason, so perhaps if I eased up on her, let her catch my scent, so to speak. Just a casual greeting. Nothing too forward. Eyes locked on Elizabeth's soft muslin gown, I barely registered the stickball being shot my way until it was too late. It popped up and cracked me in the knee. The dressed boys were playing with a bona fide rock. As my leg buckled, my opposite foot snagged the cobblestones, my ankle rolled sickeningly, and my whirl pitched forward. The ground careened toward me, and Elizabeth turned. Her eyes widened in alarm. I tried to brace myself, arms flailing, but instead I barreled into the fruit stand, the fragile wooden frame splintered under the impact, and an explosion of fruits erupted around me. Apples, oranges and plums hurtled in all directions, pelting me from every angle. I came to a jarring halt amongst the debris, fruit squashed beneath me, the taste of citrus and blood mingling in my mouth. There was a hushed silence. and counting my bones. I had hoped to make an impression, and I had succeeded. The boys, the vendor, and every bystander would certainly attest to that. Even Elizabeth was too astonished to speak, but I did hear several gasps from her. Not, unfortunately, the gasps of awe, or even passion I had hoped to inspire. Mr. Darcy, are you alive? I grunted and tried not to look obvious as I tested my limbs. There was a fresh hole in my trousers, and another in my tongue. Indeed, I was only here, uh, with my compliments. I laid my hand on a cluster of juicy purple grapes, and presented them to her. She received them out of reflex, but her eyes were still fixed on me, her mouth slightly gaped. Are you injured? I braced a hand at my back and another on my ankle, completing my inspection, and lurched to my feet. Nothing broken but the fruit stand. I grimaced and reached into my breast pocket for my billfold. Mi scuso, signor. La compensero per il disturbo. Quanto? The man was already gesticulating and peppering me with more words than I could comprehend at once. But the second he saw my money, his manner changed. His expression grew thoughtful, and he named an exorbitant figure. I flipped a few notes into his hand and glanced down at myself, ripped trousers, fruit stains everywhere, and I smelled like the punch at one of Lady Matlock's dues. But then I looked up to make my excuses to Elizabeth, and her face made it all worthwhile. Her lips were twitching helplessly, her eyes sparkling like they used to. It seems I've become quite adept at making a spectacle of myself in your presence, Miss Bennet. Well, you do have a unique way of immersing yourself in the local culture. I stopped and studied her face. She was actually smiling, truly shining in her old merriment for a few seconds. I'd break my leg in earnest if I could put that smile on her face again. And what brings you to the gardens today? I, um... 
in search of Lord Campbell, hoping to have a word with him. Her eyebrows slipped upward. Miss Bennet, in truth I was hoping to encounter you, to see that you are well. She hesitated, her eyes darting away for a split second. As well as can be expected, the, uh, the children have a newfound fondness for citrus fruit. And yourself? Her eyes narrowed faintly, and one side of her mouth curved just a bit. I prefer the pasta. I gave her a wry look. That is not precisely what I was referring to. I know exactly what you are referring to, and in reply... A fine line appeared between her eyebrows. I am tolerable. There is that word again, tolerable. One of your favourites, as I recall. Good Lord, will you never forgive me that ill-judged remark? Or perhaps permit me to redefine the word? Elizabeth's teeth flashed in a genuine smile. And how would you define it? I gazed long down into her eyes and offered my arm. She considered for a moment, then permitted her hand to rest on my elbow. There are few things I can tolerate with perfect equanimity, even pleasure. Your company happens to be one of them. Her nostrils fluttered with an indrawn breath, and her cheeks grew dusky. Please, Mr. Darcy, your compliments are kind, but... Then permit me to escort you back. No more compliments, no impertinent inquiries. Merely two acquaintances out for a morning stroll. She thinned her lips, and her head dipped in assent. We began to walk side by side, our steps naturally falling together, as if we did this every day. How could she not see how well we suited? Then, without warning, her steps faltered. She scrunched up her face, blinking rapidly and sucking in air through her nose. Elizabeth? Ah! She cut herself off, her breath shuddering. Ah! Ah! Choo! She gasped and blinked. Oh, goodness, Mr. Darcy, I am afraid the flowers and... Ah! She sniffed again, her entire body contracting in shivers. Here. I presented my handkerchief. Let us walk a little distance from the gardens. Elizabeth kept my handkerchief pressed to her nose, her breath coming in quick little stabs for some distance, until we were far from the trees. Finally, she swallowed and drew an easy breath. Thank you, Mr. Darcy. I can launder this if... Well, think nothing of it. I reclaimed the handkerchief and put it in my pocket. Could she really think I would complain about the scent of her skin on my handkerchief? If only the rest of my clothing could carry her fragrance the way it had when we had danced at Netherfield. Are you well now? I do not recall you suffering from such a malady in Meryton. A faint smile warmed her lips. I was used to everything in Meryton, not here. I see. Then let us keep to the clearer paths on our way back. I would have been perfectly content simply to walk beside her for hours, but the longer we toured together, the more drawn her features became. It looked like she had not blinked in some minutes. There must be some way of setting her at ease. I cleared my throat. I have not had the chance to ask after your family recently. How are the Bennets of Longbourn? Her breathing grew even more irregular. They are... they're well, thank you. Her voice wavered slightly. And your family? Your sister, Georgiana? She was well when I left England, I said warmly. Staying with friends in Bath. In fact, I've written to her a couple of times since I've been here... I hope she will be delighted to hear about all my travels, but I confess I am a rather dull correspondent. Elizabeth lifted one shoulder. You could tell her about your adventures in purchasing fresh fruit, or taking your exercise on the ship. Now that would be an interesting letter. I shot her a look. Yes, well, I'm not certain my vanity can withstand a full and honest accounting of my misadventures. It is bruised enough just by your comprehension of my follies. Her cheek dimpled in another smile. And yet, if you were to ask my opinion, I would say that you improve upon closer acquaintance. I tugged her to a stop and stepped before her. I do. She swallowed. I, I did not mean that the way that perhaps it sounded. 
Well, it was a start. But it would be a lie to say that my shoulders did not drop slightly. She was so close for a moment there. I sighed and suggested that we resume walking. What of your aunt and uncle, the ones who invited you to Derbyshire? Her face drained of colour, and her voice became barely audible. I'd rather not discuss that now, if you don't mind. Blast. Very well, do not ask about the aunt and uncle. Right. I'm sorry, Miss Bennet, I didn't mean to pry. She tried to muster a smile, but her facade of composure cracked slightly. It's quite all right, Mr Darcy. Just an unfortunate series of events. She looked ahead and pointed at the street. I believe we've passed the inn. I looked over my shoulder. Well, we jolly well have. And now you have another failing to add to my account. I lose all sense of direction when meditating on a pair of fine eyes in the face of a pretty woman. Mr Darcy, oh, fear not, Miss Bennet. I shall refrain from further compliments. But that one could not be helped. It was I who was cast in a poor light. Do you see? Oh, come then, let us turn back. As we approached the inn, she finally looked up at me, the hint of a smile playing on her lips, though her eyes still held a shade of sadness. Thank you for your company, sir. I do hope you are able to speak with Lord General Campbell again soon, but I doubt he will be waiting for you in the public gardens. Is that your way of saying that I should not look for you there, either? She bit her lip and curtsied. Good day, Mr Darcy. Elizabeth. Drawn there but it was such a fine morning, and the girls were still asleep, so how could I not walk somewhere? The sun was out in full force, turning the gardens into a riot of colours that would have been all but unknown in England at this time of year. There were birds in the treetops, fresh flowers along the path, but that stone bench was sitting there empty. Drat! Truly, I had expected to see Mr Darcy sitting there, his back rigid and his eyes fixed on the street, waiting for me but of course he wasn't there. The garden was an echo of Longbourn, winter jasmine pollen tormenting my nostrils with fresh tickles, hellebores and a few scattered roses lighting up the footpaths. Brushing a few leaves off the bench, I sat, half expecting to hear Mary's determined piano thumping in the background and Lydia and Kitty squealing on the lawn. But no, instead a thrush sang, its notes plucking the strings of my little homesick heart. Even the stray weeds growing in the cracks between the pavers were cruel in their resemblance to those at Oakham Mount. How many secrets had I whispered to their long-born cousins? Too many. I closed my eyes and forced myself to draw a few deep breaths, stiff upper lip and all that. Regrets have an uncanny knack of rearing their ugly heads, right when they are least convenient. It was as if each thought delighted in prodding my already taxed sensibilities— and I could sense the impending waterworks. Not here, not now. I blinked away the telltale sting. What if someone were to walk by? A sorry sight I would be, with my nose running and my eyes swollen. But with Mr Darcy so close, the memory of all I had turned from clinging to me with every step, it was impossible not to think about all the reasons I could never go back. Lydia, Wickham, that entire Brighton disaster... Why hadn't I been more insistent with my father when he permitted Lydia to go to Brighton? And why, for heaven's sake, did I not reveal my source about Wickham's character? Stubborn pride. But perhaps Mr Darcy's name might have made all the difference. Now Uncle Gardner was under financial strain, trying to fix a mess that should never have happened in the first place. Could I really blame him for saying there was no more he could do for us? We Bennets had brought him nothing but trouble. But that was not the worst of it. The worst. Oh, where to even begin? All I knew was that even with the troubles and shattered hopes that had come with taking a position in service, it was better than some of the alternatives. It was just one more in a long series of very bad decisions. And speaking of bad decisions, Mr Darcy flitted back into my mind. Why did he have to go and propose to me last spring? And why did he have to keep acting like he wanted to court me, even after everything? I was a governess now, firmly out of his reach, socially speaking. 
and he did not seem like the man to offer me anything less honourable. What would it take to get the message into his head that he had to forget about me? I couldn't even think why he would be so stubbornly fixed on me in the first place. Well, there was my answer, because he was stubborn. And I still hadn't eliminated the possibility of some tropical malady that made him dotty in the head. I tugged out my handkerchief, public or no, and blew my nose, rather loudly. Enough self-pity, Elizabeth. Life had to move on. But, oh, that stubborn little spark of... Was it hope? Refused to be snuffed out. Bloody thing. Twelve. Elizabeth. Upon entering the inn's courtyard, I saw Lord Holt's maid, Miss Clara, precariously balancing an array of parcels. No one was near the door, and she was trying in vain to open it with an elbow. One package wobbled, threatening to tumble. Miss Clara, allow me, I called out, rushing forward and grasping the door for her. She paused, her mouth dropping in surprise. Thank you, Miss Bennet. No trouble at all, I replied, taking some of the parcels from her. It seems you have your hands full today. She nodded. Lord Alt has many needs and desires. These are just a few of them. Yes, ahem. That was quite enough talk about Lord Holt's needs and desires. After you. We began ascending the staircase, and I couldn't help but notice the nervous look she kept sending my way. Is something wrong, Miss Clara? She shook her head. You don't need to help me, miss. You shouldn't be seen with me. I glanced over at her. Seen by whom? We know almost no one here. She puckered her lips and tipped her head backward down the stairs. More people are watching than you think. I sent a glance downstairs myself. To whom could she be referring? Who knew us? Well, there was Darcy, but it was not as if I were trying to make a favourable impression there. Perhaps there were a few English gentry sprinkled about who would make a point of being scandalised back in London. But here, they hardly seemed to notice either of us. And I wasn't sure I cared anyway. I cleared my throat and turned the subject. Oh, these parcels, are they from the local market? Most of them, yes, she replied, shifting the packages in her arms. Silks, wines and a few things for his personal enjoyment. I raised an eyebrow, but chose not to probe that line of conversation further. Well, Livorno has a charm about it, doesn't it? Different from England. She seemed to ponder this for a moment. Yes, the freedom here is different but also sometimes more binding. How so? She hesitated, glancing my way with an unreadable expression. Being far from England means a little more liberty, fewer judgments, but... We had gained the top of the stairs now, and she sucked her plump lip between her teeth and drew a deep breath as she regarded the door to Lord Holt's room. My heart squeezed for her. She really was a pretty young thing, I'd wager she was no more than eighteen, blonde and voluptuous, and not given to much conversation, and probably a daughter of desperate circumstances. I shifted the package I carried and set my hand on her arm. Are you well? She blinked as if just awakening. Yes, Lord Alt is away just now, so I shall have a few moments to myself. Do you... She looked down the hall once more. Do you want to come in for tea? she whispered. The housemaid should have brought the breakfast tray while I was out. I blinked. Enter Lord Holt's chamber and take tea with his mistress. That seemed like a trespass that would be far more than I would engage for. But then I studied the girl's face once more. When was the last time anyone was friendly to her? I drew a breath and nodded. Thank you, yes. Stepping across the threshold of the room Clara shared with Lord Holt, I was immediately struck by the opulence surrounding me. Deep maroon drapes framed the windows, while a canopy bed adorned with gold and intricate lacework took centre stage. The furniture seemed more suited to a London townhouse than a guest room at this cramped inn. Miss Clara fidgeted with the lace on her gown, her eyes darting around nervously as she led me to a set of chairs arranged by the window. Please sit, she said, her voice higher pitched than usual. I took a seat, 
and as I did, I noticed a fine porcelain tea set displayed on the table. Oh, this is quite lovely. She gave a small smile as she poured. Thank you. It's... it's Lord Oates. It does have a penchant for the finer things. I sipped the tea, which was, unsurprisingly, exquisite. Oh, it's delightful. Miss Clara took a deep breath, her shoulders visibly relaxing. I never expected to find myself in such company or surroundings, she confessed. Sometimes I feel like an imposter trying to fit into this world. I reached out, placing a gentle hand over hers. Miss Clara, we are all imposters from time to time. She looked up. But you aren't like me. You were born one of them. You command respect that I never shall. You know what to do, how to talk to him. I laughed lightly. Not so much as you would think. And besides, you seem as if you've learned your way. She lifted her shoulder and toyed with her cup. Only because Lord Holt wanted me. He always gets what he wants. A shiver raced up the back of my neck. Indeed, I murmured, then hid behind my cup. But he's not been unkind to me, Clara hastened to add. No? She shook her head. Well, not very. I suppose girls like me don't get any say, but he's not cruel. Only sometimes I don't understand all the things he asks for. My ears were flaming now. The last thing I wanted to hear was what Lord Holt asked his mistress for. I just stared at the table. Is that so? I asked numbly. Clara leaned forward with a nervous whisper. It's not like when we were back at home. He's gone dodgy somehow. Dodgy? My eyebrows edged upward. Oh, aye, he's always out late at night, has guests at strange hours and odd parcels from places I've never heard of. Sometimes I'm asked to deliver messages to people who don't wish to be seen with him. But, she lifted her shoulders, it's a sight better than what I had before. I thinned my lips. I expect it might be. Do you know, sometimes the roles we're given aren't the ones we choose for ourselves. She sighed and offered her first smile. Yes. Well, I set my cup aside and rose. Speaking of which, I expect the girls are wanting me by now. Thank you for the tea. Darcy. The hustle of the Italian marketplace swelled around me, a jumble of different languages and the rich scents of foods and spices from various corners of the world. Expatriates, diplomats, merchants, a mixing pot of Europe's entrepreneurs, opportunists and malcontents. I stood across the street from the pub I had heard about earlier in the day, flexing my fist and trying to school my expression. Devil tape, Richard. Why the bloody blazes would he think I, who could not even play at whist because my face always gave away my hand, could slide into the world of subterfuge? I'd be as like to get myself locked up for a Bonapartist myself as actually to glean anything useful from the local residents. But six days had gone by since I first arrived in port, and I was no nearer to any answers about Napoleon's intentions. With Lord Governor Campbell still declining to respond to my request for an audience, I had no choice but to seek information wherever it might be lying around. If I could just adopt an easy manner, no doubt Campbell had men watching me. If my curiosities and actions tipped me too far one way or the other, politically, I'd no hope of securing his goodwill. So I had to find some way to play my cards close. The irony wasn't lost on me, as the one person who could navigate these waters with grace was the very woman who continued to elude me, Elizabeth. Taking a steadying breath, I walked inside and selected a table. This part would not be so hard. Order a drink, perhaps a meal, and let the world go by as I waited for a chance to hear something of interest. I attempted to adopt Elizabeth's manner. Ease, charm, a touch of genuineness, for people trusted a person who seemed natural and honest in their enjoyment of conversation. I had scarcely enjoyed a conversation in my life that did not revolve around Pemberley, or Elizabeth Bennet. Focus, I reminded myself. I decided to pretend I was waiting for her to walk in that door, and I felt my face lightened by several measures. And I did find myself drawn into a number of fresh conversations I might not otherwise have. The glasses of wine disappeared down my gullet, 
as new acquaintances laughed and told me their life stories. A fellow down the way was opening a new drapery shop and wished for me to congratulate him. A young couple had just celebrated their nuptials, and the owner of the pub was the bride's uncle, so everyone partook in a toast. An older man with no other company glanced around with watery eyes and asked for someone to share a drink in honour of his departed wife. To all these requests, I responded by making myself as agreeable as possible. The evening slowly wore on as patrons of the establishment came and went in merry clusters. The warm glow of the hanging lamps cast flickering shadows, melding with the murmur of conversation and distant laughter. Each time the door swung open, I'd look up expectantly, hoping to see a face that might look as if it held secrets. I struck up a few more conversations, with an elderly Italian merchant regaling tales of his seafaring youth, a young couple giggling and whispering endearments in the corner, and a group of sailors fresh from their journey, their boisterous voices narrating wild adventures on the high seas. Despite the hours of waiting and the countless glasses of wine, I had gleaned nothing of value. Some spy I made. If I could just hear a sliver of a rumour, someone being paid off for something, or patrons expressing discontent with the current state of economics. Something useful. My patience was wearing thin, and I dared not introduce another glass of wine to my overly taxed gastronomy. I was on the brink of conceding the evening as a fruitless endeavour, when the door creaked open once more. A middle-aged Englishman with greying temples and the poised air of someone well acquainted with the world chose the table opposite mine. He ordered a drink, settled into his chair, and ignored the room for a solid quarter of an hour. I commenced a detailed study of the bottom of the empty wine bottle on my table, trying to keep from looking like I was watching him. Finally, he finished his drink, stood and stretched, levelling a knowing smirk in my direction. Strange to find another Englishman here, he began, lifting his empty glass in a half-toast. Especially not one indulging in the local pleasures. I have indulged in quite enough local pleasure for one night, I replied, gesturing to the bottle. Yes, but you were alone. No company for you, sir. I made a nonchalant face. I prefer to reflect on the countenance of one lady in particular, and she is not here. The man tipped his glass. A romantic, then, may I? He set his hand on the chair opposite me. By all means, Darcy, Fitzwilliam Darcy of Derbyshire, may I buy you something? He settled into the chair. With a good will. Grappa, please, and I hope you will join me. Benedict Harwood, from a back alley in London, I'm afraid. I summoned the waiter, and a moment later we were both suited with a strong distilled beverage that smelled like rotting shoe leather and kicked like a mule. I only barely managed to keep from coughing. Harwood savoured his drink with a sigh of refreshment. Oh, excellent. What brings you to Livorno, Mr Darcy? A business and a change of scenery. And you? Oh, a bit of this and that, he replied, sipping his drink. Trade, mostly. The Mediterranean has its charms. You don't say. What sort of ventures do you primarily engage in, Mr Harwood? Harwood took a moment, eyeing me cautiously as he sipped of his grappa. Oh, fine wines, of course. Some textiles from the east, olive oil, you know, the staples that make life a touch more pleasant. Taking another measured sip of his grappa, Harwood leaned back, eyes scanning me with subtle curiosity. And what of you, Mr Darcy? You look a gentleman born, if ever I saw one. A man of your standing surely has a hand in a number of ventures— any interests in Mediterranean trade? I have investments in several sectors. Timber, textiles, a bit of spice trade through the East India Company. And diversification is the key, as they say. But the Mediterranean has always intrigued me. The volatility of the region, the flux of its politics, seems to offer both risk and reward. Harwood's eyebrows raised a fraction, hinting at an appreciation of my candour. Ah, so you understand the dance. Uh, politics. I could not have said it better. It is not just products, but knowing the right people. And information. Information is a valuable commodity in and of itself. I nodded, seizing the opening. Speaking of which, with such a variety, surely some 
Unexpected commodities might occasionally make their way into your cargo. A slight shift in his posture, a narrowing of his eyes. Harwood's demeanour changed. The joviality that marked our earlier conversation had ebbed, replaced by something more guarded. The Mediterranean is vast, Mr Darcy. One hears tales, but in business it is best to focus on what's in front of you. Less risky. My heart rate ticked up a notch. Had I been too eager, shown my hand too early? His veiled response and that inscrutable look suggested as much. I only ask, I replied slowly, because I am deliberating on a rather large investment. One wishes to know as much as he can before committing. To each his own. I've always believed in not digging too deeply where it's unnecessary. Harwood rose, dropping a few coins onto the table. Perhaps we'll speak again, Mr Darcy. 13. Elizabeth I carefully pulled the blankets up to the girls' chins, ensuring they were snug and warm. The room, bathed in the soft light of a single candle, felt secure and comforting. Taking a deep breath, I allowed myself to soak in the moment, cherishing the simplicity of it all. I would have liked to have had children. That thought stung with a bite I'd not expected. I had known I was probably giving up my chance at a family when I entered service. How many governesses die unmarried and childless? But perhaps a few find a home and a family, some local widower in desperate need of a mother for his brood, an unpaid governess in reality. I had thought I had settled the matter in my own heart, keeping my dignity intact and trying to lessen the burden on my family for my sisters to make their own ways. That had been consolation enough. And then Darcy had to turn up. Trap that man. The real bother of it was that I was starting to wish rather fervently that I had answered him differently that day in Huntsford. Had I, I would know by now the comfort of an honest man's love. And I might have prevented... Well, anyway, the girls were all asleep, or nearly so. I drank in a sigh and stood, letting the candlelight warm their faces one last time. That was precisely the moment that the door banged open and I nearly jumped out of my stockings. I scarcely avoided tripping over the rug. As I steadied myself, Lady Holt marched inside. Miss Bennet, you are not idling, are you? I put my finger to my lips and eased away from the beds. The girls are trying to sleep, my lady. Oh, pish posh, they are not infants, Miss Bennet. But Beatrice has been experiencing nightmares and Poppy is often restless in the... Oh, come, Miss Bennet, I need you. Only look at this, she exclaimed, waving an elegant crumpled envelope in one hand and a torn sapphire gown in the other. The sight of the damaged dress, a tragedy in silk, sparked a sense of dread in the depths of my belly. Can you imagine... An invitation from Lord General Campbell for dinner tomorrow. But this wretched voyage, she lamented, showing me the tear in the gown, her voice fragile as if the world had conspired against her. When my maid unpacked my trunk, look what happened. A nail, no doubt, knocked about by some careless sailor. Oh, no. I knew where this was heading. She looked me up and down as if evaluating my worth in stitches and hems. Your mother must have taught you properly. Surely you must have some skill with a needle. My maid is quite overwrought with tending to my other needs. Will you have it mended by morning? Oh, sewing. My personal version of purgatory. I was engaged to care for the children, my lady, I offered weakly. And they are asleep. Come now, Miss Bennet, a few minutes is all it will take. Mustn't idle. That writ would take hours to mend properly. I sighed, resigning myself to a long night. I cannot promise it will be a perfect repair. This is a rather large rip, and that is why it must be you rather than some kitchen maid. Surely you must have attended one or two dinner parties somewhere. I cannot think they would have been very lavish, but you must have some appreciation for what must be done and how best to hide such a seam. It must drape just so, and you cannot be entirely ignorant of this. Give it to my maid in the morning so she can have it properly cleaned and pressed. As she pranced out, I felt the weight of the gown in my hands. Silk might be light, but the insult certainly wasn't. This was not my expertise, nor did it fall within my expectations for this position. 
but there was no help for it. I would have to see to the gown. How was I even to spread this thing out to lay the rip flat? The room was crowded with the girl's belongings. Moreover, a lantern bright enough to sew by would surely disturb Poppy, and the last thing I desired was a sleep-deprived escape artist to manage. The common room downstairs would have to do. It might not even be so distasteful, a change of scene, and some decent light to work with. I carried the bundle downstairs over my arm and asked if the innkeeper could provide me with a private corner table and a lantern. I situated myself with my needle and thread, turning the lantern to cast a warm glow over Lady Holt's precious gown. The flickering light made the silk shimmer, and for a little while I lost myself in the rhythm of the work. Gradually, everyone else retired for the night, and I had the room to myself, but for an occasional cat. I had been working nearly an hour, when the inn door creaked open, admitting a draught, and the staggering form of, Oh, good heavens, was that Mr. Darcy? My needle froze in mid-air. This was new. Had he been beaten up? Or was he just dead drunk? He looked like he'd battled the world and lost. Clothes rumpled, face flushed. The proud, composed Darcy I knew seemed a lifetime away. He paused to be doubly certain the door was closed. Then, without preamble or greeting of any kind, he pointed his feet toward my corner and flopped down in the chair opposite me. I blinked. All sense of boundary seemed to have dissolved in whatever he'd been drinking. "'Am I to have the pleasure of seeing you in this dazzling confection sometime soon?' he asked, his voice perfectly crisp. I stared at him. He didn't sound drunk. "'Are you well, Mr. Darcy?' He made a face and swallowed, then lifted his thumb and index finger to pinch the air. I am slightly inebriated. I can tell. I dropped my eyes to the dress to complete the stitch I'd been poised to make when he stumbled in. Must have been some party. I do not partake in parties, Miss Bennet. Well, what did you partake in? His lip curled. Some ghastly Italian creation that tasted like watered-down lava. He winced and rubbed his forehead. Two bottles of wine and a glass of bitter ale, and I think a couple of glasses of something made from anise to celebrate a new couple's nuptials. It was probably divine if you like anise. I find it repugnant. My eyebrows climbed my forehead. And you consumed these all by yourself? Over several hours... I was ingratiating myself to the locals. Next time, try just smiling and being friendly. He leaned back slightly. I doubt the good proprietor of the establishment where I spent the afternoon would have appreciated my custom if I had stuck to tea. Ah. I plucked the needle into the silk for another stitch, casting glances at him every few seconds. So it is Colonel Fitzwilliam who is to blame for your present state? He straightened and let his hand bang on the table. By Jove, it is. I shall have another transgression to lay at his feet when I return home. I snickered. His list of sins must be rather long by now. You can have no possible idea. He paused, then gestured to the gown in my hands. I trust you were not wearing that when it was damaged. I looked up at him through the fringe of loose hair that fell over my forehead. Why would you say that? Something flickered in his gaze. Because I should hate to have to challenge someone to pistols at dawn for importuning you. Is it possible for your heart to actually drop into your shoes? Because I think mine did. My mouth went dry, and I was a few seconds in finding a reply. This is Lady Holt's gown. He looked for a moment as if my answer made no sense to him. Then something hardened. His cheek flinched and his jaw tightened. Ah, there he was, the old Darcy, who would never converse with a... a servant. She made you mend her gown. His voice was low and almost menacing. I am at her ladyship's service, I answered simply. Darcy leaned in, his gaze fixed on the gown, but not really seeing it. You should be wearing silks and satins, not mending them. Yes, my heart was definitely in my shoes. 
I gulped and tried desperately not to let him swallow me whole in that hungry gaze of his. Oh, someone has to. But why you? Why this? Why aren't you telling me, Elizabeth? You're a gentleman's daughter, hardly alone or friendless. Surely there was no need for this. I am not. I stabbed my needle into the gown. A gentleman's daughter. His brow furrowed. Of course you are. I've met your family, seen your home. It is no longer my home. Well, it would be had you not left. I blew out a sigh, feathering the hair off my face. What I'm trying to tell you is that the Bennets no longer hold Longbourn. By now, my parents, Jane, Mary and Kitty, have all removed to the cramped old Dower House, and the property is let to a stranger. Darcy narrowed his eyes, and I could almost see smoke coming out of his ears. You... what? I pulled the old thread from my needle and started a new length, avoiding his gaze. My father found himself deeply in debt to my uncle, with no way to repay what was owed. No doubt it would have been smoothed over in time, but it came at such a moment as to cause particular hardship to my uncle's business. He lost an opportunity that would have secured his profits for the next year. I lifted a shoulder and made another stitch. We had but one bargaining chip left, with which to make it right, our home and our place in society. Darcy's mouth was hanging open, and I am certain that was a first for him, but he closed his teeth with a snap and studied me for a moment. I notice you do not mention your youngest sister. Dare I ask where she is? I swallowed. It would probably take little imagination on your part. Indeed. Did she marry the rascal? Regrettably, yes. I chewed my lip and closed my eyes. Might as well confess it. I am now in possession of a brother-in-law named George Wickham. Darcy lurched to his feet, his chair squeaking on the floor. Wickham? I resumed sewing. Lydia was permitted to go to Brighton as a guest of the regiment commander's wife, and the rest, as they say. His knuckles were white on the edge of the table. How much did your uncle pay to bring about the marriage? I... I swallowed and let the gown fall to my lap. I do not know. More than my father had. He said it would take a five-year lease on Longbourn to recover it. I heard a sharp hiss. Why would you not tell me sooner? I shook my head, my eyes fixed on the gown. What was I to tell you? That you were right about everything? That Wickham was a scoundrel and my family's behaviour was appalling? You already knew that. Elizabeth. I could no longer keep staring at the gown. His voice, good Lord, his voice was a weapon, warm and tender, gentle and eloquent, and it cut me straight to the heart. My lip trembled, and I found my gaze pulled up to his, and as my eyes tipped upward, I felt it, the first tear splashing onto the corner of my cheek, probably the first of many. Darcy plucked the gown out of my lap and cast it aside. Then his hands were tugging at mine, and before I quite knew what was happening, he had drawn me into his arms, and I was wiping away my tears on the white silk of his cravat. Somehow he was everywhere, around me and above me, his fingers caressing my chin, and his other hands sprawling possessively over my back. And all I could do, upon finding myself in such an embrace, was sob. But he made no protests, no pleas to stop making such a fuss, or to keep my chin up and put on a smile for politeness's sake. None of that nonsense. He just held me as the spasms grew worse, and I finally let go. All the shame and resentment I'd bottled up, all the rage at missed opportunities, and the monstrous sense of unfairness I'd carried around for months. I exhausted all of it into Mr. Darcy's chest. I fear I coughed and sputtered all over that man's shirt, and I was fisting the fabric of his coat to prevent him from pulling away enough to look at my face. But he didn't need to look. Surely he knew already what a silly mess I had made of myself, because when my breathing finally started to mellow, and the humiliation of crying all over Mr. Darcy's rather firm chest swelled upon me, a handkerchief presented itself. I sniffed, gratefully accepted, and tried to mop my swollen eyes. 
I think I ruined it, I rasped as I handed it back. Ruined it? He smiled as he tucked it back into his breast pocket. I shall never wash it again. But you seem to have missed one or two. He cupped my cheek, his warm fingertips grazing my skin, and brushed another hot tear away. Then his hand stilled, and he stopped breathing. Elizabeth. I closed my eyes and felt his hand slip down to caress my chin, nip at my throat, and finally coax me into tipping my face up to his, a warm breath shattering over my skin. How close was he? And then, for just an instant, I thought I felt something flutter over my lower lip. I sucked in a breath and pulled back. Mr Darcy, you're drunk! He looked as if someone had punched him in the stomach, all the wind knocked out of him. So I am, but only a little. I tried to laugh, but it came out as a horrible snort. I had to wipe my nose again. A little? I've never seen you so... Yes, you have. Just once. I crossed my arms and sniffed. Oh, when you proposed, of course. No, I'd not touched a drop that day. My life on it. Or, if I was intoxicated, it was not on Lady Catherine's port. I was starting to breathe a little more normally now. Then, when? I whispered. The night we met. It was the anniversary of my father's and brother's deaths, and before we left for the assembly I indulged in some of my father's scotch, in their honour. A great deal of it, I'm afraid. But one of my... talents, if you wish to call it such, is that alcohol affects me less than others. I become less patient, a little less inclined to tolerate nonsense and my stomach does not forgive me easily. He stepped closer to me again. But I am not blind, Elizabeth, nor have I lost my faculties. Well, you might be the only one. I clutch my arms a little more tightly over my chest. It figures you would be the one man in the world who could down enough alcohol to float the entire English Navy and only earn yourself a bit of a red nose and a slightly amorous mood for it. My mood has nothing to do with the wine. I let my gaze drift over him, the starved, aching look in his eyes, the way he still listed toward me like a sailor, so accustomed to the rocking sea that he no longer trusted solid ground. If he kept on with this, I'd have nothing left with which to resist him. I could still feel that brush of something on my lip, the strength of his arms around me, and I'd have given anything to lose myself there again but he didn't deserve to inherit the wreck that my life had become. It would be like ripples on a pond, first his friends, then his sister's prospects, then perhaps even his own feelings toward me. Everything would sour, and eventually he would resent me for it. I shook my head and pulled away from him at last, and a chill shivered over my back when I realised that his arm had still been around me. I... I need to finish Lady Holt's gown. Darcy looked broken and weary, like he'd just aged five years, but he nodded and made no attempts to draw me back. Then I shall wait up with you if you do not object, to see to your safety. He took me by the hand and led me like a dance partner back to my seat. Then he gathered up that rumpled gown and draped it once more over my lap. He even cast about and bent at the knee to recover the tiny needle I'd dropped on the floor when he had first pulled me into his arms. All I could do was stare at him. Do not let me interrupt your work, he said as he reclaimed his chair. Finally, I found my voice again. Well, it's going to be a while longer. What are you going to do? He propped his elbow on the table, rested his chin on his fist, and smiled. I mean to meditate on the very great pleasure of being privileged to watch. Fourteen. Darcy. The cream-coloured invitation glinted in the light as I studied the intricate calligraphy again, the emblem of Lord General Campbell prominent at the top. My fingers drummed a nervous rhythm on the desk. This was it, my chance to make the right impression, the very evening that could define my mission here. I'd found it slipped under my door last night, after seeing Elizabeth safely upstairs. At the time, my brain had been spinning, and my body humming with a thousand other feelings. 
I'd nearly stepped on it, and only remembered to pick it up again later, after giving myself a long talking to in the mirror. At least I had some answers now about Elizabeth, and I could almost understand why she had run from me, because there had been a time, not that long ago, I was ashamed to confess, when a woman whose family was tainted by scandal, and whose prospects were so utterly ruined, would earn only scorn from me. But that was before Elizabeth, before she had laid bare all my faults, exposed the iniquity I'd once considered pride under good regulation. Egad, how vile that phrase sounded to my ears now. What an ass I must have made of myself, so much so that the most gracious, loveliest, best-humoured and most intelligent woman of my acquaintance thought I despised her for her family. Once I would have debated whether I could dare align myself with her after everything that had happened. No doubt I would have come to the same conclusion as I did that day in Huntsford, that there would never be another like her, and I'd be a fool not to claim her when she was there before me. But now there was not even a hint of a question in my mind, and there was no asking myself if I could love Elizabeth and accept her as my own. There was only the matter of convincing her that my affections remained unchanged. If there remained obstacles to overcome, I would saw off my own appendages to do so. But walking away from her was never an option, because no matter what else happened, I was a lost man, and I would never be whole until she pledged herself to become my missing half. Those were the thoughts that were tormenting me when I stumbled across that invitation last night. I'd almost kicked it aside to be dealt with in the morning, but the fine script of my name on the outside gave me pause. And now I knew why Elizabeth had been frantically mending her ladyship's gown. It was to be a dinner party, and I'd earned enough of Campbell's regard to merit an invitation. And now it was time to dress. I took a deep breath and surveyed the garments laid out on my bed. Every stitch, every line was meticulously crafted to impress. Which would convey the right message? I knew I should have brought my valet. I had to look the part of the dignified English gentleman, with nothing unstable or questionable about me. But I also had to catch the eye and prove interesting enough to win the general's confidence. Finally, I settled on the deep navy waistcoat for confidence and power, and the crisp white cravat for a gentleman of elegance and taste. Would Elizabeth be there? She should be. She was still a lady, after all, and beautiful ladies are always welcomed at the table of army officers. Besides, her presence would lend me the sort of ease and confidence I sorely needed on this night. Someone rapped on my door, and I opened it to Lord Holt's manservant. He bowed crisply. Mr. Darcy, Lord Holt would like to extend an invitation for you to accompany him and Lady Holt in their carriage this evening. That was promising. If not for Lady Holt and her irksomely flirtatious ways, I doubted I would have had a second word from Campbell. For some reason, their notice had proved profitable for me, and I would do well to continue in that vein. Oh, very well. Please tell Lord Holt that I accept, most graciously. Lord and Lady Holt I could do without. But if they brought Elizabeth, if I had the pleasure of escorting her to dinner, I might be able to feel as smooth and composed as I had to act. Taking a deep breath, I adjusted my cuffs and glanced once more at my reflection. Every inch the polished English gentleman. Hopefully Campbell would buy it. Elizabeth did not accompany Lord and Lady Holt. A small pang of disappointment shot through me when I stepped into that carriage without her. But after reconciling myself to her absence, I decided it was probably best for my composure that she was back at the inn. Had she come, no doubt she would have outshone every other lady at least in my eyes, and I would have been forced to be on guard for her safety or her virtue or whatever else my imagination might dream up as a threat to her. I eased into a chair at the dining table, the murmur of conversations washing over me. Beside me, Lord Holt leaned forward, hands gesturing vividly as he detailed the intricacies of Mediterranean trade routes. His voice, charged with passion and expertise, drew me in. Despite myself, I felt an unexpected surge of respect for the depth of his knowledge. I raised my glass, the wine's aroma mingling with the buzz of conversation. Diving into the discussion, I laid out my views on England's trade stakes and the prevailing political winds. I glanced around. 
The subtle nods and engaged eyes confirmed I was making an impression, even without Elizabeth by my side to bolster my confidence. "'The Adriatic is proving invaluable,' Holt was saying, gesturing with his wine glass for emphasis. "'Especially with the resurgence of the Ottoman trade. There's a great wealth to be tapped into there.' The gentleman across from him, a well-dressed man with salt and pepper hair, nodded in agreement. Yes, but the political instability in the region makes it a dicey endeavour. One cannot predict the shifts and turns. And if matters change... He let that comment linger for a moment, to the comprehension of all. We shall certainly see an alteration in trade routes. Some would even welcome it. I chimed in, seizing the opportunity to showcase my understanding. The key lies in forming strong alliances... English merchants have always thrived on building relationships. With the right connections in Venice and Dubrovnik, we can ensure a steady flow of goods, regardless of changes in the wind. Holt raised an eyebrow, looking at me appreciatively. Uh, Mr Darcy has a point. It is not just about the routes, but the relationships that ensure our ships can pass safely and trade flourishes. Another guest, a lady with a sparkling brooch, leaned in. But what are the piracy threats along the Barbary coast? My husband says it is growing increasingly perilous. Holt paused, swirling his wine thoughtfully. It is a concern, yes, but that is where the might of the British Navy comes into play. Protection of our merchants is paramount. I nodded in agreement. Here was a chance to further establish my loyalty. Indeed, Lord Holt, with the combined strength of our navy and our unmatched diplomacy... England remains a force to be reckoned with on the high seas, whether in peace or at war. The room hummed with a lively exchange of ideas, each topic seamlessly giving way to the next. Voices clashed and converged, debates rising in spirited crescendos. Amidst the whirlwind of dialogue, I held my ground, channelling every ounce of knowledge I possessed. Every statement I made, every counterpoint I offered, was crafted to reinforce my stance as a steadfast Englishman, intricately tuned to the nuances of trade and the political landscape. Throughout the meal, Campbell was curiously quiet. I sensed his eyes on me frequently, but when someone deferred to him or asked his opinion, he gave only a few words and fell back to listening. The ideal diplomat, perhaps, studying others by the words coming from their mouths and giving everyone else no leverage over him. That was when I decided to rein myself in, I had established my character, my politics, and my intelligence. Now to let a bit of discretion play. Lady Holt, predictably, took a different tack. As the guests became more comfortable with one another, and the wine eased away nervous chatter, talk of politics and commerce slowed, and more domestic discourse prevailed. And Lady Holt led the charge. With a sip of her glass and an exaggerated flutter of her fan, she launched into a soliloquy about her children. "'Oh, you should see how they took to the sea,' she gushed. "'Such natural grace amidst trial. Why, never a flutter in their constitutions. And how they do admire the climate here in Livorno. My sweet little Penelope is quite enraptured with the gardens. But the other two prefer the sea. And so clever they are. Why, the other day, my dear Emily was commenting on how sailors chart their courses with the wind direction and speed at her age. Lord Holt, sitting across the table, wore a self-satisfied smile, seemingly content to let his wife prattle on. The other guests, however, were not as enthused. Polite smiles turned to stifled yawns, and the eyes of more than one guest glazed over. It was as if Lady Holt was in her own world, oblivious to the waning interest around her. She was worse than two Mrs. Bennets, and she had a far more distinguished audience to bore with her theatrics. With each passing minute, I found myself growing more uneasy. Why wasn't Lord Holt intervening? Surely he realised how his wife's extended discourse on their children's supposed seafaring prowess was grating on the guests. But he just sat there, his gaze fixed on his plate, allowing Lady Holt's monologue to fill the room. Was there an ulterior motive behind this play? But Lord General Campbell seemed amused by Lady Holt, his smile patronising and indulgent. 
I have often observed, Lady Holt, that the presence of families, especially children, is the hallmark of a peaceful society. Even here, in a land marked by war, and on Elba, a private community of sorts, children enliven any house. The Emperor himself is known to have a fondness for the young. I applaud that, for it is a sign of a man who can be reasoned with. Lady Holt's face brightened at the mention of Napoleon. Oh, indeed, General, children have such an innocence about them, a purity that can soften even the hardest of hearts. And our little ones, why, they are the very embodiment of charm and grace. Such treasures they are. Campbell smiled, an edge to his expression. I've heard you have a governess accompanying you, a Miss Bennet, if I'm not mistaken. I believe I saw her out walking with them. I tensed, my eyes snapping to Campbell's face. What did the general know of Elizabeth? And what was his interest in her? Ah, oh, Miss Bennet, Lady Holt enthused. Such a blessed find for us. A child of misfortune, to be sure. A lady born and bred, but a modest one. And such awe when we took her in. You would be amazed, General, at the gratitude one can inspire by bringing on a girl from such humble origins. And to think we could offer her a glimpse of a life she'd never have imagined. It warms the heart. Campbell studied Lady Holt for a long moment, stroking his chin thoughtfully. It is heartening to know that amidst the political and economic discussions, there remains room for acts of generosity. Do you know, it occurs to me that Elba would certainly benefit from the laughter of a few more children. It would remind everyone, including the Emperor, of what peace can bring. He paused, his eyes flicking over me, then continued. I depart for Elba again on the morrow. Perhaps your ladyship and Lord Holt, along with Mr. Darcy here, if he wishes, might accompany me as my guests. Under my supervision, of course. Bring along your delightful children and their governess. It could be enlightening for all parties involved. Lady Holt's acceptance was everything immodest and insincere, while Lord Holt only bowed his head graciously. As for me... I am certain my face was a wreckage of swirling conflict. This was a victory, a necessary one if I was to report back to Richard with my assessment of the deposed emperor. But now Elizabeth was being dragged along to beer the lion in his den. I do not know what I had expected to happen if Lady Holt carried her way and secured the invitation she so coveted. Of course, Elizabeth and the children would join their parents on Elba, rather than remain here in Livorno. But for me... The stakes had just risen considerably. Elizabeth As dawn's first light seeped through the horizon, Lord and Lady Holt, the children, Mr Darcy and I, made our way to the docks to meet Lord General Campbell. The ship chosen for our journey was a modest, yet sturdy-looking vessel, but the sea was tossing white waves about its inky surface, as if mocking my frail stomach. Oh, dear... I held a hand over my middle and closed my eyes. Not this again. Securing the children comfortably below deck, I fussed with their cloaks and ensured they were snug. Poppy clutched a little wooden toy, while Bee looked at me with her wide eyes, heavy with a million questions she would not ask. Emily acted as if she boarded ships to visit deposed dictators every day, and seated herself with a dignity and aplomb I could not help but envy. With the children settled, I finally allowed myself a moment on the deck. It was a murky sort of day. The latter half of February now loomed before us, and I was already beginning to hope for spring. But winter was not yet ready to withdraw its teeth. A storm chased us out of the bay, the briny sea air tangling my hair. From the corner of my eye, I watched Darcy standing a distance away. He was looking out towards the open sea, his silhouette strong, and so terribly familiar against the soft light of dawn. Our glances met, and for a moment I was tempted to shelter in the cave of his chest and arms. I doubt he would have minded. I could not be so forward, but still it was a comfort to have him near. Because apart from his witless fascination for me, I had begun to think Mr Darcy might be the only man of sense within a hundred miles. The ship mounted the open waves, and the coast of Livorno receded in the distance, I gripped the railing for one last glimpse of the shore. What would my family say if they could know where I was, or what I was about to embark on? 
to go to the very home of the man who had once held the world in his thrall, to walk outside the gates of his house, and know that within was a man who had brought about death and famine and violence on a continental scale, and that man was probably taking tea and reading books, just like my father. Darcy was watching me again. He was always watching me, but that fact did not unnerve me like it used to. I paused before going below and offered him a faint smile. Then I gathered my skirts and turned away. Elba awaited. Campbell told us we would be in port by early afternoon. That assurance brought the hope of a real meal on land, and I was able to console my quivering stomach with that promise. I would not have to try to eat while pitching about at sea. That was one mercy. The children amused themselves below, and I remained with them most of the time, ensuring they were comfortable. But every so often, when I emerged onto the deck, my eyes would inadvertently seek out Darcy. He would be there, sometimes engaged in conversation with Lord Holt or General Campbell, sometimes lost in thought. The weight of his gaze was palpable every time our eyes met, and each time I'd quickly divert my attention, the warmth of a blush creeping up my cheeks. As we approached Elba, the outline of the island grew clearer. The rugged terrain, the hills, and the glimpses of sandy shores all began to take shape. It was a sight to behold, but the beauty of it was overshadowed by the knowledge of why we were there. This whole thing was madness. Soft footsteps momentarily overtook the gentle creaking of the ship's boards. A brief pause, and then Darcy's low, urgent voice was beside me. Elizabeth, while we are here, never permit yourself to be alone. I turned to face him. Why would he say that? But before I could utter a word, he was gone, making his way towards Lord Holt. The ship docked, and the bustle of disembarking began. With Darcy's words echoing in my ears, a newfound apprehension took hold. But there was no time to ponder, as the children's needs drew all my attention. We were now guests in the island empire of Napoleon Bonaparte. 15. Darcy The hallway of Lord Campbell's residence was dim, only the faint flicker of a few candles illuminating my path. We were summoned to a private dinner with the general this evening, where we would supposedly learn with what pleasure we were to be received by Napoleon. But all that mattered to me was that whispered conversation in the passageway earlier when I had asked Elizabeth if she would be joining us for dinner. And she had said yes. At last a chance to admire her in something other than her simple governess's attire, with her hair falling in little ringlets that defied their pins, and the soft glow of her skin warmed by candlelight. My steps slowed as I neared the dining hall. I had timed my arrival to be early, so I might have the pleasure of offering her my arm into the dining room. There were Lord and Lady Holt, strolling side by side, but as far apart from each other as the hallway would permit. And behind them, I spotted her silhouette, every curve and gesture so familiar, and yet always so new and vivid I could hardly tear my eyes away. Miss Bennet, I greeted, offering a bow. May I? She looked up, those glorious eyes squinting slightly in surprise. Mr. Darcy? She glanced at Lady Holt's retreating figure and swallowed. Are you certain that is wise? After all, I am a... You are a lady and an honoured guest of a very distinguished gentleman. I ducked my face a little closer to her ear. Apart from that, you look radiant, and I was hoping to make the other gentleman jealous by walking in with you on my arm. She smothered a smile, and her hand lifted just enough to rest on my sleeve. Mr. Darcy, there must be something wrong with your eyes. Have you been feeling feverish lately? I have heard malaria can impair a man's sense, as well as his vision. Cheeky as ever, Miss Bennet, but I assure you I am in perfect health. I turned her steps to fall in beside mine, and led her toward the dining room. It would be a sheer pleasure to have a meal with her again. If you are not ill she whispered from the side of her mouth. Then your flattery has undergone an extensive improvement. Have you been taking lessons? From a master. I dipped my head toward her, and I find it a diverting study. Turn your face that way just a bit, so I may think of some other way to pay my compliments. She shot me a wry look. Well, sincerity is more appealing than pretty words. Miss Elizabeth, I just... 
What was it I told you about my taste for disguise? Her laughter was music to me, and I drank in one last long look at her, before we had to act civilised at table. As we approached the door, a servant directed us to our respective seats, and to my vast disappointment, Elizabeth was placed next to Campbell, while I found myself situated beside the imposing figure of Lady Holt. The seating arrangement was a clear power play on Campbell's part, and I couldn't help but grind my teeth in quiet frustration. Campbell made the most of the arrangement, engaging Elizabeth frequently throughout the evening. She was charming, clever and enticing, all the things she had been with me when I first met her in Hertfordshire. And now that I knew her better, I could see the telltale signs about her mouth when she was silently sporting with the man, or the dull look in her eye when she was merely tolerating his conversation until she could turn the tables. But Campbell was as ignorant of her subtleties as I had been at first, and no doubt he assumed the same as I, that she was welcoming his attentions and desiring to beguile him with her charms. I was clenching a fist under the table and trying not to bend my fork. If he got too impertinent with her, if he made assumptions that just because she was presently a governess, well, Lord General or no, I would crack him like an egg. The dessert had just been served when Campbell raised his glass and drew our attention to himself. I thought you would be delighted to know that I apprised His Excellency of your arrival and informed him that you were to remain my guests for some days. He was delighted to hear of your visit at such a dreary time of year, visitors being scarce when the weather at sea is so inhospitable, you see. He requests the honour of your company at dinner tomorrow evening. Lady Holt gasped in pleasure, and Lord Holt dipped his head in acknowledgement. I responded in kind. But that is not all. "'Campbell assured us. "'The General has asked for the privilege "'of organising a number of outings for your pleasure, "'beginning with a tour of Portoferio tomorrow morning. "'Then you will be served a light luncheon at the palace. "'I am afraid the General will not be joining us for that. "'Before returning here to dress for dinner, "'I fancy you will be advised of the remainder of the amusements "'he has detailed for you tomorrow evening. "'But rest assured, his people are most attentive to the needs of guests.' "'Oh, that is very fine,' Lady Holt crooned. A very handsome of him. Did I not say as much? He is the perfect host. Indeed. Campbell lifted his glass in agreement. And I trust that you will not hesitate to make any of your needs or wishes known while you remain in my home. Elizabeth's eyes had shifted in my direction, and it was with a twinge of conscious dismay that I realised Campbell had seen it. He was staring at me until I tore my gaze from her, and he smiled when I looked at him. "'Mr. Darcy,' he asked politely, "'is there anything you require to make your stay more comfortable?' I shook my head and frowned nonchalantly. "'I was only thinking about my sister. "'I neglected to write to her before I sailed from Livorno. "'She will no doubt be disappointed with me for overlooking her.' "'Oh, that's a shame. "'Well, I will see to it that you are provided with pen and paper. "'The post leaves port every morning, "'and if I include your letter with my personal correspondence, "'it will receive first priority.' Oh, that is most kind of you, sir. Campbell nodded. Not at all. Then he turned his attention back to Elizabeth, and I finished the rest of the meal in near silence. Elizabeth. Are we there yet? Poppy's voice piped up for what felt like the hundredth time. Soon, I sighed, peering out at the looming facades. Soon. The wheels of our carriage clattered on the cobblestone streets of Portoferio, echoing the thud of my pounding headache. Our tour of the port city had been a delight for everyone else. Poppy, true to form, was an inexhaustible whirlwind, wanting to touch every market stall and shout a greeting to every passerby. Mortification did not begin to describe my discomfort. How to make a six-year-old understand that she was treading upon a place and a time that was history in the making? I could still hear her delighted shrieks, even as the bustle of the town faded behind us. But the parents seemed to care little enough about their daughter's conduct. Even Campbell paid her little mind. Or if he did notice her, it was with an indulgent smile, and some flattering comment about what a pleasure it was to see the world through a child's eyes. Balderdash. I think he was trying to avoid embarrassing his guests. Really, how awkward would it be to ask someone to prevent their child from creating an international incident? So it was left to me to manage the thing. 
Darcy was the only one who did seem to notice, but he could do little to help me. There was that one moment, though, when Lady Holt tried to force B to address our tour guide with questions about the architecture of the city, and rather than permit B to suffer embarrassment for her stutter, Mr. Darcy inserted himself and changed the subject. At another time, I'd have thought him rude for the way he dismissed the girl, but B was relieved. They were all bound for the palace now, Campbell, the Holts, and Darcy. The girls and I were returning to Campbell's residence, but this was to be the other's first glimpse of Napoleon's house. For myself, I could do without that honour, and the look Darcy gave me when we mounted our separate carriages told me he felt the same. The children were a much safer form of chaos for me this afternoon than taking tea in the palace of a former emperor. At last, the carriage came to a stop outside Campbell's residence. Poppy was already tumbling out before the footman could offer a hand. I thanked him and followed suit, keeping a close eye on the children as we ascended the steps. Finally, they were quiet. Poppy was actually walking with her face pressed into my skirts and yawning. Perhaps the stress of travel and lack of sleep had finally caught up with her. As we walked towards our rooms, my steps slowed as I spotted Miss Clara outside Lord Holt's door. It was one thing for me to be friendly with her when we were alone. It was quite another to ask the girls to become sociable with their father's mistress. No fear of that, however, for Clara was just closing the door. But who was that figure moving away down the hall? His movements were furtive, and his face turned away, but the paper he was slipping into his pocket caught my eye. More of Lord Holt's business. Perhaps I should mention it to Mr Darcy, though why it would matter to him I did not know. He was here to give his opinion on the real state of politics and Napoleon's disposition, not to trespass against an English lord's personal affairs. But still, I could say something. It would be an excuse to talk to him. For now, though, there were hungry children to feed and my own tired self to tend to. A few hours passed in relative peace for me. Poppy had collapsed on her bed after the midday meal and she was still drooling and senseless. The thought occurred to me that I should wake her for she would not sleep at all tonight if she slept on too long now. But the room was quiet, and merciful heavens, I needed that. B was reading, Emily was drawing, and I sank into a seat to gaze out the window, with Darcy's note from Huntsford in my hands. It had become a talisman of sorts for me, a comfort when I was overwhelmed. Just hearing his words of truth and reading the pain between his lines, it ought to have humiliated me. It used to. But after coming to better terms with him, it eased my heart to know that at least one person in this world was steadfast. Not perfect, no, and neither was I, but his integrity could never be questioned. He was honest in his affections, however misguided I thought they might be, and faithful even when his hopes were denied. And I was the stupidest fool in the entire world not to see it before it was too late. You love him, don't you? I blinked at Emily's voice, and drat it all, was that a tear in my eye? I blinked a little faster. What was that? Mr Darcy, you're in love with him. Emily dragged up a chair to sit opposite me at the little tea table, and propped her chin on her hands. I can tell. I looked down and fingered the edges of his note, a faint smile playing at my mouth. And how is that? Well... You carry his letter around with you all the time, but you're always watching for him too. I lifted a shoulder. That is hardly a surprise. We came to know each other well last year, and now we are both among strangers. It is not so unusual to seek a familiar face. But you don't just glance at him. You look like you're peering into his soul. My lips twitched. What sorts of novels have you been reading, Emily? Oh, B's the one who reads novels. I read people. That's why I like so few of them. I chuckled and sniffed. You actually sound like him, do you know that? Emily narrowed her eyes. So, what's it like? What is what like? Falling in love. I've never seen anyone do it. Is it like they say in the books? I don't know. I drew a breath and shifted in my chair. What do the books say? It is like walking on clouds with this constant music in your heart, and I think that's poppycock. I shrugged. Maybe for some people. So what about you? Oh, 
Emily, I laughed. What makes you think I have any answers? Because you're the closest I've ever seen. So, what does it feel like when he kisses you? Is it slurpy and disgusting? Or does it make your toes curl and your hair stand on end? I've never kissed him. She quirked an eyebrow. I don't believe you. Well, it's true. I frowned. Almost. Yes, yes, it's true. He almost kissed me once, maybe twice. I'm not sure about Huntsford because there was one moment when... But it doesn't matter anyway, because he's the next thing to nobility. And I'm a governess with a disgraced sister and an impoverished family. He cannot marry me and we both know it. Emily pouted, her eyes wandering toward the window. That's all rot. He should marry you. I pushed out of my seat and tucked Darcy's letter into my pocket. Why is that? Because at least you care for him. He could end up with a wife he despises. She toyed with the hem of her sleeve. Like most people. I paused and rested a hand on Emily's shoulder. It isn't always like that, you know. People make choices. And love is more than a feeling. It's something you do. Her lips thinned and she sighed. It's just that nobody ever does it. Well, it was difficult to argue with that. I was considering what more I could say to her when a soft knock interrupted my thoughts. Drawing a breath, I moved to answer it. Standing there, impeccably dressed as always, was Lord Campbell. His demeanour was formal, yet there was an unmistakable eagerness in his eyes. Miss Bennet, he began, bowing slightly. I find myself in need of a companion for this evening's dinner at the palace. The presence of ladies always makes the conversation flow more smoothly, and we cannot let Lady Holt bear that burden alone. Would you do me the honour? My mouth went dry. I, I beg your pardon, my lord, but I had not anticipated attending any formal dinners, especially given Lady Holt's particular sentiments. Campbell waved a hand dismissively. Her ladyship has been apprised, and I assure you it will be well. Besides, it is not every day one dines with an emperor, even if he is in exile. I hesitated. What would Mr. Darcy think, seeing me escorted by Campbell? It would crush him, or it would give us a chance to see a little more of each other. It was just a dinner party, after all. I, I'm not sure I'm adequately prepared for such an occasion. Campbell's smile was reassuring. Might I send one of my maids to assist you in dressing? They are quite adept. Well, there was that one nice gown I had in my trunk, the one I had never expected actually to wear again. It had been fine enough for private balls in Meryton, last season, but dining with the Emperor of Elba, well, that was a bit of a stretch. But if Campbell was going to insist on wearing a governess on his arm this evening, he could jolly well withstand a more modest style than he was probably used to. Thank you, Lord Campbell, but I do have a gown that should suffice. I could manage without the maid. Very well. I look forward to our evening, Miss Bennet. With a final nod, he took his leave. Closing the door, I leaned against it, trying to calm the flurry of butterflies in my stomach. An evening at Napoleon's residence. What could possibly go wrong? 16. Darcy the drawing-room's ornate doors swung open, and I flexed my fists at my side one last time. My stomach was in knots. What the devil was I doing here? I was no diplomat. I was merely a private gentleman, younger than most of my peers, and my only experience in the service of my king had been nine months as a general's aide. I had no policy experience. I was not the smoothest conversationalist in drawing-rooms. For pity's sake, I was never even meant to be the heir— and I was only beginning to grasp my own affairs. What was I doing trying to advise the British army? If Richard were here, right now I'd strangle him. An array of footmen greeted us, each bowing from the waist as we passed. I slid a glance to Elizabeth, and found her eyes seeking mine. She looked, well, just like I remembered from the Netherfield Ball. It was even the same gown. I would know the detail work on that lace anywhere. If only she were clinging to my arm rather than resting her gloved fingertips on Campbell's sleeve. But it was not Campbell's gaze she kept seeking for reassurance as we marched on the enemy. Another row of doors, and we were led to a well-appointed salon. 
and standing at the far end of the room, the man behind the legend, Napoleon Bonaparte. I felt sick. The Chamberlain stepped forward, announcing in a clear voice, My Lord, Baron Holt and Baroness Holt of Holtwood Park, Shropshire. Napoleon nodded at them, his eyes piercing yet polite. Your Lordship, your Ladyship, it is an honour. Next came my introduction. Monsieur Fitzwilliam Darcy of Pemberley, Derbyshire. Napoleon's gaze shifted to me, sizing me up momentarily. Monsieur Darcy, he said with a slight nod. I bowed. Then Elizabeth was presented. Mademoiselle Elizabeth Bennet of Hertfordshire, England. To her, Napoleon gave a slightly more lingering look, a small smile playing at the corners of his lips. Mademoiselle Bennet, the pleasure is mine. Elizabeth offered a demure curtsy, and I could not help but think she looked far more the lady when she did so in her light muslin than Lady Holt ever would in her silks. Finally, the Chamberlain gestured to our host. Lord Campbell, Governor of Elba. Napoleon's gaze turned warmer, more familiar. Ah, Lord Campbell, always a delight. My friends, it is with the greatest pleasure that I heard of your visit. Please make yourselves easy. Dinner will be served momentarily. I should like very much to hear of your journey while we wait. Lady Holt, her eyes shining with a mix of awe and excitement, stepped forward with a graceful curtsy. Your Excellency, it is an unparalleled honour to be in your esteemed presence. Our journey from London was most arduous, but thanks to the anticipation of what awaited us, we were able to endure without complaint. And such a sight to see. Elba is surely the jewel of the Mediterranean, in large part due to your most excellent leadership. Lord Holt, following his wife's lead, gave a respectful nod. Indeed, Your Excellency, he chimed in, a touch more reserved than his wife, but still evidently pleased. Our tour of Porto Ferreo was enlightening. Elba stands as a testament to what can be achieved with solid infrastructure. The island is flourishing, and its people are contented. I shall be reporting back to London with praise for what you have established here. Napoleon smiled graciously, clearly accustomed to, and perhaps even expecting such flattery. You honour me with your words, Lord and Lady Alt. Elba is but a small dominion, but I endeavour to make it a haven for its people. Then his eyes turned to me. And you, Monsieur Darcy, I trust you found the discomforts of travel to be richly compensated upon your arrival. Elizabeth was watching me, and just for an instant I let my eyes touch hers. I have your excellency. Others might comment on the fruits or the harmony of the island, the fine architecture or the new amenities of the island, but I have been more interested in the people with whom I have been privileged to be in company. Napoleon studied me for a moment, a faint smile tugging at the corner of his lips. Ah, Monsieur Darcy, a man after my own art. Empires and dominions are indeed built of stone and land, but it is the people, the connections we forge, that truly shape our worlds. I am pleased to hear you value such company. I suspect our gathering tonight will only enhance your appreciation. His gaze briefly appraised Elizabeth, before sweeping the room with a look of contentment. Ah, and here is Philippe to inform us that the table is prepared. Lady Holt, may I presume the pleasure of escorting you? I thought the Baroness would faint. As it was, she emitted a giggle that would have done Mrs. Bennet proud when her glove touched Napoleon's elbow. But he was perfectly gracious, his expression stately and relaxed as he led us into the dining room. All the reports, all the conversations, and even my own musings had not prepared me for the presence of this man. His aura emanated a kind of energy, an irresistible pull that demanded every ounce of my focus. It felt as if the air itself had shifted, becoming dense with his magnetism. So, this was how he had seduced thousands. Not by might, though he had commanded that. Not by tyrannical displays, though such reports were also legendary. Napoleon won the hearts of men with his charisma. During dinner, our host regaled us with tales of his experiences on Elba, or amusing thoughts from his life at the French court. Lord and Lady Holt were positively enraptured with the man, and Lord General Campbell seemed hardly less so. And I understood why. He seemed like a man I would invite into my study, 
play billiards or chess with by evening, and a man I could gallop over the hunt field with the next day. And why not? What had I truly expected? The very devil himself. Well, yes. I confess I found myself falling under his spell by the time the main course was served. It was appallingly easy to forget twelve years of war, and countless crepe armbands among my acquaintances. Was there something in the wine? How lightly I was able to converse about advanced farming techniques and modern waterworks with the despot who nearly slaughtered Europe. It was when he turned his attentions to Elizabeth that my pulse truly quickened. It was like a veil tearing from my eyes as he engaged her on matters of music and then solicited her opinions on Voltaire and Goethe. My chest nearly burst in pride, watching the mist of confusion passing over Lord and Lady Holt's faces as Elizabeth held her own in a discussion of fine literature and philosophy with no lesser figure than the man who had sought to inaugurate a cultural revolution. How many governesses could match Napoleon? And she held him in little awe. I could see that much in the slight twist of her mouth, the impertinent way she redirected his questions, when he thought he had her neatly cornered into answering as he hoped. It put me in mind of my old debates with my father and brother, how we were all on such equal ground intellectually, that quickness and wit, rather than sheer force of understanding, became the order of the day. One had to see through the cloak his opponent would throw over his eyes. As the younger brother, there was a time when they did not take me seriously, yet I quickly discovered how to dismantle their facade of superiority. Strategy won me more arguments than being right ever had. Strategy. It was like a bolt of lightning shocking my brain. Richard and his general hadn't sent me here because I was experienced in politics, or knew battle tactics, or understood how clandestine communications flew about the continent. They asked for me because Napoleon would not see me as a threat, because he would toy with me, and because I might be the only person in the room who knew how to peer through his veil of intrigue. Well, myself and Elizabeth. Elizabeth. The days on Elba, under the ever-watchful eye of Napoleon and his entourage, passed in a blur. Activities, tours, teas. Every moment seemed accounted for, every hour filled with some form of entertainment or another. The Emperor's meticulous planning left no room for personal reflection or private conversations. I could not help but feel that was intentional. Today was our fifth day on Elba, and we had been touring the vineyards. The wine was excellent, the countryside refreshing— and the company, excessive. We were not Napoleon's only guests. I counted six carriages in all today, and I was not surprised to discover Miss Clara in one of them. There were moments when Lord Holt would disappear from his wife's side, only to be found perhaps a half hour later, reappearing through the rows of the vineyard, or in the halls of whatever building we happened to be touring. Lady Holt spared him no scolding once they were back in their carriage, Darcy had been an unfortunate witness to that on more than one occasion, but no one else seemed to pay Lord Holt any mind when there were so many grand sights to take in. After all, when Napoleon Bonaparte is one's host, master of ceremonies and tour guide, what matter if another of the guests slips away with his mistress? Emily and B noticed, however. The girls and I were not welcomed on all the outings the other took part in, but today the girls witnessed more than they ought to have. Emily hadn't spoken in two hours, and B kept wanting to walk beside her father, perhaps to keep him from straying again. It hurt my heart to watch. Our party was retiring for a rest now, and I was grateful for it. We were all invited to a musical performance that evening. I had tried to beg off, my duties to the girls being my primary excuse, but Lord Campbell was insistent on me accompanying him and Lord and Lady Holt agreed that a maid's company would be sufficient for the girls while I was out. What was I to do? Truthfully, once I'd accustomed myself to the notion, I began to look forward to it. How many governesses were granted the privilege of attending a musical performance hosted by an emperor and escorted by a Lord General? I would rather have had Darcy's arm, but it was not within his power to invite me, so the next best thing was to be a member of the same party— he didn't seem to feel the same enthusiasm, though. I had watched the tension in his shoulders all day. We'd seldom had a moment to speak, not that I tried to seek him out. But by now I felt like I could almost read his thoughts, and so many of them seemed to be tangled. 
What was he putting in those letters Lord Campbell sent to Miss Darcy for him? Since arriving on Elba, he had written to his sister at least twice, to my knowledge. Oh, he could not be fool enough to spell out his concerns plainly, could he? He had to know how carefully he was being watched. All of us were. Miss Lizzie, are there any more books? B asked as we retired to our rooms. I've read all these. I tugged off my shawl and surveyed the tower of books Lord Campbell had sent up for the girls' enjoyment. I can ask. I would not mind a little larger selection myself. Keep an eye on Poppy, please. A servant showed me the way to Campbell's study and announced me at the door. Campbell looked up from his writing and smiled. Miss Bennet, what a pleasant surprise. What can I do for you? I was hoping to borrow another book or two for Beatrice. She is quite the voracious reader. He stepped from behind his desk, motioning me in. Of course, let me show you to the library. The library was grander than I had expected for an island prison. Shelves upon shelves, filled with impressive selections, suited for someone like Mr. Darcy, and whimsical oddities that would have amused Papa. I almost sighed and wept. It had been a while since I had been surrounded by so many tales and worlds. Longbourn was so very far away. Campbell's voice interrupted my daydreaming. You look like you found a paradise of sorts, Miss Bennet. I chuckled as I stepped forward and touched a few spines on the nearest shelf. Books have always been friends to me. His gaze lingered on me longer than necessary. I can see that. Are you looking for anything in particular? I let my eyes roam to the top shelves. If I wanted to be choosy, no doubt Campbell would indulge me. He had been a most attentive host. But I really ought to get back to the girls. I pulled out a few that I thought would intrigue B, and even one I could try reading for Poppy. Just as I had decided I'd selected enough, one last title by Rousseau caught my eye. Well, I was, after all, a governess now. I could study my craft a bit. Hesitantly, I tugged it from the shelf and added it to my stack. I turned to ask Campbell if I might be tolerated to borrow so many books, only to find him closer than I'd anticipated. Oh! I stepped back a little. Excuse me, I, I did not see you there. Campbell smiled. His fingers brushed against mine as he took the top one, and the hair on the back of my neck prickled. Rousseau's Emile. He smirked, his eyes locked on mine. An interesting choice. I cleared my throat. It is enlightening. Poppy's not like other girls her age, and neither is Emily. I hope to learn something that might benefit them. You are very wise, Miss Bennet. He leaned in, his voice soft and unsettlingly intimate. The books can be revealing. I cleared my throat. Yes, um... I suppose I should get back now. Of course. I'm surprised you're not resting before it is time to dress, Miss Bennet. I trust my housekeeper introduced you to the lady's maid who will be assisting you this evening. Oh. My ears grew hot. Yes, uh, the gown she offered was very lavish. I do not feel it is suited to one of my s station. I am confident you will look lovely no matter what you wear, Miss Bennet. He smiled as his gaze travelled down my figure. Your colouring lends itself to many styles. Ah! Oh. I sucked in a breath, clutching the books more tightly to my chest. Before I could make any words, the sound of footsteps echoed, and the library door swung open. Darcy's tall form appeared, his eyes darting from Campbell to me, an unmistakable edge to them. Lord Campbell, I beg your pardon, I was told I might find you here. I had a question regarding this evening's protocol. Campbell straightened, his demeanour shifting. Of course, Mr Darcy, what do you wish to know? As they discussed the evening's intricacies, I quietly arranged the books. When they were finished, Darcy turned to me. Miss Bennet, may I assist you back to your rooms? You have a rather heavy collection there. I nodded gratefully. Thank you, Mr Darcy. I hadn't seen him clench his jaw so hard since the Netherfield Ball, when my family had made such a notable impression upon him. Good heavens, why wouldn't he say something? We were friends of a sort now, or so I thought, but my sidelong glances at him made me gulp. 
He looked like someone had set fire to Pemberley or shot his favourite dog. The silence of the corridor made the click of his boot heels echo louder than it should, and my stomach started crawling. What had got into him? Finally, when we were in a part of the corridor with no doors for at least twenty paces in either direction, Darcy turned to me. "'Miss Bennet,' he began, his voice almost shaking with the effort to control it. "'I warned you expressly against such moments of privacy, especially here, on foreign soil.' "'I—' I blinked and shook my head in awe. "'You thought I sought him out for an assignation. I simply wished to borrow some books. Is that now a crime? How could he misinterpret that?' "'It is not.' but that may not prevent you from regretting that small request for the rest of your life. One miscalculated moment, Miss Elizabeth, and... He broke off, clenching a fist in the air and shaking it as if he meant to use it on someone. I sighed and rolled my eyes. I assumed I would be quite safe in our host's home. His expression flared. It is precisely our host I'm concerned about. Campbell isn't the harmless English lord you might expect. I swallowed. But Lord Campbell has been nothing but kind. For pity's sake, he is escorting me like a lady to tonight's performance. And he's even asked his household to find something suitable for me to wear. Or perhaps in London that might be unseemly. But so far from home, with limited garments of our own, it is kindness itself. Darcy's voice dropped lower, filled with a warning tone I had come to recognise. Elizabeth, you do not... He hissed and set his teeth, glaring at the ceiling. You took on this position. To the world, you're a governess now. Despite what I know to be true, what I think ought to be, you do not enjoy your previous status here. To Campbell, you are a woman in service, alone and vulnerable in a strange land. And him, a military man with power and no kin to keep his actions in check. I even heard him asking Lord Holt about your friendship with Miss Clara. I narrowed my eyes. What friendship! I took tea with her once. And you were seen, Elizabeth, taking tea with a known side bit. Do you know what sort of signal that sends to such a man? It makes you appear an easy conquest. Well, that, that stung. My blood boiled up, and I shot back without thinking. There is nothing easy about me, Mr. Darcy. His gaze held mine, and something curdled in the pit of my stomach. Oh, he couldn't dare keep looking at me like that, not when I was angry with him. It wasn't fair. That, he whispered with a bitterness that both hurt and thrilled me, I am painfully aware of. I sucked in a breath, and I couldn't help it. I set my hand on his arm. Mr. Darcy, I I am sorry. I did not mean it that way. His shoulders dropped as he heaved a sigh. Elizabeth, there's more at play here than mere social calls and island tours. I leaned closer. What have you learned? I slipped away from the group during our outing. I saw men in French uniforms hidden amongst a grove of trees. They did not notice me, but I saw them. They were reading what seemed to be orders and pointing toward the harbour. Something is brewing. A shiver ran down my spine. Oh, I knew it. I just knew it. Such is my luck. There shall be an armed coup, and we will all be shot in our beds. There, I sound exactly like my mother. That fiend has turned me into my mother. I don't think anyone could manage that, not even the ogre of Ajaccio. Besides, he doesn't need to fight anyone here. He just needs ships and someone to get word out of his plans. Did you know that until two days before our arrival, Napoleon's sister was here? She sailed for Rome while Campbell was in Livorno. I shook my head. I wasn't aware. But what does that signify? Preparation. Or precaution. The story is that her health was troubling her. But I had a chance to talk to the footman who carried her trunks. He said she looked perfectly well. Either way, the timing is strange. And Holt? I've had my reservations about him from the start. He's too eager, too involved... He told me on the ship that he's stepping away from politics, so why is he here? I cannot accept that his only reason is Lady Holt's little infatuation with Napoleon. I glanced down the hall. His mistress has been running strange errands for him. I told you that already. 
Yes, and what a perfect decoy for him. An irksome wife and a pretty young mistress. Campbell hardly bats an eye when Holt vanishes. You saw that too? He nodded. Before sailing for Italy, I stopped in Paris and spoke to an old friend, an expert in finance. He confirmed my suspicions. Trade is stagnating. I would wager that Holt has been bleeding money since that peace treaty. He wouldn't be the only one either. Parisians will welcome Napoleon with open arms. And you would be appalled to know the number of loyal Englishmen who would very much like to see the Corsicans set loose upon the continent once more. I shook my head. Is there anything to be done? What about Colonel Fitzwilliam? He might be just receiving the letter I sent when we landed in Livorno. It will be weeks before anything can come round from him, and I cannot be sure of Campbell. I'm afraid we are quite on our own. But what can we do? Sail back to the mainland ourselves and raise the alarm? Who would listen? And what do we really have to tell them? I need more information. His gaze fixed on something beyond me. During our vineyard tour, I recognised a familiar face. Benedict Harwood, a man I'd met in Livorno. He greeted me, then made some comment about a new cargo he'd taken aboard. I narrowed my eyes, and then I understood. You think he knows something? Will he tell you? For a price. But I know nothing of his loyalties either. I tightened my hand on his arm. Be careful, Mr. Darcy. He smiled faintly and tipped his head closer, then tugged his hand free of the books to slide into mine. I always am, Elizabeth. Seventeen. Darcy. I adjusted my cufflinks again and pulled out my pocket watch for another inspection, but I couldn't say what time it was when I put it away. I could not decide whether I was looking forward to or dreading this evening more. I loved musical concerts. They had long been one of my delights. Several hours of exquisite performance, of taste and beauty, without requiring much conversation or social exertion on my part. A time when I was not only permitted, but expected to lose myself in my thoughts and imaginations. Pure heaven. Add to that the glory of Elizabeth in attendance, and my evening was perfect. Well, nearly. She was to attend on Lord Campbell's arm, wearing a gown provided at his expense and riding in his carriage. Damn the man. Lord Campbell and Lord Holt shared a glass of port nearby, their laughter a rankling against the tightness in my chest. My gaze shifted between the stairs and the mantel clock. Precisely how long did it take a woman to get ready? Never in my life had I protested the extra waiting on ladies to commence an evening, and I would not begrudge Elizabeth, even a single minute, if it added to her beauty or her enjoyment of our outing. But dash it all, I wanted to be the first one to see her coming down those stairs, to step to her side and compliment her, before Campbell could. But it was beginning to look frightfully awkward that I was doing nothing but standing by the door, staring toward the hall. And then she walked in. I couldn't help the way my breath snagged in my lungs. Good God, that was not blasphemy, but a prayer. Elizabeth, the woman I had seen countless times in both reality and my dreams, looked like a vision I had never known. The lavish silk gown she wore was an exquisite deep red, so vivid it seemed to have a pulse of its own. It flowed over her frame, hugging her curves, its cut a bit more daring around the bust than anything I had ever seen her in before. The gown accentuated everything I already loved about her, and highlighted new things I'd yet to discover. How it breathed life into the rich tones of her skin, and made her ebony eyes dance in the candlelight. She seemed somewhat out of her element, though, holding her breath as if she could keep from shattering the air of the room, as if every eye had not already turned to drink her in. Her fan fluttered uneasily in front of her, hiding her décolletage, and betraying her nerves. My feet itched to move towards her, to assure her to be by her side, but before I could make my move, Campbell was taking her arm, as if it were his own to claim. "'My dear Miss Bennet,' he sighed, as if beholding a masterpiece in human form, which, in my opinion, he was. "'You look positively ravishing this evening.' Elizabeth's eyes, which had been searching the room, searching for me, I hoped, were now lowered before the heat of Campbell's gaze, a radiant blush rising to her cheeks. "'Thank you, my lord.' 
Oh, but you cannot go out in just that gown. You will take a chill. Here, I have just the thing. Campbell snapped his fingers, and a footman came forward, producing a lush fur cape. May I? He stepped behind her, draping the cape over Elizabeth's shoulders. I could see her gratitude as she murmured her thanks, but I couldn't help feeling a pang of jealousy. That should have been me. As they began to exit for the concert, my only consolation was the brief moment when she looked over her shoulder, and our eyes locked. Her lips parted, and just for a second, her eyes dropped to my hands as if she wanted to hold mine instead of Campbell's. And she smiled. At me. The concert hall, with its gleaming chandeliers and whispers of the finest ladies and gentlemen on Elba, immediately felt stifling. What ought to have been a magnificent spectacle was reduced, for me at least, to a single point. Elizabeth. The borrowed gown she wore tonight was mesmerising, revealing more of her delicate skin than I was accustomed to seeing, and the deep red made her look, quite simply, radiant. And the way her hair was styled tonight, with the chocolate ringlets coiled high on her head, in such a way that I could draw an even line from her lips, across her dusky cheekbones to the most lavish crescendo of those loops and curls. Well, it was the first time my mouth had ever run dry, and my eyes could not cease discovering new intricacies to admire at the sight of a woman's hair. But it was not for me to savour her conversation, or to admire her openly among the crowd. I might have been seated on Elizabeth's left, but Campbell had her right, and his constant prattle intercepted every moment that ought to have been mine. He simply had to introduce her to everyone we'd passed on our way up to his private box, and it seemed he knew everything there was to know about the evening's performance. He certainly talked about it enough to convince just about anyone that he was personal friends with Beethoven himself. And Elizabeth did not appear wholly immune to his charms. Well, why should she be? Campbell was a handsome man, not much older than myself, and infinitely more well-travelled. He could regale his companion with all manner of witticisms, far more easily than I could ever do, and he had a ready sense of humour as his primary weapon. What woman would not laugh and sigh and lose her heart just a little with such a man working upon her? That was when I felt her hand slip into mine. It was only the briefest of touches— a brush of her fingertips across my curled palm. But it was enough to send fire arcing through every nerve I possessed. I swallowed and tried a casual glance toward her. She was pointing out the emperor in his box across the concert hall and asking Campbell the names of the dignitaries seated with Napoleon. And before I could suspect that searing touch could have been an accident, she sent me a sidelong look and the lightest curve of those sumptuous lips. So she had not forgotten me. Nor, hopefully, had she forgotten my cautions from earlier that day. It was not here, in a private box of a crowded concert hall, that I feared for her. It was later, when we returned to Campbell's residence, that she would be in danger. When he asked to escort her to her rooms, and sought some compensation for his pains on her behalf this evening. I would just have to keep the man occupied myself, even if I had to sit up drinking port and smoking cigars until dawn. I forced some air into my lungs and tried to relax. Elizabeth was too perceptive to enjoy her evening if she had to sit beside a caged bear, tugging at his cufflings all night. I drummed my fingers on the bottom of my chair and counted my breaths until they evened out. Lord and Lady Holt provided some distraction as we waited for the music to commence. Lord Holt was taking a bit of snuff and ignoring everything going on in the concert hall. Lady Holt was busy waving her handkerchief at Napoleon in his private box, the Emperor only nodded and smiled before looking away. Then his features fell like a stone as the first fingers caressed the keys. His eyes closed, and his chest rose and fell in immediate pleasure. How normal he looked. He seemed like any other man, like a poet and a lover and a seeking sort of soul, lost in the musical notes. All the power he had once wielded came to naught. For tonight, music was the great equaliser. The first notes began, a haunting refrain I instantly recognised, Mozart's Andante from his Piano Concerto No. 23. I could feel the music seeping into the marrow of my bones, threading through old memories and carving new ones. My eyes, almost of their own accord, found Elizabeth. 
Her eyelids fluttered softly with each note, the music enveloping her, the hush of the hall echoing her stillness. As the piano sang its tale of longing and loss, I was caught in its undertow. Memories of my father, his laughter, his wisdom, his silences, all weighed on me, pulling me deeper into introspection. Those piano keys, with their gentle insistence, seemed to push and prod at the rawest corners of my regrets. Elizabeth, radiant in her vulnerability to the music, made me ache for missed moments, for whispered words unsaid, for touch withheld. As the music swelled and retreated, it felt as if Mozart himself was guiding my introspection, making me confront the rawest parts of my heart. I yearned to bring joy to Elizabeth, to shield her from the world's cruelties, and bask in her radiant spirit. In that dimly lit concert hall, surrounded by aristocrats and elites, with Napoleon himself looking on, nothing else mattered. Only her, and the hope that one day I could make right everything that was so wrong. Elizabeth. Intermission pulled us from the embrace of the music, a wave of chatter replacing the harmonious notes. It was jarring to my senses after such a long time of just floating. I stepped out into the cool of the outer halls, my arm claimed by Campbell, but somehow it felt like Fitzwilliam Darcy was really the one escorting me. He might as well be, for his presence ever behind me was as sure and steady as a hand resting at the small of my back. How could a man feel so intensely there, without ever touching me or saying a word? There was a time when such scrutiny might have made me self-conscious, or defensive even, but now it wrapped around me like a familiar shawl. It was comfort in a place where I sorely needed it. Even when the pull of the crowd forced him from immediate proximity, I could feel the heat of his gaze following me. The throngs of concert-goers jostled around, their murmurs and laughter filling the air. But amid the flurry of movement, a familiar face caught my eye. Was that... Miss Clara? I could not help the scowl that settled on my mouth. Lord Holt had truly secreted his mistress into the concert hall. How far did the man's depravity go? Could he not suffer even a few hours without skulking away to indulge himself? But it was not Lord Holt trailing beside her. It was one of the attendants I had seen standing behind Napoleon during the performance, a handsome youth who was catching at Clara's fingers and drawing her behind the curtains with him like a secret lover. My mouth dropped open. Oh, if Lord Holt saw... I glanced across the room, and my heart fairly flipped into my shoes with disgust. Lord Holt was watching her, and that was not jealousy lighting his eyes. It looked like... Oh, gads, it looked like he was actually pleased. I wanted to vomit. Miss Bennet, are you well? Campbell's voice snapped me back to the moment. I turned my gaze quickly away and forced a tight smile. Indeed, my lord, forgive me, I was only distracted by something. From the corner of my eye, I caught Darcy's hooded expression. I'd no doubt that he'd seen everything too, because he was watching my every movement and word like some kind of bodyguard. Perhaps I would ask him some time if it was usual for a rich man's mistress to amuse herself elsewhere, but I wasn't sure if I wanted to hear the answer. "'Ah, Miss Bennet, permit me to introduce you to some friends of mine,' Campbell said. With a flourish, he led me toward a small group that stood slightly apart from the main crowd. They were a distinctive gathering, more for the way they made me feel than the way they looked. Men with sharp eyes that raked over me with an unsettling intensity, and women with scent applied so liberally that I questioned their status in polite society. "'Signora Isabella, Signor Matteo,' Campbell began, gesturing to a woman in a dress that left little to the imagination, and a man whose gaze lingered a moment too long on me. May I present Miss Elizabeth Bennet? The woman bubbled in laughter. Ah, the English arose we've heard so much about. Oh, but you look so young for such a clever one. Not to worry, my Lord Campbell is an warm or gentile. Matteo's eyes travelled over me, in a way that made my skin prickle. "'No pleasure,' he said, but his tone suggested something entirely different. I gulped, but tried to look calm and steady. 
Oh, the pleasure must be all mine. Ah, if you will excuse me, my lord, I would like to retire for a moment before the performance begins again. Campbell released my arm. But of course, Miss Bennet. I was shaking. Heavens, that man was making me shake like a leaf. No one had ever done that to me. I paced quickly away, my fan fluttering in front of my chest, to ward off curious eyes as I scurried to the ladies' retiring room. Are you well, Elizabeth? My skin shivered at the sound of that voice in my ear. Fitzwilliam. Air filled my lungs again, and I let my steps slow. Oh, thank goodness, I whispered. Take me somewhere else. Darcy looped his arm for me and pulled me to a quieter hall. What happened? What did they say to you? I extended my hands and watched the shaking in my fingers begin to ease. Oh, nothing shocking. I do not know why it unsettled me so. The woman said I looked young, but that Campbell was un uomo gentile. I don't know why those thoughts should go together, or why that should have sounded so suggestive to me, calling Lord Campbell a gentleman. Darcy's face washed white. Elizabeth, she wasn't calling Campbell a gentleman, in the sense you are familiar with. That word would be gentiluomo. She was saying that he was a gentle man, as in... Oh, Lord, I breathed. I didn't. I cannot. What do I do? His jaw hardened. I will keep you safe, Elizabeth. You have my word. 18. Elizabeth The music started again, each note swelling magnificently against the walls of the concert hall. But where the first half had been a soulful experience, now I felt a restlessness, an unease that gripped my insides. The notes sounded distant, abstract. Lord Campbell's overbearing presence, the unfamiliar guests, the weight of Darcy's silent worry beside me. It all felt heavy, like a stone settled in my chest. Lord Campbell signalled a waiter, who soon brought a tray with wine glasses, their ruby contents reflecting the dim lights of the room. I took one, hoping the familiar taste might ground me again, might bring back that brief serenity the music had given me earlier. The wine was rich and velvety, and I allowed the warmth to seep into me, trying to let it calm my frayed nerves. But just as I began to relax, I felt a weight on my hand. Lord Campbell's fingers, cool and demanding. I froze. It was a gesture that might have appeared innocent to an outsider, but the intention was clear to me. And then his hand slid upward, resting on my leg. Panic shot through me, a cold jolt in contrast to the warmth of the wine. Every muscle in my body tensed. The music faded to a distant hum as my heart drummed loudly in my ears. I dared not look to Darcy, though I could feel the charged energy emanating from him. He must have sensed it. He must have seen. I needed to extricate myself from this situation. But how? How could I maintain my composure, my dignity, in the face of such a transgression? That was when Fitzwilliam Darcy, the cleverest man alive, flicked his fingers toward his breast pocket and the handkerchief just peeking over the edge. I blinked. The man was a genius. Dust. I needed dust. Or at least I needed to imagine some. It should not be hard in such a place. Why, the pads of the chairs and even the air itself would be enough to... Ah! Uh, I sniffed and closed my eyes. Ah! Uh, my breath now came in unsteady gulps as the familiar tickles and shivers spread down my neck. Are you well, Miss Bennet? Campbell asked. I winced and gasped for some air, shaking my head and holding up my hand. Oh, the dust, I... Achoo! Lady Holt glared at me, and I gave a faint apologetic smile, but the avalanche had begun now. Somehow, I shall never know how, I had managed to persuade my nose that it was under a dreadful assault from its favourite sensitivities, and now the siege commenced. Ah! Uh, ah! Uh, Miss Bennet, are you ill? Campbell asked in some alarm. I shook my head, my fingers coiled to shield my nose. I just need... Ah! Uh, Come, Miss Bennet, Darcy urged. Allow me to assist you to some fresh air. I'm certain Lord Campbell would not object to doing so himself, but he has his other guests to consider. Campbell blinked at Darcy, then gawked slightly at me. 
but that was all I saw before another series of sneezes claimed me. Yes, Campbell agreed, though his voice did not sound pleased. Very well, Mr Darcy. In seconds, Fitzwilliam Darcy, that miracle of a man, had me pulled out of the box and down the darkened hallway. His handkerchief had somehow found its way into my hand, and his arm was braced behind my back, as the shivers and sneezes slowly abated. He found a window alcove where we were unlikely to be discovered, and drew me into the shadows with him. "'Are you well?' he whispered, his hands lacing with mine. I nodded. "'Yes!' I gasped. That was bloody brilliant. You were the one who pulled it off. Did he importune you? I dabbed my nose with his handkerchief and sniffed one last time. You don't need to challenge him to a duel if that is what you're asking. I will if he becomes more insistent. I sighed and smiled up at him. Don't. You have more important problems to worry about. What could possibly be more important than you? Oh, heavens! It wasn't fair. It was just not fair. I tried to swallow, to breathe, but my throat had stopped working. My heart, too. I... Oh, blast. I was lost, and I knew it. He stepped a little closer and hesitantly lifted his fingertips to brush my cheek. You look so beautiful tonight, Elizabeth. Like a queen or a goddess. I thought my heart was going to fly out of my chest when you came down those stairs. I shook my head. Mr Darcy, please. I know. He sucked in a sigh. I won't be one more blackguard imposing himself on you tonight. I just thought you should know. But in truth, you are always beautiful to me, Elizabeth. Even with your hair all ripped by the wind and your hem six inches deep in mud. My eyes felt hot and sticky all at once. Trapped the man. I'd given up thinking he'd gone bar me in the head. He loved me, honestly and truly. And though I couldn't guess what I might have done or said to earn his love, my heart cracked with the confession that I wanted Fitzwilliam Darcy with everything in me. But I couldn't have him, not any more. I couldn't look at him, couldn't speak. I just leaned into his hand, let his arm slide behind my back, and closed my eyes. I felt his lips at my brow, and I turned into him just a little, just to feel his breath tickling the curls at my scalp, the warmth of his chest as I burrowed into him, how his arms were everything safe on this earth. But somehow I felt like they could carry me off to dreams, even more sweetly than the music had done. I love you, Elizabeth, he murmured. My chest, it broke. The tears weren't stopping now, and neither was the quaking. I was trembling from the deepest recesses of my being, and I had no answers for the exquisite ache that threatened to rip me apart. I lifted my face, my lips only a hair's breadth from that blasted dimple in his chin that I'd wanted to touch since the first time I saw it. I could just kiss him, kiss him and have done with it, and double take the rest. He was waiting for me to do just that too, his eyes fixed on my mouth, the backs of his knuckles resting under my chin. My heart shook, and I swallowed one last time. And then I stepped back. Stupid, stupid Elizabeth. I had everything I wanted, right there, begging me to take it, to take him. But I didn't dare. I just couldn't. Not if I thought even for a moment that all the bad choices in my past could haunt him. I swallowed and swiped my eyes once more with his handkerchief. Then, biting my lip, I offered it back to him. I'm not sure if you want it back. He sagged, but smiled weakly and took it. You keep saying things like that, like I cannot handle a little messiness. I can handle it, Elizabeth. I crossed my arms and hugged myself. But you shouldn't have to. Fitzwilliam thinned his lips and stepped close to touch my cheek once more. I'm going to have a word with Campbell. I'll tell him you're unwell and I'm escorting you back early. I nodded. Thank you. He squeezed my hand and walked away, drawing my heart after him. I love you too, I whispered to his back. Darcy. His Excellency would be pleased if you would join us for dinner this evening. 
Campbell's voice at my door snapped my focus from the sketch I was drawing for Georgiana. I stood from the desk. Uh, Please tell the Emperor that I would be honoured. Campbell inclined his head and looked as if he meant to walk away again, but then hesitated. It is to be gentlemen only, visiting dignitaries, advisers and personal friends. No ladies present. I nodded slowly. I understand. Campbell frowned. I trust Miss Bennet recovered well from her indisposition. I have not spoken with her since last evening, I answered honestly, but she was feeling somewhat better when I left her at her door. The concert hall can be rather dusty, he observed, with an odd note in his voice. Indeed, she is often troubled by that very thing. How strange. You must be rather familiar with the lady for her to have confessed as much to you. My jaw tightened. My acquaintance with her is of some duration, yes. Ah, then perhaps I have misread the lady's charms. Perhaps her sentiments are not what I believed. At last the blighter figured it out. You would not be the first to misunderstand her wit and warm conversation, my lord. Campbell gave a tight smile. Well, I think we understand each other, at least. He tilted his head to look beyond me. That is a charming sketch. You draw, Mr. Darcy. I glanced disinterestedly back at Georgiana's drawing. Oh, yes, my sister enjoys it when I can show her my travels in pictures rather than merely describing them in words. May I? Please. I handed him the drawing, and Campbell's eyes roved over every detail. The vineyards at Porto Azzurro. You have a talent, Mr. Darcy. He handed my drawing back. Thank you, my lord, but it is my sister who is the true proficient. I merely dabble. He huffed and let his hands fall over each other, then inclined his head once more. Well, then, we shall depart for dinner at quarter to seven. I bowed slightly. I am looking forward to it. And it is that very essence of meritocracy, gentlemen, that I have always championed, Napoleon was saying, leaning forward earnestly. I always sought to ensure that a man could rise based on his merit, and not merely his birthright. I shifted slightly in my seat, an uncomfortable notion tickling my mind. It was a topic that touched close to home. The English gentry, of which I was a part, held our titles and lands through generations of inherited wealth and status. Yet Napoleon proposed a different vision, a society where even the son of a Corsican lawyer could become an emperor. Little wonder men flocked to him. He appealed to those fortune had left out, men like I once was, a younger son with limits on my future. And he spoke so well, so passionately, that what man with a heart and a mind could find him in the wrong? Truly, it was difficult not to let the man hypnotise me utterly. But it is still possible to agree in part, but not lose one's own way. I glanced round the table and found, however, that nearly every eye was glassy with adoration for the man at the head of the table— Lord Holt seemed particularly engrossed, nodding along with a gleam of genuine admiration in his eyes. "'Your Excellency, I must admit the Napoleonic Code has left an indelible mark on civil jurisprudence. It is a legacy that even we, across the Channel, cannot ignore.' "'Ah, Lord Holt, you flatter me. But it was a work of many minds, not just mine, a testament to the power of collective innovation.' There was a brief pause— as wine glasses were refilled. Napoleon's gaze turned contemplative, perhaps recalling his days of power and influence. But enough about the past, he finally said, raising his glass. To the future, and to new bridges built on understanding and respect. That, I had learned, was his way of trying to appease any minds that yet lingered in doubt over his pontifications. Harmless and content, forward-thinking and magnanimous to all, That was how he wished to be seen. And I thought it was all a steaming pile of ash and sheep dung. As courses came and went, the conversation gradually shifted from light philosophy to matters of deeper substance, trade, supply routes, and the state of affairs in the West Indies. But I found my thoughts wandering to Elizabeth, as they always did when I had leisure. My attention was abruptly drawn back, however, as Napoleon leaned forward "'animatedly directing the conversation toward a topic close to his heart. "'Mark my words. "'Europe is on the cusp of a great transformation. 
Industry is reshaping our world. The age of manual labor and agrarian economies is waning, and men shall be equals as never before. Campbell gave a wry chuckle. Indeed, Your Excellency, the smokestacks rising in the cities of England are a testament to that, and they call those beastly things progress. Napoleon's sharp eyes met mine, and I swallowed my drink a little too quickly. Mr. Darcy, your nation has been at the forefront of this industrial revolution. The looms of Manchester, the foundries of Birmingham, they promise prosperity, but also bring about great societal shifts. How do you perceive this rapid change? I cleared my throat, choosing my words carefully. It is a double-edged sword, Your Excellency. While industry brings wealth and advancement, it also brings challenges— displacement of workers, the question of ethics in employment practices, the strain on cities not built to house so many. These are issues we grapple with. Lord Holt interjected. But it's the way of the future, Darcy. We must adapt or be left behind. England's growth is proof of that. Napoleon smiled. Well said, Lord Holt. Progress waits for no one. And while there are challenges, they are but stepping stones. For with innovation comes the opportunity to elevate society, to provide jobs, education, and a better standard of living. How strange was it that a man who had once commanded armies and wrought untold devastation on nations now spoke of progress and the advancement of humanity? Was this just eloquence, or was he hinting at a new ambition? I clenched my jaw and kept my eyes on my glass. It would not do for anyone to see the thoughts playing through my head. As for France, Napoleon continued, we have watched England's rise keenly, and while our approach might differ, the end goal is the same, prosperity and progress for our people. Campbell raised his glass. To progress, and the bright future it promises. As the table echoed with agreement, Campbell suddenly winced and paled. My friend, are you well? Napoleon asked. Campbell dotted his brow with a handkerchief and drew a shaky breath. It is nothing, only a mild inconvenience. However, as you have asked, I fear I must inform you that business on the mainland calls me away in the morning. I am afraid I receive word even as I was dressing for this evening. I do apologise for the suddenness of my departure, but it cannot be helped. A murmur of surprise and concern rippled through the room. Napoleon, ever the gracious host, spoke first. "'Lord Campbell, I am truly sorry to hear that. "'I hope it is nothing serious. "'No, of course not. Uh, "'Merely a matter of state. "'But I fear, Lord Holt and Mr. Darcy, "'it means we must cut short the rest of our plans.' "'That was all well and good with me. "'I'd seen enough, "'and I would not draw an easy breath "'until Elizabeth and I were well away from this blasted island. "'But it was Lord Holt's place to speak first. "'I waited, and he predictably expressed "'the most profound disappointment.' "'But you must attend to your duties, of course. "'I dare say Lady Holt will be more difficult to appease, "'but she must and should be well pleased "'with such considerations as we have been shown. "'Lord General Campbell, I must protest,' Napoleon objected. "'Have I not liberty to speak? "'It is unseemly that such agreeable guests "'should be forced to return "'before they have quite satisfied the reason for their long journey.' Why, Lord Alt, were you not just telling me how you admire the improvements at the port, and how you wish to document them? And Mr. Darcy, I fancy, has his own reasons for delaying his return. I snapped to attention. I have, Your Excellency. Indeed, you seem quite enamoured with the uh, personal connections you have forged here. I should hate to deprive you so soon. My insides coiled. Of course, Napoleon had been watching me. He'd probably seen every panting, longing look I'd cast Elizabeth's way since I landed on Elba. But why would he care? Why protest my departure? Napoleon placed a hand in his coat and made a short bow to Campbell. I should like to formally request the honour of hosting Lord Holt and his party while you are away, my good sir. They shall be excellent company, and you, my friend, shall be comforted in knowing that I am not alone and friendless with you away. Your kindness is unparalleled, Your Excellency. Campbell gestured to Lord Holt. If his lordship agrees, then it is settled. 
Lord Holt gave his opinion most eloquently, and my stomach fell like a thousand bricks. We were to stay under the very roof of the tyrant of all Europe. Later, as our carriage pulled away from Napoleon's residence, the unspoken weight of Campbell's announcement hung in the air. Holt was the first to break the silence. Lord Campbell, I hope the business calling you back so suddenly is nothing too grave. Campbell looked out into the dark, the fleeting moonlight casting a pallor over his face. I fear, gentlemen, that it is not business calling me away. I am experiencing a strange combination of symptoms, chest pains, and my internal workings are suddenly undone, and I prefer to see the British surgeon in Livorno rather than the one in Napoleon's retinue. I frowned. But surely you do not suspect. Campbell held up a hand. No, no, nothing like that. He is too much the gentleman to resort to poison. Besides, this is more of an issue with my heart, as far as my surgeon knows. Oh, fear not, for there should be no issues with security. As I said, His Excellency has proved himself a gentleman in every way. I do not anticipate any alterations to our arrangements. His offer to host you at his residence eases my concerns in that regard. He will not break his word to be the perfect host to you until my return. Quite naturally, Holt agreed. I am certain his intentions are pure and honourable. 19. Elizabeth The Palazzina de Mulini I felt faint just trying to pronounce the name. Napoleon's house. We were staying in Napoleon's house. Good heavens! It was a grand building, perched atop a rolling hill, to command a view of the town and the bay. The rooms were adorned with the finest empire-style furniture, every detail exuding its master's presence. Last Thursday, when we had been shown to our quarters, I was overwhelmed by the aura of the place. The chandeliers, the thick curtains, and the polished floors all spoke of a world far removed from mine. I'd spent every day since, just tiptoeing about with a sense of awe. Tea with Napoleon. We'd all taken tea with him each afternoon, and passed him frequently in the halls, as his people escorted us from one outing or entertainment to the next. Then this morning, we'd all attended Mass with the former Emperor of France, though Darcy refused to cross himself, and I was positive it was a sin to bow before the priest. I had seldom in my life felt awe at anything, but there was something about this place, knowing the significance of where we were, that inspired some reverence even in my cheeky little heart. Some other time I would have been eager just to spend my days touring such a house, learning all the details of its history, with my voice hushed and my steps soft, so as not to disturb the ghosts that probably haunted these halls. But right now I was running, and my voice was anything but hushed. Poppy had wandered off again. Of course she had, because where else could we quite literally be in danger for our lives if we walked into the wrong room, overheard the wrong conversation? Naturally, she would choose Napoleon's own home to run away in. Well, actually, she probably hadn't run away. I'd learned that by now. Poppy wasn't naughty on purpose, but she was full of mischief and wonder, and she never could sit still. But just because she hadn't deliberately disobeyed me didn't mean I wasn't panicking. I'd checked the gallery, the arbour, the garden, and even the kitchens. Where had she got to? Oh, if anyone found out, I'd let her get away again. Lady Holt would have my head on a platter, and our host, good grief, he'd commanded armies across nations. What would he think of a guest who could not contain a small child? I mean, not that I really wanted to impress Napoleon Bonaparte, but one doesn't like to be found wanting in their abilities in the face of such a person. But the real worry was whether Poppy had got to somewhere actually dangerous, and how was I to know what that really was? In this house, I was convinced that even the potted plants were prepared to ambush us for one wrong move. Were the curtains moving with men spying on my every word? And why the bloody blazes were we even here, instead of safely back on the mainland? What a stupid idea! I was terrified into anger, and angry enough to swear like one of the sailors on the flambeau. And just as panic was about to consume me wholly, there was Darcy, Poppy, safe in his embrace, Of course, it had to be Darcy who found her. 
because if there was one other person in the world before whom I could not bear any further disgrace, it was him. But I was too relieved to see her alive and safe, and I gasped and ran to them. Poppy, where did you go this time? Darcy's face contorted with concern. In Napoleon's own study, a servant spotted her admiring his astrolabe. My jaw hit the floor. His study? Oh, why not his very throne room? Oh, for heaven's sake, Poppy! Visions of stern French guards and us being unceremoniously thrown out of the palace flashed before me. What in the world would possess you to go there? She blinked innocently at me. It was empty and the door was unlocked. Why would anyone mind? I rolled my eyes and took her from Darcy with a groan. Child, you're going to be the death of me. Do you have any idea what could have... But I saw my papa walk in there earlier, she protested. No one was around then. He just walked in. From the corner of my eye, I saw Darcy swallow. I sent him a pointed look. Perhaps we would speak of that later. Then turned my attention back to Poppy. Let us just make a rule that it is never permissible for you to enter a gentleman's study unless you are invited particularly here. You cannot understand how dangerous... I broke off. What is that in your hand? This. She opened her fist and an ornate handle rocked on her palm. It was pretty. Good Lord, Darcy breathed. That's his personal seal. Well, I didn't mean to take it, Poppy snapped defensively. I'm not a thief. You only surprised me, that's all. It looked like my father's, so I picked it up. Darcy took the seal from her. I would wager that taking your father's seal back to your playroom would not result in you being hanged for treason. His eyes met mine quickly. This is a very dangerous thing to have. I shall have to return it at once. Heaven help me. I shook my head and took it from him. I should be the one to return it. Out of the question, Elizabeth. He leaned close to my ear and whispered, Do you understand what could happen if you're found with this? He could think you were trying to forge messages in his name. No, he would think that if you had it. What am I but a hapless governess who cannot control her charges? Darcy's jaw hardened. No, I won't let you. He reached for my hand, and I do not doubt that he might have torn it from my grasp. Such was the determination in his eyes. So I put it where he could not reach, down the front of my gown. He blinked, all the blood draining from his cheeks, as his eyes fixed on my bosom. Elizabeth, please, do not force me to... I lifted my chin and gave him an artless look. Force you to what, Mr Darcy? He clenched his fists and leaned closer. If protecting your virtue, even your very life, means I have to put my hands on you, then so be it. My jaw popped open partly because my mind was suddenly filled with an image of Mr Darcy doing exactly as he threatened, and it was not, entirely, an abhorrent prospect. I clamped my hand over the hard lump in my bodice and choked. You would not dare, sir. He sucked in a breath, but before he could reply, a soft chuckle from behind cut off our argument. My heart stopped. Turning, we both saw Napoleon himself strolling down the hall towards us, an amused glint in his eyes. Dear heavens! It seems the young mademoiselle has quite the taste for curious objects, he remarked, eyes darting briefly to my hand, clutching my gown. No need for such drama, though, mademoiselle Bennet. It is just a seal. Just a seal. Just the very thing that he used to validate his letters of state and give orders, and... I swayed slightly as I stood there. Oh, yes... Yes, Your Excellency. But Poppy was not nearly in so much awe as I. She gave a small, impish smile, the sort that only a child could manage. I'm sorry, sir, she said simply. It looked like my father's. Napoleon chuckled again, bending slightly to Poppy's level. My dear, it is always good to have an eye for important things, but perhaps next time, just admire from afar, oui? He turned his attention to me, his eyes warm yet calculating. And mademoiselle, while I admire your bravery and quick thinking, there's no need to hide it. I will take that, please. 
With a shaky breath, I retrieved the seal and placed it into his waiting hand, our fingers briefly touching. I apologise for the inconvenience, Your Excellency. All is forgiven. He wagged his finger at me, glancing between Darcy and me. You thought I would have your heads, did you not? Madame la guillotine, oui? Darcy cleared his throat. I appreciate the gravity of the infraction, Your Excellency. I would not wish for a child or an innocent woman to bear the consequences, should the matter be misunderstood. I believe we understand one another perfectly, monsieur. A child is but a child, oui? And I have the greatest sympathy for a man who, like myself, appreciates and desires to protect such beauty when it is before him. He held Darcy's gaze for a few seconds, then turned to smile significantly at me. I grabbed Poppy's hand, my eyes darting to Darcy, the conscious look on his face, the horror dawning when he understood Napoleon's words for what they were. Did the Emperor mean to... to use me to threaten Darcy, control him somehow? In fact, Napoleon said, his gaze turning back to Darcy. Will you please join Lord Alt and me for drinks later? Your company gives me much pleasure. And now, if you will excuse me. He placed one hand inside his coat and bowed. And I am quite sure I heard a chuckle as he walked away. My hands trembled slightly as I poured the girls' tea. We had missed their usual tea time when I was out chasing after Poppy, but the maid had just brought a fresh pot and an early dinner for the girls, and a gallon of blacker-than-tar coffee for me, because by this point I needed something a bit stronger than tea. I had not told Emily and Bee what had happened, but Emily at least seemed to know how shaken I was. All three girls were staring at me. "'I didn't mean to!' Poppy protested at last. I know you did not, dear one, but I have asked you not to wander, or at least to stop and come back when you find that you have strayed. You kept exploring and could have got yourself into even worse trouble. Her eyes brimmed and her lower lip stuck out. I'm sorry, Miss Lizzie. I've stopped pouring to look at her. Poppy, I'm not angry with you. I only want to know you are safe. Do you understand? Poppy nodded and dashed at her nose, no handkerchief, of course, but it was Emily's face that caught my eye. Her brow wrinkled, and she was staring at something unseen just between us, her eyes focused on nothing. Emily? I asked. She shook her head. It's nothing. I studied her for a second and almost asked again, but a brisk knock interrupted me. Before I could answer, the door swung open. Lord Holt entered the room, passing a frown over each of his daughters. My heart rate quickened. The room felt smaller with him in it. I stepped away from the tea table to greet him. He had never, even once in my experience, come to talk with the girls. It didn't take much intelligence to figure out why he was there now. Poppy! His voice was sharp, and she stiffened in her chair. I trust you now understand the importance of not wandering into personal quarters, especially those of the Emperor. She nodded, her voice barely above a whisper. Yes, Papa. We are not back in London. I should not expect that I need to explain that. This glare was for me, personally. Miss Bennet, are you or are you not capable of managing a six-year-old? It will not happen again, my lord, I promised. It wasn't Miss Bennet's fault. Poppy cried. Don't dismiss her, Papa. Lord Holt exhaled slowly, his demeanour softening. No, I do not think that is necessary. I have spoken with His Excellency, and it seems he was quite amused over the affair. However, it is essential we avoid any such incidents in the future. I understand, my Lord. My eyes darted to the tea table just to his left. The girls and I were about to take our tea. Would you care to join us, Lord Holt? He paused, glancing at the table set with delicate china. He drew a little closer to it, and for a moment it almost looked as if he were considering asking for a cup. That would have been a fine thing for the girls, some acknowledgement from their father. Many of my fondest memories were of sharing a bit of bread and cheese with my own father. Well, you all must be weary of staying in this room. A pity we've so much rain today. It makes ventures out of doors rather less pleasant, Lord Holt observed, almost to himself. 
I glanced over my shoulder at the window. Indeed, sir, it is rather wet and cold today. I turned back to Lord Holt and was encouraged by the way he almost seemed ready to take a cup. His hand was close to one, and he was gazing at the fruit tray, as if contemplating taking something from it. But then, as though reminded of his duties, he straightened. Another time, perhaps. His Excellency is expecting me. Do keep Poppy close at hand. His eyes narrowed, and he levelled a harder stare at me. I cannot stress the importance of this enough. Yes, my lord. Twenty. Darcy. The amber liquid shimmered in the dim light as Napoleon poured. The sharp aroma of cigars wafted up, mingling with the rich scent of the cognac. I took a sip, the warm bite of the liquor burning all the way down my throat. To new alliances, Napoleon announced. May we all be enlightened by them. To unforeseen friendships, Lord Holt added, tipping his glass. I grunted something about improved understanding or some nonsense, and the cognac and brandy kept flowing. How long would I be expected to act sociable and civil with two men I trusted less than George Wickham? And why were we here, sampling Napoleon's best spirits and cigars, at barely seven in the evening? A light meal had been ordered, not much more than a hearty tea service, but the order of the evening appeared to be gentlemanly vice, rather than dinner or even conversation. Something was odd. It took me at least an hour to notice it, but when I did, I risked staring to the point of giving myself away. Lord Holt never quite emptied his glass before refilling. He would sip generously at first, and then his hand would cover the remainder in the glass as he switched to mere tastes of his drink. He would idle a while, then offer to pour again, and I could only catch rare glimpses of Napoleon's drink, for he sat in a chair that angled a little to the side, but I was fairly certain he was not finishing his glass either. They would try to drink me under the table. But why? Did they mean to set me up with some sort of blackmail? I was expendable to men such as these, a perfect scapegoat for whatever they wished to say or do. They could ruin me for their own ends, and neither would ever experience a moment's regret over it. But I certainly could not confront them over whatever they meant to do. Nor would I be suffered to leave the room. They wanted me intoxicated for some reason. And I began to slow down my consumption, but it seemed best that I act the part of a man in his cups. So I laughed more loudly. Elizabeth would have nearly fainted to hear it, and even let myself slosh a little of the brandy as I gestured with my glass. I hardly knew how to act intemperate, but I'd seen enough others who were, and perhaps I was convincing. As the evening wore on, Napoleon's posture grew more relaxed, his expression mellow, and his eyes frequently on me, I only grinned like a lush every time I found his gaze drifting my way, and pretended to drink more. I had progressed to slouching in my chair, my feet splayed out and my glass resting on my abdomen, when, at last, Napoleon stood. Gentlemen, please excuse me for a moment. He inclined his head to halt, then to me, and wandered out the door, looking for all the world like he wasn't sure whether his feet ought to alternate as he took his steps. "'Bloody Corsican cannot hold his brandy!' Holt slurred. "'Another, Darcy!' My heart started pounding. The game was truly afoot now. Holt had me alone. I smiled and waved my glass at him. Oh, "'Don't mind if I do!' Holt refilled my glass one more time, and I took a sip, deliberately letting the liquid linger on my tongue before swallowing. Holt watched me intently, a smirk playing on his lips. He was no longer pretending to be intoxicated. Splendid, he encouraged. A fine stuff, is it not? Only the best from the cellars of Napoleon Bonaparte. Ah, but it is cold this evening. What a grand fire, eh, Darcy? I nodded and kicked my boots out, acting as though I were ready to drowse off my brandy. Mmm, indeed. What happened next? Holt wasn't leaving. He seemed determined to satisfy himself that I was incapacitated somehow. Perhaps if I let my eyes drift closed for a few seconds. A few seconds quickly turned into several minutes. I focused on keeping my breathing deep and even, and not letting my eyes twitch about under their lids. 
and that part was easy. All I had to do was to set my thoughts on an image of Elizabeth's face, and that sweet little wrinkle just at the edge of her mouth, that I'd wanted to kiss for better than a year. I could stare at that vision all night. At long last, Holt's chair creaked, a shuffling of feet, clinking of glasses. I heard him pacing toward me, but he made no effort to rouse me. I let my breaths deepen to a pronounced rattle, and Holt grunted in satisfaction. A moment later, the door thumped closed behind me. The room was empty. I listened for a few more seconds to be sure, then shot to my feet to carefully test the door. It felt like the two handles of the double doors were tied together from the outside. Curse it all! What the devil did they mean to do to me? Was I to be set up as a political pawn, accused of something I did not do? All I knew was that I had to get out of that room, out of Napoleon's house, and off this cursed island. With Elizabeth, because I'd be hanged before I left her behind. I was contemplating the window when something made the left-hand door rattle. Silently, I grasped for the fire poker and secreted myself beside the door. But it was not Lord Holt or a soldier or any nefarious person who pushed the door open. It was Emily. I dropped the poker. Miss Emily, what are you doing here? She whirled, her face whiter than I'd ever seen it. It's Miss Elizabeth, she panted. Oh, something's wrong. I came looking for you because... because... Elizabeth. I grabbed her shoulders, attempting to calm her. Breathe. Tell me what happened. She took a deep breath, her eyes filling with tears. She's not herself. She was talking incoherently, her words making no sense, and she can't walk. Horror shivered down my spine. First, Holt and the Emperor tried to get me drunk, and now this. Dear God, if that cur had harmed her. Take me to her at once. Elizabeth. I burst into the room that Napoleon's housekeeper had set aside for the Holt children, and dashed to the chair over which Elizabeth was haphazardly draped. Are you well? I was already cupping her face, feeling her skin, and checking her eyelids. Good heavens, her forehead was burning up. Her cheeks were fiery red, and the lace of her fichu was torn away, revealing, um, a lot, more even than that red silk gown. I gulped. Elizabeth, wake up! I patted her cheeks, gently at first, then with more urgency. Emily, fetch me some water, or, or something. Elizabeth, can you hear me? Slowly, groggily, she smacked her lips and blinked until at least one eye was pointed listlessly in my direction. Fizz, William, she chortled, more of a snort, really, and grinned. You look yum, yummy. Her brow crinkled. And fizzy, is that a word? She sighed and smiled, then closed her eyes again, leaning her face on my hand. I shot a look at Emily. Is she drunk? The girl shook her head vehemently. No, sir, but I think I know what it was. She dashed to the tea cart and carried a cup to me. Do you smell anything? Suspiciously, I stuck my nose over the rim of the cup and nearly gagged. It smells like burned coffee. Ghastly. You don't mean to tell me Elizabeth actually drinks this hideous brew, do you? You don't smell anything besides coffee. Nothing sweet or musty. I sniffed it again. Uh, no, to be quite honest, I never cared for the stuff, so I'm not perfectly familiar with all the variants of fragrance, but I do not smell anything strange about it, other than the fact that it's bloody awful. Neither did she. I rolled my eyes. I've no time for games, Emily. What is your point? Emily's gaze darted to Elizabeth, then back to me. She wetted her lips. People used to say I put things in the governess's tea to get rid of ones I didn't like. I never really did. I don't think it would work in tea anyway, but I threatened it. I knew how, and I knew I could get it. Anyway, I didn't care if they thought I would poison them because I wanted them to go away. We never had a nice one until her, she said, flicking her head towards Elizabeth. Your point, please. Her eyes filled. It was never me. You have to believe me. I know how it sounds, but I never did it. I know what opium smells like, though. I blinked. Opium? Good God, Baron Holt. 
Emily bit her lip, her eyes shining with worry. Papa always had some in this little bottle in his study, and he came in here just before we had our tea. And now that I think of it, he got her to look out the window for a second while I think he... Is she going to die? No. Well, I shouldn't think so. It depends on how much she got. How long ago did she drink this? She shrugged. I'm not sure, but she only had one cup. And it was after we had our tea, I know. She would start to drink, and then she put it down every time she had to chase Poppy or help Bee with something. I think it was pretty cold by the time she really got to drink it. I wouldn't have known what was wrong with her, but when she sat on the footstool, staring at the floor and fanning her face, I took the chance to slip a cup for myself. I like coffee. And you could taste it at once. I didn't even have to taste it. I knew what it was before I drank any. So the tea was not tampered with, but the coffee was. Holt wanted only Elizabeth to consume it, not the children. What was the man up to? Something he did not want either of us to know. Apparently he didn't consider the children to be a threat, but he did not trust Elizabeth or me. Or he meant to use us for something. I sighed and turned my attention back to Elizabeth. I couldn't help it, really, because she was licking my fingers, sort of. She was cradling my hand and petting it like a cat. Then, with a cross-eyed look, she rubbed it against her cheek and, well, she... she meowed. On my honour, that is what it sounded like. Then, as I was watching her in limp amazement, she started nibbling at my fingertips and using them to stroke her ears. I stared aghast and tried to tug my hand away from her. Elizabeth, you are unwell. Please, calm yourself. Fizz, good kitty. She wrinkled her brow and released my hand. I brushed the hair from her face. Elizabeth, can you stand? Her eyebrows arched and she scoffed. Why? Because, unless I miss my guess, we are not safe where we are. The dimples of her thoughtful frown broke into an easy grin. Ah, oh, Fizz William, you're not safe with any girl. She pinched my cheeks like my aunts used to when I was barely in short pants. Not fair, it's not. I shook my head. What are you talking about? Emily? I turned to the girl. Rouse your younger sisters and get them dressed. I believe we must be ready to go at a moment's notice. Emily nodded, her eyes wide, and slipped into the next room where her sisters were sleeping. I turned back to Elizabeth and... Oh, bollocks, I'd forgot about that missing fichu. But it was bloody impossible not to notice its absence now, because she was... Uh, um, leaning against me, with an index finger drawing a line of hallucinogenic perspiration from her lower lip, down her throat, to her collarbone. Lord have mercy, Elizabeth, you must get hold of yourself... Here. I hunted around for the cast-off fichu and tried to hand it to her. You, um, you dropped... She smiled and took it to fan her face. No, it is for... Oh, here, just use my coat. I pulled my arms out of my coat and tried to drape it over her. Elizabeth squirmed away, her head sliding off the chair and coming to rest on my shoulder. So hot in here, she mumbled. Then she fell asleep. What now? Elizabeth was clearly incapacitated. I was hardly in better shape, having downed at least five or six full glasses of brandy. But though my body felt flushed, and most particularly now, with hers pressed against it, and my stomach was plotting some kind of alcoholic revolt, my head was at least clear enough to recognise the awful predicament in which we had found ourselves. How was I to get Elizabeth, and probably three children, to safety, I still did not even know where the danger was. Elizabeth, have you spoken with Lady Holt at all? She snored on my shoulder. I sighed and pushed her head upright. Oh, come on, love, you have to stand. She rolled her cheek against my arm and drank in a long sigh. You're such a bore. So nice. Just sit here. You feel... She sighed again. So nice. I let my arm fall around her. It certainly took you long enough to admit it. She snort giggled and grabbed my lapel to rock herself up on my chest. <laughs> You're so full of yourself, Fizz, Fizz William. Is that really what people call you? 
some. Georgiana calls me William, but she is the only one. I like fizz. Fizzy. She stroked my face, smiling the way she always did in my dreams. I like you. I pulled her to her feet, wrapping my arm around her waist. A pity you refuse to admit it when you aren't drugged. Come on, let us get you dressed. She let her feet drag along beside me. If I admitted it, you'd be stuck with me. I stopped, bracing my hands on her shoulders. What is that supposed to mean? She shook her head and tried to brush my hands away. Just let me... So tired. Let me sleep. No, Elizabeth, there is no time. What do you mean by me being stuck with you? Her eyes cleared slightly, and her head wobbled forward and backward. Do you know why I left Longbourn? You told me your father was leasing the estate. You left because you thought you were a burden on your family. No, no. She shook her head. I left because Mamma wanted me to get married. She snorted, then stumbled into my chest and bounced off again with a giggle. To the local butcher. Her head drooped. I tipped her chin back up to look her in the eyes. What? Elizabeth shrugged groggily. Not such a bad offer, really. Disgraced family, no money. He had his own shop. You almost sound as if you were considering it. She stuck her lip out. I'd never consider anyone else, but... Her brow crumpled, and she touched my mouth with her fingertips. Her gaze went glassy for a few seconds, and my heart seized. And then she melted into me. Her arms wrapped around my head, and my mouth became her plaything. Soft and eager, and just a touch wild. Sweet agony. I was kissing Elizabeth Bennet. Was it the brandy, or was all my skin on fire? She had me by the hair, and I'd no doubt she was tearing out great locks of it as she swayed dizzily against me. Who needed hair anyway, save as a convenience for his lady to bring him to heel? Elizabeth, I panted against her lips. You are not yourself. You're hallucinating. A lazy smile warmed her mouth. I know Mr. Darcy when I kiss him. Tolerable indeed. Well, when she put it that way, perhaps she had more of her faculties than I thought. She suddenly kissed like she meant it, because I was starved for air, and specks of light danced about my vision until my feet went out from under me. I twisted and managed to break Elizabeth's fall, but my head smacked the corner of the chair. Bollocks! I hissed, pressing my fresh bruise and wincing. Elizabeth rolled on top of me and patted my face. If you don't want to dance with a lady, you can just say so. No need to fall down. I stopped rubbing my head. Her knees were draped outside my thighs, the length of her curves melding to my body and her bosom. Oh, good Lord. I think you have me at a disadvantage, madam. I choked. She grinned. Good. Don't tell Mama. She opened my mouth with hers and, well, I am ashamed to confess that the feelings washing through my body just then were far from gentlemanly, and I had not the slightest means or inclination to put a stop to any of it. Thank heaven she was so far gone that drowsiness finally overpowered her hallucinations, or whatever this was. She let her hands slip down to my shoulders, her head crashing forward onto my chest. You taste good, she murmured. You bastard. And you taste like stale coffee. Elizabeth rolled her face about to scrub it with her palm. I bet you despise coffee. With a burning passion. I stroked a lock of her hair aside and let my finger trail down her cheek. But I am rather fond of you. Her eyes fluttered closed, but she was smiling. You're going to regret that. I'm too late. I shuffled my legs under her to reposition her weight, Somehow I managed to hoist her limp form up onto my shoulder and lever us both upright. Now what? Emily chose that instant to burst back into the room, her face stark with panic. Mr. Mr. She gasped. They're gone. 
Those were words to sober up an amorous drunk. Your sisters, I cried in alarm. No, they're getting dressed. But Mamma, her maid, even Papa's mistress, I cannot find anyone. Elizabeth was slipping off my shoulder, and I wrapped an arm over her, rather nicely shaped backside, to steady her. Gone, I repeated dumbly. I don't even see the housemaids. Everyone is just gone. Did they leave us? Why would they do that? And I shook my head. I don't know, Emily. Tell your sisters to put on every gown they own. Layer them up, for they will need the warmth. And show me to Miss Elizabeth's trunk. I grimaced. It seems I shall have to assist her myself. 21. Elizabeth I felt a tugging sensation, almost like I was being wrapped in the warmest, softest blankets, but these blankets felt scratchy and cumbersome. My eyes slowly blinked open to a blurred figure standing over me. I could see hints of deep blue and the outline of a crisp cravat. Elizabeth, for heaven's sake, sit up. The voice was urgent, but muffled, like it was coming from underwater. Bad enough that I must rummage through your undergarments. Do not make me put them on you as well. I slowly focused, my vision pinwheeling, and recognised the concerned countenance of Mr Darcy. Oh, he should not be in my bedroom. I snickered and wrapped a lock of his hair around my finger. Well, was this really my bedroom? It probably didn't actually count. A lethargic smile split my face, and I reached up to stroke his cheeks, feeling the roughness of a day's stubble beneath my fingertips. Why, Mr Darcy, I murmured dreamily, your face feels just like my aunt's pincushion. I tried to lean closer, puckering my lips seductively, trying to plant a kiss on him. Kind of fuzzy. He grunted in what sounded like genuine pain, pushing me gently but firmly away. Elizabeth, now is not the time for, for whatever this is. We need to leave, immediately. Here, can you... Oh, bloody hell, Richard is going to pay for this. Does he owe you money? I hummed. What a nice cravat Mr Darcy had. If I tugged at the knot just so, perhaps I could learn how to untie it. Elizabeth, he groaned. Pick up your foot. No, no, the other one. Still the other one. Egad, just sit back down. I shrugged and flopped back to the divan behind me. Only I missed. Such a fine thing that Mr Darcy had not one, but two nice strong arms with which to catch me. I grinned and patted his sleeves. Do that again? I'd rather not. Here. He eased me to the divan and closed his eyes, blowing out a strained huff. Why, the poor man looked like he was in physical pain. I should find some way to soothe that frown from his face. He pulled my hand away from his mouth. Desist, please. If you keep refusing to marry me once your head clears, I'm going to tell your father that I had to help you put on your bloomers and an extra petticoat while you kept trying to seduce me. Do stop petting my face. We must go, Elis... Mr Darcy tastes very nice. He sighed and pushed me back again. I will thank you to attempt more of that later, for now. A bit of fumbling with my feet... Then he picked me up by the waist, and I swear, he shook me like a rag doll as he yanked something up around my hips. Then he propped me back on my feet again. I moaned and swayed slightly, but then became mesmerised by the play of light and shadows on the walls. An explosion of patterns and colours danced before my eyes. I reached out to touch them, giggling at the elusiveness of it all, how the shards twirled and disappeared, only to be replaced by more brilliant ones. Mr. Darcy, have you ever noticed how the walls dance? They're dancing just for us. Shall we join them? I twirled, or at least attempted to, nearly tumbling into a priceless vase. He caught me just in time, with such nice, firm hands, that I swayed again, just to test his grip. Elizabeth Bennet, I implore you to come to your senses. We are in imminent danger. Danger? I murmured looking around with wide eyes. Oh, do you mean the purple dragons? I saw one in the corridor, but I think he's friendly, I snickered, patting Darcy's cheek affectionately. Good Lord, I'll be bloody grateful when this wears off. 
There are no dragons, unless you mean Lord Holt. But I should say he is more of a snake. Something is wrong, and I do not know what, but we need to leave Napoleon's residence and make for the harbour. You need to help me get the children to safety. Can you walk? I considered this seriously for a moment, then nodded with great determination. For you, Mr. Darcy, I shall try. He exhaled in relief, wrapping his arm securely around my waist, as we attempted to navigate the opulent corridors, dodging the wild daisies and jumping fish that kept springing up in our path. Ah! Uh, ah! Uh, sneezing would feel wonderful. All those delicious tickles up my spine, with Mr. Darcy's arm around me to keep me from floating into the clouds. For mercy's sake, Elizabeth, keep quiet, he hissed in my ear. We cannot risk... Achoo! I sniffed. I want another one of those. He grimaced and wiped off his ear. I don't. Take my handkerchief and cover your nose. I smiled and waved it at him. Is that really your name in the corner? I tried to focus my eyes on the embroidered script. F -d -f -d I squinted. Your name is F... -d I thought it was... I don't care what you call me, just keep it quiet, he growled, covering my mouth. The girls, help her. Stumbling out into the hall, I felt small guiding hands wrapping around my arms. Emily and B, bless their little hearts, were trying to help me dance prettily, but it was not very easy with those heavy shoes on. They looked like angelic little ballerinas, their white nightgowns making them glow softly in the dimly lit corridor. I put up my arms and tried to lift my feet higher than theirs. Miss Elizabeth, please try to stand properly, Emily pleaded, her voice full of exasperation. How much did Papa give you? B grabbed my hand. J just uh, imagine you're one of Poppy's p play d dolls, Miss Bennet, s straight uh, and stiff. In my days, I took this literally. Like a toy soldier, I announced proudly, attempting a rigid pose that unfortunately sent me toppling sideways. Only B's quick reflexes saved me from crashing into a suit of armour. Mr Darcy, looking even more alarmed, came rushing back. Ladies, we must make haste. There is a darkened corner just here where you may not be noticed immediately. I need to find a way out. Poppy tugged at Mr Darcy's coat sleeve. Oh, what a fine idea. I should do the same. Such nice coats he always wore. Mr Darcy, she said, when I was looking around today, I stumbled upon a servant's corridor. I think it might be a faster way out. I could show you. Oh, very well, he said with a nod. We scurried down dim corridors and winding paths. At one point I halted, pointing at a shadowy corner. Mr Darcy, look, a unicorn! Emily sighed. Miss Bennet, that's a mop. A dirty one, Poppy added, wrinkling her nose. At least Mr Darcy saw the unicorn. He stopped, stared at it, looked quizzically at me, and gave me the oddest little smile. See, I demanded. It really is there. Shall we pet him? Oh, some other time. Perhaps I should carry you. A piggyback ride, I squealed. Ah, oh, no. He sighed and grimaced. Poor Mr Darcy. He really was too serious. I should kiss him to make him smile. He pushed my hands from around his neck and wrapped his arm around my waist. Oh, never mind. Just keep walking, Elizabeth. Do not stop no matter what you see. The corridor seemed to stretch endlessly, its boundaries shifting like ripples in a pond. Occasionally, I felt like I was floating, and then I'd be jolted back to reality with a stumble, or when Darcy would tighten his grip around my waist. There's the door, Poppy's voice was like a distant bell. But, Mr Darcy, look! As the fog in my mind parted momentarily, I saw the streets awash in chaos. Torches flared, shouts echoed, and people rushed about like ants from a disrupted nest. There was a frantic energy in the air, thick with anxiety and confusion. We can't stay here. Darcy's voice was tense but controlled, a stark contrast to my disjointed thoughts. Elizabeth, can you understand me? I leaned in close, focusing hard on his moving lips, as I tried to make sense of his words. Dancing, I murmured, 
suddenly imagining a ballroom and the swish of silken gowns. Why aren't we dancing? Darcy shook his head and pulled me closer as he navigated through the teeming streets. What in God's name is happening? he asked a passerby. The Emperor is self for France, the man exclaimed. All the English are trying to evacuate. Elba is in uproar. This revelation seemed to sober Darcy further. He was really so stodgy. I giggled and tugged at the stranger's cravat, so Mr Darcy could smile and laugh like me, but he was simply no fun at all. Thank you, he replied curtly, dragging me away. But why are they all running? I wondered aloud, the the reality of the situation feeling slippery and distant. Is it a game? It's not a game, Miss Elizabeth, Emily said gently, her face pale. And I think my father had something to do with it, At least with the way you are, we need to leave this place. Ships! Poppy pointed towards the harbour. If we can get on one, we can escape. Darcy nodded. Indeed, but we shall be far from the only ones. Elizabeth, please try to focus. The port will be chaotic and we are bound to have some trouble. I tried to respond, to assure him I was perfectly capable of keeping up, but the words came out in a garbled mess. Tea and scones? The harbour was awash with desperate souls, many of them British, each vying for a spot on any seaworthy vessel. Men shouted, women cried, and children clung to their parents. The cacophony was amplified in my befuddled state, and I became increasingly disoriented, the world around me a tempestuous swirl of colours and sounds. "'Lilies!' I exclaimed, pulling away from Darcy and Emily. "'No, Elizabeth, stay with me!' Darcy shouted, reaching for my arm. No fun at all. He tried in vain to communicate with the various shipmasters, his Italian echoing over the din, but it was like trying to be heard in a hurricane. Suddenly, B's voice cut through the confusion, smooth and assured. Mi scusi, signori, stiamo cercando un passaggio sicuro fuori dall'isola. Puoi indirizzarci verso una nave? Both Darcy and I turned in sharp amazement. She was speaking flawless Italian, her usual stutter nowhere in evidence. The swirling haze of colours and distorted sounds muddled my thoughts. I tried to focus, pulling myself from the foggy depths of my confusion. B? The contrast between the girl I knew and this poised speaker was jolting. How? My voice was barely a whisper, my mind struggling to reconcile the two images. "'Didn't you know?' Emily asked. "B speaks four languages. She only stutters in English.' I squinted. Why did Emily's face suddenly look blue? That couldn't be right. B was walking toward us now. "'Mr. D- Darcy!' she cried. He-, "'He can help!' The man following her, a tall, rugged figure with sharp features and a commanding gaze, looked over at us with amusement. Benedict Harwood, Darcy breathed, of all the places and times. Harwood's lips quirked in a half-smile. I could say the same for you, Darcy, but what brings you down to the harbour in such turbulent times and with such delightful company? Darcy's arm dropped from my waist. Without a word, he reached into his coat and pulled out a heavy purse, the clink of coins sounding like little bells on the Christmas tree. Help us get to safety, Harwood. You know enough about me to know I'll make it worth your while. Harwood appraised the purse for a moment. The port is locked down. Every Englishman on the island is trying to make for the mainland right now, but certain individuals might frown on that. They'd like to see the inconstant safely out of sight before they let word leak out to Campbell that his prize has slipped the noose. Whatever you want, Harwood, I'll double it. I've no interest in politics. You can see where my concern lies. Mr Darcy put his arm back around me, tugging me close to his side again, which was a shame, because the ground looked like such a nice place to curl up and sleep. Harwood pursed his lips, then looked over our little party. I didn't take you for a family man, Darcy, but these are strange times after all. He paused, frowning thoughtfully. I have a friend, you might say, a fisherman who occasionally has room for a little more cargo, 
His vessel is moored in a secret cove around the point. You will have to walk some miles, and it will not be cheap. Darcy nodded. Just get us out of here. Each jolt and shift of Darcy's movement jarred me in and out of my hazy stupor. The world around me was a blurred collage of lights, shapes and distant noises, the latter echoing as if from another realm. Sometimes the glimpses of the world outside my drowsiness were clear, the muted glow of lanterns from windows, the shadows of people hurriedly passing by. Yet just as quickly they would dissolve into an indistinct smear. There was a warmth at my cheek, and a few times I became faintly aware that it was Darcy's neck, the pulse beneath his skin racing against my lips. And I was... Good heavens, was I straddling his back? And were those his hands, gripping me by the knees? A distorted thought floated through my clouded mind. that We were far too close, and in public too. The scandalous nature of our position should have made me blush. I simply... Oh, who cared about that silly stuff anyway... I groaned and lost myself to how warm and solid he felt. Then, in one lucid moment, the sense of the island punctured my days. Salt, earth, and something sweetly floral. But before I could take another breath, the world went dim again. Vaguely, I sensed a transition from the hard stone paths to the softer crunch of vegetation. A coolness enveloped us, perhaps from leaving the confines of the town, the sounds of humanity, distant shouting and conversations, faded, replaced by the whisper of wind and the lulling rhythm of the sea. And then there was only the sensation of movement, of Darcy's determined stride, and the ebbing and flowing of my own consciousness. A sudden shift, a drop in motion, jerked me partially awake. My body swayed, the solidness beneath my back unfamiliar. I tried to make sense of the situation, but everything felt so distant, so disconnected. Tired. I fought for sleep, battling against whatever was trying to tear me away. The rhythmic lapping of water reached my ears, like a soft tune from far away. The gentle sway, unlike the firm steps from earlier, was like the rocking of a baby's cradle. My hazy mind tried piecing things together. Where was I? The cold pressed against my skin, but before I could process it fully, warmth enveloped me again. It was a soft, comforting warmth, the gentle weight of another body. Something small and warm nestled against my chest. Poppy? Her quiet, familiar breaths tickled my skin. Then another presence was behind me, a solid, reassuring force. Darcy. I could be dead and I would know his arms around me. I could feel the steady beat of his heart against my back, "'synchronising slowly with mine. "'A rough fabric, maybe a tarp, was pulled over us, "'a protective barrier from the elements and prying eyes. "'Hushed voices floated above me, "'whispers blending with the sea's song, "'and a harshly whispered command, "'one that even I could understand. "'Silencio!' "'That was not a problem for me. "'I wanted nothing more than to sink into the abyss.' As the vessel gently shoved off the cove, carried by the unseen tide, the world's murmurs dwindled into a monotonous lull, the cocoon of warmth around me, the rhythmic waves, and the security of Darcy's embrace pulled me deeper into sleep, and I succumbed willingly to its dark embrace. 22. Elizabeth The chill seeped deep into my bones, making every shiver ache like an offended bruise. I stirred, the dull pain at my temples forcing my eyes to flutter open. My stomach knotted with nausea, and my breathing quickened, releasing visible puffs of air in the cold night. I felt dampness on my face, and touched it, to realise my nose was running. My eyes were watery too. What in the world? As I tried to sit up, the movement of the ship and the cool breeze tugged at my senses, making my headache sharper. I hugged my knees, feeling vulnerable and exposed. The sleeping forms of Poppy, Emily and Bee looked like serene bundled-up statues in the moonlight. A shadow separated itself from the darkness, moving closer. Darcy. He didn't say anything at first. His silhouette was all I could discern. But I felt his warmth before I saw him clearly. He draped his coat around me, 
drawing me close to his side in one fluid motion. The comfort of his embrace was both immediate and startling. When did he become everything? Or maybe he always had been. My head hurt trying to decide. His lips brushed against my hair. How are you feeling? he whispered. My head. It's going to split apart and leak all over the boat, I admitted, leaning into him. I want to vomit and everything feels so cold. And that's the opium wearing off. His shoulders lifted. Or the seasickness, take your pick. I blinked vaguely. Opium? How? Lord Holt, he growled. He wanted us both nice and docile last night. I think he expected we would just sleep through Napoleon's escape and not raise the alarm. It worked, too. Napoleon escaped? Oh, dear. Indeed. Europe is once more at war. I swallowed and grabbed his arm a little tighter, sniffing hard and wiping my eyes. Here, he offered, holding out his handkerchief. You already ruined it more than once. Might as well finish it off. I snorted an uncontrolled little laughing sob and took it. What are we going to do now? There isn't much we can do. Once we make land at Livorno, I'm going to find Campbell, and if he doesn't already know what happened on Elba last night, I'll catch him up. And after that, I'm going after Lord Holt. I'll see that beggar ruined for what he did to you. I scrunched up my face. But why would he do it? What was there to gain? Which question should I answer first? Why involve us at all? He grunted and let his eyes wander over the moonbeams dancing on the waves. I think we made him look trustworthy. Back in London, Richard told me Campbell was suspected of being a secret Bonapartist, but I don't think he actually was. Holt knew that to gain Campbell's permission to visit Elba, he needed to look every inch the loyal Englishman. Associating with me, bringing his family, it all lent him credibility as a curious tourist rather than a man with an agenda. And his agenda was... What could one English baron hope to do against every country hoping to keep Napoleon in exile? Well, I doubt he was actually working alone. I suspect he was paying people off to facilitate Napoleon's escape. Harbour masters, merchant captains, any authorities he could get to. And for that he had to be well funded, probably by other wealthy investors who wanted to re-stimulate wartime profits. And he had other connections too. You were asleep, but I saw his mistress last night as we fled through Portoferio. She was shouting in French and waving the imperial standard. Bloody girl was a spy. Clara, I gasped, but she seemed so young and, well, so innocent. She was anything but innocent, and she was probably not as young as you thought. I pinched my forehead and crunched my eyes closed. But some of the things she said to me, I could have sworn she was just a lost soul, as much at the mercy of the whims of the world as anyone else. She said she didn't understand so much of what Lord Holt asked. I would wager she was trying to put you on your guard against the inevitable. You were probably the only person who was kind to her. I frowned and sucked in a long sigh. Oh, perhaps. Oh, it is too much for my head right now. So many things to reconsider, now that I know. Darcy studied me, his lips thinning in the weak light. There will be consequences of this night. I could only imagine. The world was at war again. The tyrant who had beleaguered our navy and torched an entire continent was free once more, and his ambitions probably burned all the brighter for the delay in seeing them come to pass. And how many people had committed treason to bring it about? Would any of them be caught? What about ourselves, accidentally snarled in a web of deceit and intrigue, not of our own making? And what about... Oh, I groaned, as the more personal meaning of his words lanced through my aching skull. You mean, uh... I pointed between my chest and his. Does that trouble you? he asked gently. I sniffed again and tried to rub my eyes, but they were like burning orbs in sockets full of razor blades. Perhaps you could tell me exactly what happened last night. I think my memory is a bit unreliable. Before or after you tried to seduce me? 
Oh, dear God, I mumbled, dropping my face into my hands. Actually, I should ask, which time? Because you were quite amorous. I groaned. Please tell me I did not strip off my gown and jump into your arms. No. He squinted at the horizon. You jumped on my back, actually. Bloody hell. Such language, Miss Bennet. That doesn't sound much like the free-spirited lady whose petticoat I had to double knot to keep her from untying it. You seem to think it would make a splendid kite. I curled my lip and pressed the heel of my hand to my throbbing forehead. I hate you. But you are also quite obsessed with me. I finally got you to admit it. I puckered my mouth and drew up into an attempt at dignity. I was under the influence of a powerful narcotic. Surely you must make allowances for a lady's indiscretions in such a circumstance. Of course, but how do you explain this? He extended two delicate fingers and plucked a fold of white paper from inside his sleeve. I blinked and gaped at it, and words failed me for a moment. That, that is the note from Huntsford. The very one, or what is left of it. It fell out of, well, you had it tucked inside your, um... He gestured vaguely toward my bosom. I... I released a shaky sigh and chewed on my lips. It was a mistake. And tucking that into your bodice was an accident. No. I shook my head. Huntsford, the way I treated you and what I thought. I sighed. It was not a fortnight before I wished, most ardently, that I could take everything back. And then, seeing you again, I swallowed and blinked back the water running from my eyes. The after-effects of the opium, or tears. I started keeping this close, I whispered, because I thought it would be all I could ever have of you. His fingers traced my cheeks, icy fire in the pre-dawn chill. You have my heart, Elizabeth Bennet, and you always will. I hope you will take my hand as well. But I'm a go- He didn't let me finish. Instead, he cut me off with a kiss so swift and powerful he had to brace an arm behind me to keep me from toppling backward in the fishing boat. This part of last night, I did remember clearly. The way his lips tugged at mine, the gentle brush of his tongue over them, the way he coaxed me to give him more, and the hungry way I answered him back. His breath was heaving, ragged, and he broke off to rest his forehead against mine. I hope that was a yes. A smile parted my lips, but I was shaking my head against his. It doesn't change the last few months. My family was ruined, and I went into service. And who is there to speak against you? A treasonous baron? As far as anyone will know after this, you were merely enjoying a tour of the continent, as the guest of a family whose motives were unknown to you and have no fear for your own family, my man of business in London should soon have a letter from me to that effect. I narrowed my eyes. Fitzwilliam Darcy, what have you done? Me? Why, nothing. Oh, you know, occasionally, I invest in certain properties of interest, and if I should hear of one where the rents and house are up for a lease, and the lessor can be persuaded to take a settlement in lieu of Fitzwilliam Darcy, I liked him better when you called me Fizzy. I pointed a finger at him. Don't you dare repeat that to anyone. He shrugged. Very well. But I hope you do. Only for intimate occasions, however. I narrowed my eyes. I should slap you, or kiss you. But right now I'm dizzy, and I want to throw up. He chuckled and tucked me under his arm, and I puddled against the warmth of his body. This was not so bad. I suppose I could consider your proposal, I mumbled into his chest. If my head would stop throbbing and my nose would stop running, I could make up my mind. How long do I have? About an hour. We should make landfall just after dawn. And see there, the sky is starting to turn pink over the coastline. I drank in a sigh and nuzzled my cheek against his shoulder. And who knows what awaits us? My gaze flicked along what I could see of the coast, then stopped on something peculiar. I rubbed my eyes, but it was still there. I'm not still hallucinating, am I? Hmm? His voice rumbled against my ear. 
You seem perfectly lucid. But what is that? I pointed at a commotion in the distance. Tell me you're seeing that too. His gaze followed my hand. What? The seagulls? They must have found a school of fish to feast on. Quite common, actually, even... Hello there. Did you see the dolphin jump, Elizabeth? I nodded, my eyes round. How is that possible? The fishermen piloting our boat had noticed the fuss as well, and they were pointing and gesturing to each other. Mr. Darcy asked them something, and then they made as if they meant to steer their boat toward the feasting birds. Mr. Darcy shook his head, waved some more money at them, and they finally shrugged and steered for land again. What did they say? I asked. He gestured with his chin. A good catch. The dolphins drive the fish to the surface, and the seagulls hover over where the schools are gathered. They help each other hunt. So they share a meal, I murmured. Kings of the sea and the dancers of the skies. Mr. Darcy tightened his coat around my shoulders. I beg your pardon? I shook my head and turned to him with a smile. It is nothing. Just a silly thing I thought could never be. Yet here it is. I hesitated, then lifted my hand to caress his cheek. That prickly jaw outlined against the dawn and the eyes that glowed in the sunrise for me. Do you know, Mr. Darcy, perhaps it is not so impossible as I once thought. I sense that we are no longer talking about dolphins and seagulls. He tipped his face down toward me. Are we? I bit my lip and shook my head. Then I wrapped my arms around his neck and gave him to understand, not very eloquently, but most effectively, what my sentiments on the matter were. Darcy Escaped. Good Lord. Campbell sagged in his desk chair, his head resting on his hands and his eyes staring unseeingly at the floor. And Wellington nowhere near the field. By heaven, he's still in Vienna, dividing up the territory that Napoleon now means to take back. We've lost before we've even begun. I paced before Campbell's desk. So what is to be done? You were in charge of overseeing him, and you allowed this to happen. Do you realise the repercussions of your negligence? He shot to his feet. Do not forget your place, Darcy. I could have you arrested and questioned. Don't think none of your actions ever spark suspicion. I wondered about you from the first. Very well. I crossed my arms. Question me. Question witnesses. You'll learn that on the evening of Napoleon's escape, I was induced to drink vast quantities of brandy and cognac to keep me quiet. It was only a matter of luck that I was not so intoxicated, as Lord Holt believed. I will have my satisfaction there. Did you know he also drugged Miss Bennet? Campbell sank back into his seat. The governess? Why? My lip curled. Because she is more than a governess, and Holt is no fool. His eyes brightened. A spy? But for whom? I knew she was too sharp, too handsome and intelligent for a common governess. And that night she was working with you. By heaven, I... Miss Bennet is the well-educated daughter of a gentleman, and very soon she will be Mrs. Darcy. She is no spy, and I'll not suffer any harm to be spoken of her. Lord Holt used her as infamously as he did me, and you, I would wager... What sudden ailment caused you to race back to the mainland just at the right moment? Campbell stared sullenly at his desk. Oh, my surgeon can find nothing. Nothing, I say. And why? Because the symptoms that began approximately a fortnight ago vanished the moment I left Elba. I frowned. You suspect you also were poisoned? He was silent for a moment. Now, I've not ascertained that for a fact, although my surgeon did suggest something called Wolfsbane after reading in his medical books. He shook his head. But none of that matters. Who would believe me anyway? I'm the fool who let the eagle of France leave his nest. I clenched a fist. Justice must be served. Halt! My voice wavered with barely suppressed fury. After everything he stands accused of, you want to wave your hand and say that no one will even care. Campbell stared evenly back at me. Darcy, your anger is justified, but you must understand the complexities of the situation. Holt has connections and allies, even in the highest circles. If we move against him without solid evidence and a veritable army of well-placed witnesses, he will slip away. 
and what of Elizabeth? Think of her if not yourself. She could have died. There was nothing to stop her from drinking that whole pot of tainted coffee before it was too late. He was utterly careless of the safety of a lady travelling under his protection. Campbell sighed heavily, running a hand through his hair. The matter of the lady is deeply troubling, and if matters between you and Miss Bennet lie as you say, I can understand your urgency to set the matter right. I assure you, Holt will pay for that wrong. But right now the escape of Napoleon is a political catastrophe. Word is already on its way to Wellington and England. While we might be able to bring Holt up on charges of treason, I fear his allies will protect him. My teeth clenched. So you're telling me that after all this, he might just walk away free? Not free, Campbell said slowly. But his punishment might not be as swift or as severe as a strict application of the law would demand. If you can even prove his involvement, and to do that you need to know his motives. What did he really stand to gain? And Darcy? He looked me directly in the eyes, a hint of vulnerability there. My position is precarious now. With Napoleon's escape, many will see it as my failure. They will even accuse me of treason. My ability to help may be limited. I took a deep breath, but it did nothing to cool my anger. I thought of all the young men in uniform who would now be sacrificed on the altar of an emperor's ambitions, of the loss of life and property, the shattering of the fragile peace that would necessarily follow him through Europe. And I thought of Elizabeth, confused and vulnerable, and utterly helpless because of Holt. What more might have taken place last night if I truly had been as drunk as Holt thought? What if I had not found her before someone else did? And by Jove, what about those children? If there were any justice in the world, their father would be convicted as a traitor to the crown. Where did that leave his daughters? Then I will find another way to see it all put right, I murmured. For now I need to ensure the safety of Elizabeth and the children. You can reach me at the Locanda della Rosa until I have better information. 23. Darcy. Blast you, Richard, I muttered. I cast his letter aside, the only one that had arrived from England so far. There were probably more on the way, but they would all be too late. What sins do you lay at the good colonel's door now? Elizabeth slipped behind me and wrapped her arms around my shoulders. Then, and best of all, she kissed the tip of my ear and leaned against my back. I stretched for the letter and handed it to her. His commanding officer at Whitehall wants me to... I pulled her hand back so I could read that bit of his letter again. Yes, there it is. I'm to ingratiate myself to the current ruler of Elba and earn an invitation to his royal palace so that I may win his regard sufficient to learn his true intent. If that isn't the biggest load of poppycock. Elizabeth squinted at the page. Where does it say that? I turned it over for her. There, don't you see? That charming sketch by Georgiana. She lifted her brows. It just looks like a portrait of a lake surrounded by trees. It's in the branches and the ripples on the water, love, in Chinese. She let her hand drop and gave me a cynical scowl. Well, you don't mean to tell me you speak Chinese now, do you? Speak it? Heavens, no. But I can read it. We all could. My father brought in a Chinese tutor for us. The cleverest thing he ever did, because we were able to write anything with impunity and absolute confidence of secrecy. You've no idea how often my brother and I shared the answers to our examinations. Baffled every one of our beaks at Eton. Georgiana has an artistic hand, does she not? I sighed. But George, he was the true proficient of us all. Elizabeth tugged my arm away from the table and slid herself onto my lap, her arms still around my shoulders, and her sweet mouth only inches from mine. Tell me about him, she whispered. Well, there is not much to tell, and I should say to know one of us was to know the other. And how much older was he? One year. But most people believed we were twins. We looked nearly identical, sounded almost the same, did everything alike. We even found ourselves drawn to the same girl more than once. I smiled and cupped her chin. I often wondered if he had met you at the same time as I, would he have fallen for you just as easily? And would I have had to fight him for you? 
She arched her back, her fingers still laced behind my neck. Well, that all depends. Would he have been willing to dance that night we met? I was willing to dance. I murmured against her lips. Oh, just not with me, then? With you, most surely. But not there. Not half-loaded with a bottle of scotch in a sweltering room full of strangers. Where, then? I slipped my hand down the length of her forearm until my fingertips hooked with hers, and I held her arm extended. Why not right here, right now? Well, don't we have to stand up to do that? I grinned. Who says that? I have your hand in mine, and my other hand is there at the small of your back. I believe this is very much the accustomed posture for the waltz that is so popular here on the continent. She leaned in, her smile pressing against mine. And where is the music, Mr. Darcy? My heart. And just now it is playing the most beautiful melody I ever heard. Elizabeth kissed me softly, then let her head drape over my chest. Hmm, you were right. I could listen to this for hours. Far be it from me to suspend any pleasure of yours, my love. I leaned my cheek on the top of her head and just held her. My Elizabeth, safe in my arms at last. For the moment I cared nothing for all the trials that awaited us beyond the door of the inn. I had all I wanted in the world. The entire continent might now be at war, but for this evening at least, I knew peace. Elizabeth, what about Mamma? I tied the last bedtime braid in Poppy's hair and stood back with a sigh. I do not know, dear one. Mr. Darcy has been trying to find out where your parents are. I am certain they are worried about you. I wish we'd had some way to leave them word of where we had gone, so they knew you were safe. Mr. Darcy has been searching every ship to come into port from Elba and has sent word to every other port in the vicinity in hopes of finding them. They are not looking for us. Emily growled. She slumped in the window seat, her knees drawn to her chest, and her arms wrapped around her legs. She was facing away, her eyes fixed on something outside. I moved over to her and smoothed a hand over her back. Of course they are. Your mother is still your mother, no matter what happens. I know she cares for you, and is probably frantic with worry. Emily shook her head, but she didn't look at me. No, she isn't. I sighed and lowered myself to sit behind her at the edge of the window seat. Do you know, Emily, there was a time, not so very long ago, that I became very frustrated with my own mother. Oh, I loved her dearly, make no mistake, and I know she thought she was doing right in trying to make me marry someone I did not care for. I cannot say I regret making the choice I did, for look what it brought me. But I am sorry for the way I thought of her, and the way I spoke to her that day I left. And now she is probably just as frantic as your own poor mamma, because she has no idea where I am, or if I'm safe, or... What I mean, Miss Elizabeth, is that mamma doesn't look frantic at all. Look. Emily pointed out the window. I leaned over her shoulder, and my mouth dropped. Indeed, there was Lady Holt, strolling along for the evening passeggiata, with her parasol twirling over her shoulder, and giggling like a girl... She was resting her hand on the arm of some local signore, and surrounded by a fleet of merry dandies and bells, and she was walking right by the Locanda della Rosa, as if she hadn't a care in the world. Of all the... Oh, just wait till I speak with her! My skirts rustled as I stormed through the inn's lobby. Pushing open the entrance door, I strode onto the cobblestone street, with a wrath boiling from me that startled a few bystanders. The cool evening breeze blew my hair from its pins, but I barely noticed. My focus was entirely on Lady Holt, who was now only a few steps away. "'Lady Holt!' I called out, my voice crisp and more forceful than I'd intended. Her cheerful entourage came to a sudden halt, their laughter dying down in an instant. She turned, her eyes widening in surprise, but then her expression morphed into one of mild annoyance. "'Ah, Miss Bennet, what an unqualified pleasure! "'To what do I owe this interruption?' "'I closed the distance between us, ignoring the curious onlookers. "'Your daughters, Lady Holt, they were worried sick about you. "'Where have you been?' "'Why, here, of course,' 
she said with a light snort. Where else would I be? I gaped in shock for a second. We have been asking at every ship that comes into port from Elba, seeking any word that can be had. You mean to tell me you were here the whole time? You had to have left only Sunday evening. She gave an impatient twirl of her parasol. Evening? Why, that would be dreadfully dangerous. Sailing all night? How very silly. I departed in the afternoon. But what are you doing here, Miss Bennet? I... I left because it was too dangerous to stay where we were. Did you plan on telling your own daughters where you went? Please, Miss Bennet, you are making a dreadful scene. I must beg pardon for the governess. She is of such a family that lets their children run wild. Lady Holt rolled her eyes, drawing a ripple of amusement from her walking party. I clenched my fists and stepped closer to her, baroness or no. Why, in heaven's name, would you leave Elba the afternoon before Napoleon's escape, knowing full well what was to come, and not even care about the fate of your children? Lady Holt raised an eyebrow, her face a perfect mask of indifference. Why, you speak as if I knew the future. Oh, that I could have such a talent! She laughed. I only returned because I required a few new gowns for the climate. Dear Elba is such a lovely island, but far from cosmopolitan. Truly I meant to return after being measured by the seamstress the next morning. But alas, now simply no one is going to Elba, and I could not get a ship for love or money. If my mouth kept dropping open at each of her audacious statements, I was bound to catch flies. My eyes couldn't get any wider, and I slashed my hand through the air in the direction of the inn. And you never wondered about your children? She tussed. Oh, Miss Bennet, you forget your place. I left them in your capable hands, did I not? And surely Lord Holt was present. Lord Holt's whereabouts were as unknown as yours. I took it upon myself to ensure the safety of your children, not knowing if I'd ever see you again. A few whispers arose among her group, their eyes darting between Lady Holt and me. Her face flushed a shade of pink, but she held her ground. They would have been perfectly safe where they were. I laughed bitterly. Safe? You knew Napoleon was about to sail. You left because you wanted to protect yourself, and you said nothing to your children so that you could conceal your departure. One of the young Italian bucks beside her snickered, but when my eyes flashed his way, he sobered up quickly. Some of her companions began to drift away. You dare speak to me thus in public? Lady Holt snapped. You are but a poor strumpet without a penny to her name, and you would attempt to ruin my reputation. You did that to yourself, I said hotly. Just then, Mr Darcy appeared at my side, and the few who remained with Lady Holt drew back at the sight. I knew precisely why, for no one can look quite so forbidding as my Fitzwilliam when he chooses to. Elizabeth, are you well? I am now, I replied, drawing in a breath to steady myself. I have said my piece. Lady Holt's chin quivered, and her eyes darted between Darcy and me. You have no right to interfere. Darcy's gaze was cold as he addressed her. The only one who has interfered, Lady Holt, is you. You've compromised not only your reputation, but also the safety of your children. She huffed. Then, if it is such a bother to Miss Bennet to carry out her duties, without me holding her hand at every moment, I expect my daughters to be returned to me. I shall secure the services of someone else. I opened my mouth to lash out with some saucy retort. I could not very well refuse. After all, she was their mother. But I would not give two straws for those girls' futures being left in the care of such a woman. But Fitzwilliam stilled me with a gentle hand on the small of my back. I quite like it when he does that. Upon our return to England, he interrupted, with ice in his tone. You can speak to my man of business regarding their care. Until then, they will stay with us. Lady Holt's eyes widened in shock, but Darcy's stern gaze left no room for argument. Taking my arm, he led me away, leaving a fuming Lady Holt in our wake. Mamma doesn't want us, does she? Emily's flat tones greeted me as I entered our room once more. I drew a deep breath and lowered myself to the chair opposite her. 
That is not what she said. But it's what she meant. I saw the whole thing. She walked away laughing. She knows where we are, and she didn't come. I thinned my lips and glanced at Fitzwilliam, who entered behind me. She... no, she was not prepared to... that is... What Miss Elizabeth is trying to say is that we ask for the honour of escorting you girls home. Fitzwilliam interrupted. It would please us both very much if you could be our chaperones for the trip, until we exchange our vows back in England. Bee and Poppy looked at each other and giggled. Emily, however, puckered her lips and quirked a brow at me. And blast, if she didn't catch an expression that looked exactly like Fitzwilliam from time to time. I suppose we could, she decided, just to keep you from falling into disgrace. And then she made an obnoxious kissing noise that made me turn red all over again. Darcy. The ceaseless din of Livorno's bustling port was enough to give me a headache to equal the hangover I'd suffered after fleeing Elba. Sailors shouted orders, merchants haggled over prices, and the thunderous clatter of cargo being moved echoed in my ears. It was overwhelming, but there was a distinct urgency in the air, an anxiety palpable even amidst the usual portside chaos. Each step I took along the pier was met with sceptical glances and dismissive gestures. Everywhere I looked, sailors and merchants hurried about their tasks, but none seemed willing even to entertain my queries. Every captain I approached, every ship's master I questioned, gave me the same incredulous look and curt answer. Some simply shook their heads, their weathered faces revealing their thoughts clearer than words ever could. Others were more vocal about their disbelief. England, now! One burly captain scoffed, his thick beard bristling as he laughed. Spitting a wad of tobacco onto the cobblestones beside him, he met my eyes with a mocking glint. With the navy prowling every corner and Bonaparte stirring the waters, you'd have to be more than mad to even think of it. Another, a thin, wiry man with sunken eyes, adjusted the cap on his head and gave me a look of genuine pity. It's impossible, sir, he insisted. Every able vessel's either been snatched up by the king's command or has the good sense to steer clear of the commotion. Yet another captain, an older gentleman with a patch over one eye and a deep scar marking his cheek, was more philosophical. The seas have a mind of their own, he mused, looking out over the turbulent waters. Right now they're in a foul mood, what with all the political chaos. Best to let them be till they calm. As I turned away from yet another rejection, a commotion arose from a nearby dock. Ships from Elba were disembarking a flood of panicked British citizens. Men, women and children, their faces pale and haggard, were scrambling ashore with their scant belongings. "'They've nowhere to go!' a dockhand shouted to his companion. "'All the inns are full, and no ships to carry them away. It's madness!' Amidst the crowd, for a fleeting moment... I caught a glimpse of a familiar silhouette. My heart raced, anger flaring instantly. Could it be? That distinct posture, that air of arrogance. It had to be Holt. And his mistress was nowhere in sight. Without thinking, I began to push through the swell of bodies, but then hesitated. A confrontation now, in this public chaos, would serve no purpose. Holt had his games, his deceit, and now it seemed a clear path of escape. My priority was to secure the safety of Elizabeth and the children. He would have his day, but it wasn't today. Elizabeth. Poppy! My voice wavered with rising panic, battling against the din of merchants, sailors, and the ever-present thrum of anxiety in the air. Where had she gone now? Poppy! Bee's eyes, usually so bright and curious, were now clouded with worry. She was right here, Elizabeth, she stammered, her voice trembling faintly. She chewed on her bottom lip. I s swear, just a moment ago, she was laughing at, uh, and ch chasing that butterfly. Beside her, Emily's composure wavered, but her voice held steady. Poppy has a way of getting lost in her own little world, but she's never gone for long. I'm certain she meant to reassure, but I could see the anxiety tightening the corners of her eyes. 
the usually calm and collected older sister, wrung her hands in her skirts, the fabric of her dress crumpling under her grip. Her eyes, glistening with the threat of tears, darted through the bustling crowd. It's just, this crowd is so large and she's so tiny amidst them all. I clutched Emily's hand. You're right, she always does turn up. Come on then, let us not panic just yet. I took a deep breath, my own heart pounding in my chest. Perhaps her sisters, accustomed to Poppy's escapades, had learned to believe she'd reappear with a big smile and a new story. But in this crowd, with the chaos of the port, I could not will away my fears so lightly. But I could say something to keep up the other's confidence. We'll find her, I promised, and prayed that my words would not prove false. Poppy always manages to find her way back, doesn't she? But we need to act fast. Emily, you check near that stall with the flowers. B, could you go towards the ships? She loves watching them. Suddenly, a familiar laughter floated above the noise, a bubbly, infectious giggle that I'd recognise anywhere. I spun round, and my eyes shot upwards, following the sound. And there, above the crowd, perched atop Mr Darcy's broad shoulders, with his hat crowning her head, and her small hands buried in his dark curls, was Poppy. She waved cheerily when she saw us, the picture of innocence, oblivious to the turmoil her disappearance had caused. Look, Elizabeth, I can see the entire port from up here. Darcy's eyes met mine, his expression matching my relief and exasperation. He gently lowered Poppy to the ground, her feet pattering softly against the cobblestones. Found her by the fish market, he said, brushing a stray lock of hair from her face. She was asking some old salt down there about the different kinds of fish. Did you know there are so many types of fish? Poppy exulted. The man showed me a great big silver one. He had this huge mouth and his belly was so shiny and... As I knelt, enveloping Poppy in a fierce embrace, a surge of gratitude welled up within me. I'm sure it was lovely, dear one, but I told you not to wander. Why did you run away again? Poppy's face clouded. I didn't wander, Miss Elizabeth, I promise. I saw Mr Darcy walking by, so I followed him. I glanced up into his eyes, those chocolate depths that I had learned to trust above all others, and he gave me a sheepish little smile. I believe she's telling the truth. I was walking rather fast, trying to make headway through the crowd. It was some minutes before I realised that she was only a few feet away. I sighed in mock exasperation and stood up, Poppy's hand clasped firmly in mine. Well, perhaps we will count this as an improvement, at least you knew to find someone safe. But from now on, for the love of all that is holy, please say something to me before disappearing to follow Mr Darcy around the port. Yes? Poppy's face broke into an easy grin, her freckles dancing, and the gap between her front teeth shining proudly up at me. Yes, Miss Lizzie. 24. Darcy Four days we'd lost, waiting in Livorno for some way back home. And Campbell was no help, for he was beset by troubles of his own. We could very well be stuck here another month if the tides of war turned ill. And all that while, Lord Holt and his allies would continue to profit off their endeavours, building the wall of unimpeachability higher around themselves, until no one could trail their misdeeds. And so here I was back in port again today, the heavy scent of the bay assaulting my senses, and the jostle of bodies pressing in like the denizens of Meryton during a public assembly. I neared the captain of a sizable merchant vessel, its sails fluttering in anticipation, signalling an imminent departure. Captain, I need to get to England immediately. It is a matter of utmost importance. The captain, a grizzled man whose face bore the map of his many sea voyages, squinted at me. Every man and his dog wants passage to England. Why should I favour you? I have vital information about those who betrayed England. It may be too late to put Pandora back in her box, but I certainly can testify against the ones who opened the lid. But I must get back to London to do it. There was a flicker of interest in his eyes, but he remained guarded. Oh, many claim to have vital information, Mr. Darcy, Fitzwilliam Darcy. He nodded, sizing me up. 
You expect me to risk my vessel, my crew, for your word? I do not ask you to take me near dangerous waters, and I assure you, Captain, the information I carry is not only genuine but crucial. There are men out there profiting off lost lives, off the risks you and your crew are forced to take. Let me see justice done. He seemed to ponder over it for a moment before his expression softened a fraction. All very well, Mr Darcy. If it is as you say, I'll take you. We sail on the next tide for Barcelona, if the port be favourable. Lisbon, if not. Relief surged through me, but then reality dawned. I appreciate your understanding, Captain, but there's a small detail I must mention. I am accompanied by a lady and three young children. His eyebrows shot skyward. Bloody hell! A woman and children! I can pay you exceedingly well. It's not a matter of the blooming pay. Where are we to put them? On this ship? This isn't a blessed nursery. They are hardy, sir, and shall not cause any bother. We do not need fine accommodations. I've got no accommodations. I was going to offer you a hammock with the men whenever one of them is not in it. This is a naval supply vessel, Mr Darcy, not a passenger ship. I understand, Captain, but I cannot leave them behind. The... I floundered, and then inspiration struck. The children are the daughters of one of the traitors. Their testimony is vital. The captain rolled his eyes. A bleeding nursery, he spat. I wouldn't even have a space for them. They'd have to bed down between the rice and flour sacks in the old. And blind me if we haven't got a hideous rat problem just now. I shuddered. Rats? Egad, I could not ask that of Elizabeth and the girls. What if they fell ill? The very thought of it made me sick. I started to shake my head and back away, but before I could respond, I heard Elizabeth's voice over my shoulder. Captain, I assure you, we are not expecting fine linens and a four-course dinner. In fact, I understand that the rats make for a delicious meal when roasted properly. I turned to gawk at her. I wasn't even aware that she had somehow followed me, and to hear her say something so vile. What are you doing? I hissed. She only spared me a light smirk, then lifted her eyebrows toward the captain. He stared at her, taken aback. Then a knowing grin crept onto his lips. Well, aren't you the brazen one? He flicked a finger toward me. Is this your woman, Darcy? I smiled, my eyes still on hers. I think, Captain, that it is I who belong to her. I turned back to him. There must be something you can do. The captain sighed and braced his hands on his hips. The well, best I can offer you is the galley. It's not much, but there is a work table and a few feet of floor space. And it's the deck above the old, so fewer uh, unpleasantries. But I mean it when I say it's nothing fine. Elizabeth's eyes sparkled. Oh, Captain, after what we've been through, it might as well be a ballroom. The captain let out a chuckle, shaking his head. Oh, very well. Fetch your young ones and come aboard. But don't say I didn't warn you. An hour later, we returned to the ship with our handful of belongings and the girls. Most of our clothing had been abandoned on Elba, but it didn't look like we would have had room for trunks anyway. The accommodations the captain led us to were, to put it mildly, sparse and cramped. A dimly lit corner surrounded by crates and smelling like poultry and fish. It was hardly what one would call comfortable. But as I took in the tight space, Elizabeth's hand found mine, squeezing it reassuringly. Looks cosy, doesn't it? she whispered. I bent down to murmur in her ear. It looks like you'll have to sleep on my lap. Her eyebrows climbed her forehead. Well, ah, uh, that could prove interesting. I grimaced. It would be a lot more interesting if we were already married. A pity we could not settle that before we sailed. She got a wicked grin. Maybe the captain can do it. Well, that's a myth, Elizabeth. Besides, I wrapped my arm around her and kissed the tip of her collarbone, then let my lips trail up her neck, where her pulse beat the strongest. I want to ask your father for the right to marry his daughter. You deserve that honour. I want to see you walking down the aisle to me like a lady, all proud and stunning, with your family surrounding you, and that smile that makes my insides turn to jelly. 
and I want my first night with you to be in our home, in a real bed. Who needs a real bed when you can have this? Elizabeth wedged herself between the bulkhead and my hip bones, tucking her feet against an oak barrel and propping her head on my chest. Well, I'm glad you at least are comfortable. I grunted and tried to shift, but every position felt somehow worse than the last. Elizabeth chuckled softly, her laughter causing pleasant vibrations against my chest. Well, I'm not sneezing here. Comfort is a relative term, Mr Darcy. I attempted to adjust again, a sharp corner of a crate digging into my back. Relative indeed. At least the girls are asleep. Good heavens, does Poppy always snore that loudly? Always, she whispered, as she pressed the softest of kisses to my throat. Are you certain you would not have preferred one of those hammocks the captain mentioned? Oh, yes, the hammocks. It turns out that I am too tall for any of them. She laughed. You are not. On my honour, my feet hang over the end by a good eight inches, and I'm not certain where a man's head is supposed to go. She propped up on her elbow and trailed a finger in lazy circles over my chest. They fold themselves up or let their feet hang off the end. Surely you could master it if you tried. Perhaps. In all seriousness, I did ask after a hammock, but it seems we were not the only extras the captain took on board. He probably expected his hands to be pressed into naval service the moment we encountered an English frigate, so he'd gone around the port hiring every fisherman and swab boy he could find. I doubt there will often be a hammock available, as they all take their turns. Hmm, more is the pity. However, will you get a wink of sleep? She kept tracing light figures on my shirt, and she let her chin fall to my chest. I raised a brow. I shall bear up the best I can. And what of you, Elizabeth? Do you expect to sleep well? Not for a while. She climbed a little further up my chest, pinching my spine somewhere between my spleen and a plank of stout English oak. I'm suddenly not feeling very fatigued. How oh, very interesting. I braced my arm under her elbows, helping her to hoist herself up on my thighs, then swept my hands down the delicious lines of her body. Oh, sweet mother of mercy, how was I to survive two weeks, lying next to her every night, but unable to really touch her the way I ached to? Well, perhaps I could touch her a little. I am not half so weary as I ought to be. I sighed against her lips. How terribly convenient it is to have you so close. She looked up at me, her eyes shimmering like the moonlit sea outside. Very close. Fizzy. A warm laugh erupted from me. I had hoped she'd save that silly moniker for private moments, and hearing her voice it just as she'd promised was more delightful than I could have imagined. But as I tried to shift to pull her up for a proper kiss, my elbow bumped the lantern, which teetered dangerously close to the edge of a crate. Elizabeth reached out, barely catching it in time. We both held our breaths. Me, mostly because her... Uh, well, the soft parts of her were smothering my face. Elizabeth hissed in dismay and clambered backward, narrowly missing my soft parts in the process. Perhaps, she murmured, setting the lantern safely away. Our first real night together should be somewhere less flammable. I let out a relieved sigh, pulling her head up under my chin. You have no idea how I pictured our first night, Somewhere luxurious, silken sheets, the soft glow of candles, certainly without the danger of setting ourselves alight. She snorted with laughter, trying to stifle it with her hand. Oh, that sounds glorious, though I must admit I do not mind our current situation so very much. A darkened hallway, a table at the inn, or anywhere without prying eyes. All I really need is this. She stretched up into my arms, and kiss me the way I'd meant to kiss her a moment ago. Drawing her into a gentle embrace, I felt her heart beat against mine, two rhythms blending into one. As long as we're together, Elizabeth, every place, no matter how sparse or flammable, will be my dream come true. Elizabeth. The tide had shifted beneath our feet, which meant that yet another port of call drew the ship close to shore, 
but this should be the last one. In just a few more days, the captain had promised the wide banks of the Thames would be welcoming us home. About blasted time. In the confined space below deck, as I assisted her into her dress, the laces and buttons were stubborn, and the weak light from the lantern was very little help. Are we nearly there, Elizabeth? Soon, love. Hold still, please. The cook is probably very eager to have his galley back. Oh, do stop squirming so I can... There. I blew out a sigh. Now we can go up and see how close we are to land. Not close enough, Emily grumbled. If I never see the ocean or eat another fish again, it will be too soon. I find that difficult to argue with. Will you please help your sister with her cloak? I glanced around the little galley to be sure I had gathered all our belongings, for the day. It was just before six bells, and Fitzwilliam had already gone above deck, so I could help the girls dress. This had been our routine every morning. We had to find somewhere else to be by the time the cook swung out of his hammock for the day. That meant that we were most often upon the deck, or clustered around the little mess table, when the sailors were not taking their meals. It had been mostly a wet, cold, dirty and miserable voyage— except for those quiet times when I found myself in Fitzwilliam's arms. But not once had Emily complained about the cold, and Poppy had never tangled in the sail ropes or pitched overboard, so it was not as bad as it might have been. As I gathered up my extra petticoat and rolled it into a cloak, a clutch of letters tied with a blue ribbon slipped out of the bundle. I paused to pick them up and flick my fingers affectionately over the thick folds. The letters from my family... All I had when I left them behind to become a governess. Fitzwilliam had found them in my trunk on Elba. I had made certain to thank him handsomely for thinking to bring them. He knew how much those letters meant to me. It wasn't just the act of retrieving them. It was the understanding that he wanted to put back what I had given up, to mend what was broken, even if he had to learn to love my mother to do it. And to think, I had once considered him arrogant... Taking a deep breath and holding the letters close, I ushered the girls to the deck. The ship's boards creaked underfoot, and the song of the gulls heralded our approach to land. Fitzwilliam was standing at the bow, talking to the captain. The captain turned and tipped his hat when the girls and I approached. "'Good morning, Miss Bennet. Oh, he was just telling Mr Darcy that we mayn't stop at Guernsey. Oh, he won't put in at La Havre just now. I cannot risk my cargo.' but we need fresh water and whatever current information we can get about naval movements. I glanced out over the bow. The morning light was weak, but I thought I could sketch out the outline of an island in the distance. How long once we leave Guernsey before we reach London? I asked. Oh, three days at most. It should be a fair passage. Thank you, Captain. Fitzwilliam tipped his hat and offered me one arm, while Poppy made free to dangle from his other. "'Nearly there, ladies,' he said cheerfully. "'What shall we do first as soon as we reach London?' "'Pastries!' Poppy cried, swinging from Fitzwilliam's arm. "'Excellent idea,' he agreed. Bee slipped her hand into mine. "'I want to go to Hatchard's,' she confided. I glanced at her in surprise. Fitzwilliam's eyes met mine, but by mutual accord neither of us said what we both noticed.' She didn't stutter. I just smiled and squeezed her hand. I could do with a few new books too. What about you, Emily? She tilted her head, her mouth puckered to the side. I just want to know what's going to happen next. Ooh, I'd let Fitzwilliam answer that one. He glanced at me again, then slipped his arm from mine so he could walk beside Emily. I wish I could tell you. But so long as I am able, I will see that you and your sisters are cared for. You have my word, Miss Emily. Her brow crumpled. Then she squinted up at him. She said nothing. But when he offered her his arm, a little smile warmed her face. Hesitantly, she shot me a look, as if to ask my permission. When I nodded, she swallowed and wrapped her hand over his sleeve. They had proceeded several steps. When I saw her tighten her grip and look up at him again with a choked whisper. Thank you. 25. Elizabeth A few hours later, the ship made its stop at Guernsey. 
We loitered on the deck, trying to stay out of the way of the sailors who were taking on fresh water barrels, fruits, salt, and whatever other supplies the captain deemed necessary. The girls had huddled in a corner by the stern, playing some game with a rock and a piece of chalk, while Fitzwilliam and I idly watched the people passing below. Suddenly I felt him stiffen beside me. "'What is it?' I asked. "'Wendell Calvin,' he breathed. He leaned forward, his eyes narrowed as if to ascertain what he'd seen. "'Why, it is him. What the devil?' He was off at once, following the gunwale as far as he could, his eyes fixed on the man walking below on the dock. I followed until he stopped abruptly at a stream of sailors passing in front of him with cargo. "'Blast! Where did he go?' It was a moment before our path was clear again, but when it was, Fitzwilliam tugged me by the hand toward the plank and the captain, who stood at the rail talking to someone. "'This is not a passenger vessel,' the captain was protesting. "'I've no room at all. Why, I already—' He broke off when we approached. "'Calvin!' Fitzwilliam stepped forward, putting his hand out to the stranger. "'Of all the places to see you—' The man was tall, with an angular face, and no hair under his hat, but when he recognised Fitzwilliam, his features softened so that he looked like a different person. "'Darcy, by Jove, you're just the friend I want!' "'I was wondering if you got out of Paris,' Fitzwilliam said. "'Where is Mrs. Calvin? Is she safe?' "'Yes, yes, down at the market waiting for me. Darcy, we've got to get to London. I'll be wanted by the commissioners, but we've been stranded here for days, and there are no ships available.' "'And we've no place on board,' the captain put in. "'As I was saying, we've already... "'Well, hold on,' Fitzwilliam interrupted. "'Might Mrs. Calvin shelter in the galley with Miss Bennet and the children?' "'The captain blinked and drew a sigh. "'His eyes narrowed at Fitzwilliam. "'Oh, perhaps. "'And you lost a few hands when that frigate pressed them into service. "'Calvin and I can probably find hammocks for ourselves. "'I will make it worth your while, Captain.' The captain scowled and shook his head. He glared at the deck for a moment, then shook his head yet again and waved a hand. "'Oh, you might bloody well. Stay out from underfoot,' he warned Calvin, then stalked off. Calvin let out a sigh of heartfelt relief. "'Well, you are a lifesaver, Darcy. I'll fetch Mary and—' He paused as if he'd just noticed me standing there. His eyebrows pushed his hat up his head— and he glanced at Fitzwilliam, then back at me, and smiled. "'I beg your pardon, ma'am. Are you going to introduce me, Darcy?' Fitzwilliam wrapped an arm around my waist, pulling me close. "'Miss Elizabeth Bennet, meet Wendell Calvin, an old friend. Miss Bennet is soon to be Mrs. Darcy.' He had never introduced me like that before, and the pride in his voice sent a thrill down my spine. "'Mr. Calvin,' I greeted with a smile— "'It is a pleasure to make your acquaintance.' "'Oh, likewise, Miss Bennet. Oh, "'Wait until I tell Mrs. Calvin. "'She's been fretting over this one since she met him as a youth.' "'He tipped his hat. "'I'll not be ten minutes, Darcy. "'Then I have a feeling you have a deal to tell after your travels.' "'You are too kind, Miss Bennet. "'Why, I think Mr. Calvin would have hung himself off the boat anchor "'if we'd not found some way back to London.' Mrs. Calvin tugged her shawl back over her shoulders as she and I climbed back on the main deck together. She was a merry sort of woman, and something in her smile reminded me of Aunt Gardner. She was easy to adore at first meeting. Oh, I had nothing to do with it. It was all Mr. Darcy's idea, but I am so glad he thought of it. He was always the dearest lad. I declare, when those boys stayed with us, it was always young Fitzwilliam looking out for his comrades— "'keeping them out of trouble or bringing them back home "'when they'd found it despite him. "'You have yourself a lovely young man, Miss Bennet.' "'I grinned. "'Don't I, though? "'I still cannot decide what fortune or whim fell my way. "'Who would have thought he would set his mind on me? "'But you will see I am perfectly ridiculously enamoured with him, "'and I'm quite determined that I shall be the happiest woman in England "'just as soon as we get there.' "'Mrs. Calvin laughed.' Oh, we cannot be so much longer, and I am thankful to meet a friendly face and to have a little corner to sleep in until we reach home. You may not be so thankful when we all have to squeeze into that galley together. It is rather intimo, as the Italians say, and Poppy snores. So does Mr. Calvin. I laughed. 
Well, it is only two or three more days. Surely we can suffer that long. Mrs Calvin smiled and spread her skirts. Well, Miss Bennet, shall we see where the gentlemen have got to? I'd wager poor Darcy will be relieved to have us interrupt whatever my husband is going on about now. By all means. I followed her, but when we saw the gentlemen on deck, they looked as if they were deep in some important conversation. We stopped, and I leaned against the gunwale, close enough to catch their words, yet far enough to give them a semblance of privacy. Mrs. Calvin seemed to be as keenly interested in whatever they were saying as I was, and we both held our breaths to hear better. "'It will not be easy,' Wendell was saying, rubbing his chin thoughtfully. "'I'm familiar with Lord Holt and his reputation. Iron, spices, broadcloth, gunpowder. The man has tentacles in a dozen quarters. Oh, to accuse him of treason, something so monstrous, it's too big for most to grasp. They cannot see beyond his title and his reputation as a solid Englishman.' Darcy's eyes flicked to me for just a fraction of a second before he responded. His reputation is not my concern, Wendell. I understand the risks, but there is more at play than just political games. He's used and manipulated innocent lives to harm more people, just to turn a profit. His gaze found mine again. He's hurt those dear to me. Wendell's eyes followed Darcy's gaze, landing on me. A look of comprehension dawned. You have personal stakes in this, more than you know, Darcy murmured, his voice carrying just enough for me to hear. He used his own children, he used Elizabeth, and he used me. I'll not see him keep his spoils. Wendell nodded and cleared his throat. Oh, very well. We shall begin with the financials. If he has aided Napoleon, there will be records, transfers, investments. If you're correct in your suspicions, we will find a trail. And you have the means to track this? With the right resources and contacts, yes. Though it might not be straightforward, we need to be discreet. And you are the best man for the job. It's not just about national security, Wendell. It's personal. I understand, Darcy. And now, let us not keep our ladies waiting for us any longer, shall we? Fitzwilliam smiled and nodded to his friend, then turned and walked straight for me. He took my hand, put it on his arm, and drew me close to his side. Calvin thinks it can be done. I nodded. Good, I whispered back. But what of the girls? He glanced over his shoulder to where the girls were, still at their game, and turned back to me. I have an idea to protect their futures, but I'll need Richard's help. Bloody devil owes me something. Darcy. The familiar streets of London unfurled before our carriage, yet everything felt different. It wasn't just the city, it was the air, the sky, and the beating of my heart. Everything was heightened. My home awaited, and for the first time in my life I was bringing someone to it, whom I hoped would come to love it as deeply as I did. I tried to see the house through Elizabeth's eyes. How would she find it? Not daunting, surely, one who had faced down Napoleon Bonaparte himself in his own dining room. She would have my household at her feet within moments, and anyone else who mattered was only a matter of time. But would the house give her pleasure? Or would it be one more thing to force her courage to rise, when she would much rather not? She sat beside me, peering out of the window, her face illuminated by the occasional gaslight we passed. Oh, this will not do at all, she murmured. I leaned closer to hear her better as she was turned toward the glass. I beg your pardon? Elizabeth was shaking her head. Oh, no, not at all. Only look there, see? I peered over her shoulder at the darkening streets and then looked curiously at her. I do not see anything. What, have you spotted more unicorns? She laughed and tangled her hand with mine. I'm sorry to say that no, I have not. But where is the public garden, or the seafront promenade? Where are the cosy little inns and noisy fish markets? And where are the fruit stands, where a gentleman can purchase a cluster of grapes for a lady? I narrowed my eyes. That was not one of my more cherished memories of these last few weeks. She laughed and tightened her hand through mine. But you were more relaxed, and smiled more easily with fruit stains on your coat, 
than you are near your own home. You were positively a stone just now. Are you even breathing? I peeled my lips back from my teeth in an attempt at a smile. Is that better? That is, without a doubt, the most painful grimace I have ever seen. She rested a hand on my cheek and brought me close for a gentle kiss. There, she whispered. That is better. What was it? Worried that the war has come to your door already? No, I was worried that you would not like your future home. She laughed softly and kissed me again. How could I not love what is yours? Well, London is... I stiffened and looked outside again as the carriage turned onto my street. We have nearly arrived. Elizabeth turned to look up at the grand facade of the townhouses along the row. Oh, good heavens, she gasped. I nearly forgot how... She cleared her throat and covered her mouth with her fingertips. What is it? Too much? I asked in faint alarm. I assure you it is not... I am teasing you again, Fitzwilliam. It is only a house. I took a long breath and squeezed her hand. Indeed. I will have the housekeeper assist you and the girls in refreshing yourselves. It is fortunate that we shall have Mr. and Mrs. Calvin for some chaperonage, but I fear we must manage your stay discreetly. I flicked my eyes to the girls, all three of whom were so exhausted that they had fallen asleep in the carriage. She swallowed and sighed. Indeed, I do hope you will be able to secure a good situation for them. It would be dreadful if they were ruined along with their father. What do you think can be done? That will all depend on their parents. I lifted her hand to kiss it. But they are not my only worry. Shall we go to Hertfordshire tomorrow morning? I could send your father an express this very evening if you like. Oh, do not do that. It will terrify Mamma so. Let us just go as soon as possible. Though I fear it will mean we must be parted for a time. How odious. I smiled. Am I truly hearing this? The woman who ran from me now does not wish to leave my side. Well, it is only that I'd got so used to being with you. You are a dreadfully convenient person to know, Fitzwilliam. I am glad you feel that way. I returned dryly. But of course, and now I shall not have you near to lend me your handkerchief or to pillow my head on your arm. Oh dear, only think if the tabbies of London found out I slept in a ship's galley with you. Well, as they say, what they do not know. Before I could say anything else, the door was opened, and it was time to show Elizabeth her future home. Stepping out, I extended my hand to assist Elizabeth and the girls as she roused them. My heart pounded as they took in the sight of the house, and I found myself holding my breath, awaiting Elizabeth's reaction. And it was everything I could have hoped for. Her eyes scanned upward, lighting in admiration. But then she turned to me and smiled. It is fine, Fitzwilliam, she whispered, and all the more lovely because it is yours. Well, those were words to toast a man's heart. The footman bowed at the door, and the butler was beside him at once, assisting me with my coat and hat himself. Welcome home, Mr. Darcy. It is a relief to see you return safely. I nodded and gave my arm to Elizabeth. Thank you, Giles. Allow me to introduce Miss Elizabeth Bennet of Hertfordshire, my future wife. I gestured to the Holt sisters. And these are my wards, Emily, Beatrice and Penelope. They will be our guests this evening, so please inform the housekeeper. There will be another carriage along shortly with Mr. and Mrs. Wendell Calvin. Calvin was my father's friend, so see that he is accorded every respect. Giles beamed with pleasure. Understood, Mr. Darcy. He made a faint gesture, and two maids came forward to assist the ladies, while another went for the housekeeper. Lord Palmer and Colonel Fitzwilliam are in the study, sir. I expect you will wish to speak with them. I stopped. What? I thought they were in Bath. Then where is... William? Georgiana's voice echoed down the hall. I turned, and there was my little sister, running like a hoyden toward me with her arms outstretched. Oh, William, it is you. Georgiana, what are you doing here? She raced into my arms and squealed with delight as I picked her up and planted a kiss on her cheek. Oh, we were so worried when we heard about Napoleon's escape. Lord Palmer thought we ought to return to London, and Richard came and... However did you get... She stopped when she saw Elizabeth and looked curiously at me. 
William? I grinned and took Elizabeth's hand. Georgiana, allow me to present my affianced and your future sister, Miss Elizabeth Bennet. Miss Bennet, my sister Georgiana. Georgiana blinked for a few seconds, then squeaked in surprise and covered her mouth. The Elizabeth Bennet? The only one I'm aware of, Elizabeth laughed. But how is it you are familiar with my name? Oh, William wrote to me of you. Last year at Rosings, he said... She broke off when I shot her a warning glare. Elizabeth lifted a brow. Said what? Georgiana cleared her throat and caught her skirt in a nervous fit. Ah, he said you played well. Oh, I fear that was a dreadful bit of exaggeration on his part, Miss Darcy. But go on. She gave me a teasing wink. What else did he say? That he, uh... Georgiana blinked at me and cringed. Well, he wrote that you were an extensive reader, and how you liked to walk the grounds, and seemed not to be troubled by unwholesome weather, and how he admired your wit, and the way you walked, and how he enjoyed dancing with you when he was at Netherfield, and... Yes, yes, I am sure Miss Elizabeth understands you quite clearly, I interrupted. Elizabeth chuckled. Goodness, Fitzwilliam, did you write all this out in plain English, or was it encoded in more of your Chinese sketches? Oh, plain English, Georgiana answered for me. At least a page worth, every letter for several months. But he did include a sketch of your eyes where he... She closed her mouth when I glared her into silence. I believe I have made my admiration of Miss Bennet plain enough, I grumbled. No need to recall every detail. Elizabeth was fighting back a giggle, her eyes fairly dancing. We shall have to speak more later, Miss Darcy, she whispered. I'm looking forward to seeing that sketch. Oh, there was more than one. I've not told you about the one he did after he spent an afternoon in the library at Netherfield. He did not identify the lady in the sketch, but she was engrossed in a book and posed so very prettily, and so I assume it must have been... I groaned. Georgiana, darling, please let Miss Bennet and the children retire upstairs. And I think I hear another carriage now. That will be Mr and Mrs Calvin. Do see to their comfort, will you? I believe I will greet Lord Palmer and Richard. Good God, Darcy, you're alive! Richard exclaimed, leaping to his feet. We thought we'd lost you. No such luck, but I'm afraid I have run up a very long list of your debts. Oh, consider them paid. You just now landed. Indeed. I greeted Lord Palmer, who had risen to his feet just after Richard. Thank you for welcoming Miss Darcy, my lord. I appreciate you bringing her home safely. Lord Palmer shook my hand. Of course, Darcy. Your timing is impeccable, for I only meant to speak with Colonel Fitzwilliam for a few moments before going to my townhouse. We just arrived this evening ourselves. Well, what news do you bring? Richard demanded. Were you in the thick of it? And tell me you were not on Elba when that devil made his escape. In fact, I was. I shall save the details of that for another time. But we bribed a fishing vessel to take us back to Livorno. We? Oui. I cracked a weak smile. Ah, yes, there is much to tell you. Firstly, however, I need some answers. Richard's brow furrowed. But Darcy? I held up a hand to forestall his questions. There are more pressing matters at hand than the ships I bribed, cousin. Are you familiar with Baron Holt? They glanced at each other. Lord Palmer swallowed what remained in his brandy glass and frowned. I know him by reputation, and a nasty one it is. There are rumours, Richard added cautiously. I suspect you will find they are all true. I bore witness to the man's deeds up close. He was at least partially responsible for securing Napoleon's escape. Richard's expression hardened. Well, the blighter! What do you mean to do? I want him tried. But it is a delicate matter, Richard, because the man has three daughters. I would see to their protection so they do not share the fate of their parents. Can it be done? He drank in a long breath. Perhaps, but accusing someone like Lord Holt publicly of treason is a very serious thing, Darcy. If you declare this and cannot prove it, you will be ruined yourself. Do you have any evidence? Before I could answer, the door to the drawing room opened, and Wendell Calvin stepped through. 
Richard's face went from surprise to recognition. Calvin! He glanced at me. By thunder, what has it been? Ten years? Calvin nodded. Indeed, Colonel Fitzwilliam, my cellars still have not recovered. Richard bellowed with laughter. Still the same old Calvin, and what brings you here with Darcy? Calvin and I shared a glance. He's going to help us, Richard. No one can sort Holt's business dealings like he can. I already know where I mean to start, Calvin added. I know Holt is invested in iron and coal. I saw his name often enough on supply contracts. If memory serves, he was also supplying the army with material for uniforms and gunpowder. He stood to lose a deal of money when the treaty was signed. A thorough investigation ought to uncover the improved state of his investments. And with Mr Darcy's testimony about his nefarious actions, oh, and keeping company with a French spy, it will be difficult for any court not to bring him to a fair trial at least. Richard frowned, then nodded. If Calvin believes he can track Holt's finances, then I trust his judgment. I assume you mean to ask for my assistance from the military end of things. That is precisely what I meant to ask, yes. And were you not assisting the General in setting up private trusts in the name of certain high-ranking widows? I may need your help there. His eyes narrowed. Ah, I see your intent. You want to funnel some of Holt's assets assuming they're seized, and toward his children. Exactly. I sighed and smiled thinly at my cousin and Lord Palmer. Fatigue was settling into my bones, and the longing for my bed and an end to all the madness of the past two months was like a lead weight on my eyelids. I appreciate it, gentlemen, but for now Calvin and I would like to retire. We have had a long journey. Richard clapped me on the shoulder. Of course, we'll speak more on the morrow. I'm afraid not, I replied, smiling a little more. I'm off to Hertfordshire. Richard looked puzzled. Hertfordshire? Whatever for? A soft chuckle escaped my lips. Why, to ask Mr. Bennet for his daughter's hand in marriage, of course. 26. Elizabeth. The carriage wheels crunched on familiar gravel and I stole a glance outside the window. Longbourn's main house, the only home I had ever known, lay shadowed by new leaves on the old oak trees in the distance. But it was not my home any longer, and I did not wish to see it closer. The carriage rolled on toward the dower house, and I choked back a sigh. Beside me, Fitzwilliam took my hand. It will be well, Elizabeth. We will try to set it right. I sucked in a trembling breath. It is not the house. My last words to my mother gave her terrible pain. And Papa. Oh, I know how dreadful he felt when we had to lease our home. But I simply had to make that last remark about how it could all have been avoided if he'd only... I broke off and clamped my teeth into my lip. I truly was awful, Fitzwilliam. I only pray they can forgive me. Well? He peered beyond me through the carriage window. You managed to forgive me. I should say there are many things more impossible. He squeezed my hand and kissed it. They will be overjoyed to see you, Elizabeth. Jane will. Jane doesn't know the meaning of the word resentment. But I assure you Mary does, and she will take a dim view of me riding in your carriage with you. Even with such excellent chaperones as we have. I glanced at the girls on the opposite seat, Poppy, with her head rocked back and her mouth open in such a snore that I was afraid she might spook the horses. B, her feet swinging idly as she gulped down the pages of whatever book she had borrowed from Fitzwilliam's library. And Emily, smiling at me. That was all. No pithy remarks, no sarcastic commentary. Just an open, honest smile, like one might offer a friend. And it was enough. As the carriage neared the dower house, my heart squeezed. I did not even wish to look out the window. This was the place my family had been reduced to. Only three bedrooms for all of them. No library for Papa, no sewing room for Mamma, no larder full of sweets for Kitty, or piano for Mary, and no quiet rooms to escape to for Jane. And no help, but a single maid of all work. Mrs Hill would have stayed behind to run the main house. How Mamma must feel the judgment of her neighbours. I cared nothing for my family's wealth or pride, 
but the feelings of loss and regret must be painful indeed. Well then, I closed my eyes, felt Fitzwilliam's reassuring hand covering mine as the driver opened the door of the carriage. No sense in delay. It seems rather... He cleared his throat. Um, quiet. Are you sure your mother lives here? I scowled. No teasing, Fitzwilliam, you promised. I promised only to consider your feelings above all else. And just now it is you who are drawing up to a house, looking as if you might faint. He touched my chin. Courage, Elizabeth. Courage, I muttered. Right, here goes. It was strange that no one had opened the door yet. Kitty never failed to spot approaching carriages, and she could hardly miss one as large as Mr Darcy's, especially in such a small house. If not Kitty, Mamma surely would have identified the sound of a rich man coming for one of her daughters. I stood on the step and sucked in one last breath before I knocked. But when the door opened, it was not one of my sisters or even my parents. It was Sarah, the scullery maid from Longbourn. She was holding a mop in her hand, and her eyes widened like a fish when she saw me. Miss Elizabeth, is that really you? Yes, Sarah, but... I strained to look past her. Why, the house looked empty. Where is everyone? Oh, she gasped. Back in the main house. Such a thing. Oh, but you must see. What? Did they not lease it after all? Oh, aye, they did, but then they didn't. Miss Bennet, she saved them, Mrs Bennet says, and Mr Bennet. Sarah, slow down. What is this about Jane saving them? Oh, to be sure she did. Why, I never saw Mrs Bennet so... Oh, but you'll want to see for yourself. It's quite the thing, Miss Elizabeth, quite the thing indeed. Fitzwilliam was already tugging at my arm, which was probably for the best, because my feet didn't seem to know what to do next. Come, Elizabeth, I believe a visit to the main house is in order. I gulped and nodded. In, Indeed. I'm going to lose my temper. I just know it. I'm going to stomp in there and demand of my mother what she has done, and then I will sit down and have a fearful cry over it all. Over what? You don't even know what happened, Fitzwilliam replied. Blast the man, he was so rottingly reasonable sounding. But the last thing in the world I wanted to be right now was reasonable. I do indeed. Mamma probably cried her eyes out for days when she had to do her own cooking and cleaning. I don't even have to ask because I know precisely how it was. Jane felt dreadful that Mamma was so upset and she went and married that butcher just to appease her. Oh, if Mamma tries to brag about Jane's conquest, I'll... I'll... Elizabeth, you are leaping to an extra conclusion or two that is not warranted. How could a butcher afford to return your family to Longbourn House? If Miss Bennet did marry, it would have to be someone with a rather comfortable income. Which only makes it worse, I protested. She is so beautiful. You know she could have attracted almost anyone. But what man of good character and sense would take her with almost no dowry, one ruined sister and another sister in service? No one worthy of her, I can assure you. The only man she ever cared for was... I sucked in a breath and snapped my eyes away. I know very well who he was, Fitzwilliam replied heavily, and I must bear my share of the blame for her unhappiness. I know you will lay it at my feet, for he did himself. I shook my head and reclaimed his hand. No, what's done is done. Mr Bingley could have returned for her if he had cared, but he never did. It is not your fault. My teeth clenched again but I do mean to find out what Mamma has done. Before I could even knock, the door swung open to reveal a whirlwind named Kitty. She nearly bowled me over as she threw herself into my arms. Lizzie! Her voice reached an octave I was sure only dogs could hear. You've got my letter! I tried to gasp and push her back so I could see her face. Letter? What? Oh, Kitty, I cannot breathe. But you can talk just fine. Oh, I'm just dizzy with delight to see you. Won't Mamma be pleased? And oh, you won't believe the new bonnet I've got. It's positively divine. The ribbon, the lace, it screams fashion. I simply cannot wait to wear it in town. You must try it. It would look ravishing on you. I was reeling from her fierce embrace and the onslaught of words. And I pulled back slightly, trying to catch my breath. Kitty, I gasped out, laughing despite myself. Have you been eating all the sweets again? 
I've barely stepped through the door. She pouted playfully, her hands on her hips. Oh, but Lydia has gone off to Newcastle and Mary never cared for my bonnets. You simply must see it. Oh, and I've got a new gown to show you too. And don't say you haven't time for that sort of thing because... She smirked, eyeing my travel-worn attire. You look like you are in desperate need of something new. Heavens, what did you do to your hems this time? Thank you for noticing, Kitty. I... I faltered when Mary emerged from the shadow of the hallway with somewhat more dignity than Kitty. She peered at me with that steady, slightly judging look I knew all too well. "'Why is Mr Darcy behind you?' she asked, her voice dark with suspicion. "'And who are those children?' I glanced back at Fitzwilliam, the thin grimace that most would say passed for a smile, the patient way he raised his brows, letting me reply. "'Mary, it's... complicated,' Where are Mamma and Papa? Oh, Mamma's taking tea with Mrs. Long and Aunt Phillips, Mary replied, her gaze never wavering from Darcy. And Papa's in his study, as always. I closed my eyes and took a bracing breath. I must speak with him. Mary, Kitty, these are Emily, Bee and Poppy. Will you please look after them while I go to Papa? They've had a trying journey and could use some kindness. Kitty nodded eagerly, sizing the girls up to decide who would become her most ready confidant. Naturally, her eyes gravitated toward Poppy. Of course, Lizzie. Come, dears, let's find that bonnet and some refreshments. You look like a girl who would look perfectly delicious in lavender, she said to Poppy. Mary rolled her eyes but followed after them, not, however, without a final, blatantly curious glance over her shoulder at Mr Darcy. My palms were aching with perspiration, and my heart was turning funny flips. Would he even speak to me? I approached my father's study door, with Fitzwilliam following closely. My hand hovered over the door handle, anxiety twisting in my chest. The memory of the last words we'd spoken stung my ears even now. I bit my lip and knocked. "'Whatever it is you're asking for, I'm not buying. No more tea, no more lace.' In heaven's name, no more bonnets, and I swear if I have to hear another blasted piano concerto. I sucked in a last breath and called out hesitantly, Papa, it's... it's me, Elizabeth. Silence. Thick, heavy silence that seemed to stretch into an eternity. The creak of his chair echoed faintly. Suddenly the door swung open, and there he was, the lines on his face deeper, his hair greyer, but those familiar eyes brimming with a mixture of astonishment and raw emotion. Lizzie, he whispered, as if saying it louder might make me evaporate. His hands reached out, cradling my face. Is it truly you, my child? That was enough to batter down the last ramparts. The dam burst at last, and tears flooded my face. Papa, I choked out. I am so sorry. But he hushed me, pulling me into a tight embrace, as if to reassure himself that I was really there. Oh, my Lizzie, my child, you are come home at last. I was so afraid I might not see you again. I could hardly breathe. My father's arms were squeezing me so tightly, and he was trembling so. But the last thing in the world I wanted to do was to pull away. But after a moment he stiffened and drew back himself. "'You have not come alone, I see,' he murmured in a strange voice. Fitzwilliam was lingering some steps behind me in the hall, shifting awkwardly from one foot to the other. Clearing my throat, I broke the hug and gestured toward him. "'Papa, this is—' "'I recognise Mr Darcy,' Papa interrupted, his gaze moving from surprise to a more contemplative look. He extended a hand. You brought my daughter home? Fitzwilliam took my father's hand, his gaze now steady. Yes, sir. Papa's eyes shifted to me. Then I fancy you have something to say. Come in, Mr Darcy, come in. He held the study door for us, then removed his glasses to wipe them with his handkerchief. Excuse me, if you please, sir. Sit, sit, please. I thought my favourite daughter lost to us forever. Ah! He cleared his throat and glanced at me. Does he know? I rested a hand on my father's arm. 
Yes, Papa, I've told him everything, about Lydia and Mr. Wickham, about leasing out Longbourn, and how I ran away to enter service. He knows all that and a great deal more. My father's eyes fell to the floor, and he took in a trembling sigh. I imagine it is now for me to hear all that has been happening. When our letters to you were returned unopened, we began to fear the worst. Your poor mamma was in hysterics. I wager she is even now weeping on Mrs. Phillips' couch over you. To see you safe now. I assume I have Mr. Darcy to thank for this. I shook my head, smiling through the tears. In more ways than I can possibly tell. Mr. Bennet, Fitzwilliam said, stepping up to my side. Before more is said, you must allow me to tell you that I have come to beg your daughter's hand in marriage. Oh, I, you think I might refuse you, do you? Papa sniffed, then embraced me once more. I'm in no position to do so, am I? What Mr. Darcy is trying to say, Papa, I informed him gently, is that a full recounting of the last several weeks will sound nothing short of scandalous. You will think me ruined, I'm sure. But I assure you Mr. Darcy has been entirely honourable in every possible way and... I looked up at Fitzwilliam, filled my gaze with him and drew my courage from him. And I love him, Papa. With everything in me, I love him. My father studied me, and a smile warmed his dear face. Well then, what more am I to say? Bless you, my child, and bless you, Mr. Darcy, for returning her. He cut my cheek, then barked out a sudden laugh. Oh, wait till we tell your mother. Perhaps, Mr. Darcy, you will want to return to London before we break the news, to preserve your ears. Papa! I scolded. What, too soon? He chuckled. Has Mr. Darcy not yet learned to be teased? Lizzie, I am disappointed in you. I shall have to look further afield for a valuable son-in-law with a decent sense of humour. Uh, perhaps Mary can be induced to... Papa, where is Jane? I interrupted. Has she... Jane? He looked genuinely mystified. Why, I should think she... An urgent knock sounded at the door of the house, and Papa broke off. Ah, he grunted happily. I expect that is them now. Let them in, Hill, let them in. I glanced at Fitzwilliam, whose expression looked as foggy as I felt. What was Papa up to now? We followed him back to the door of his study, but he barely got it open before a familiar face broke into view. I felt Fitzwilliam's hand at my elbow, and he sucked in a sharp breath. It was Mr Bingley. Mr Bennet, I am sorry to trouble you, but I just had the most alarming letter this morning. There is a party who desires to purchase the lease from me for a ghastly sum. My solicitor claims the person wishes to remain anonymous, but that refusing would be impossible because... Mr Bingley stopped dead, his eyes popping and his mouth dropping open. Darcy? Fitzwilliam wasn't breathing. I could hear him trying to restart his lungs. Bingley? He gulped. Mr Bingley blinked at both of us for several seconds, then let out a sigh. Well, Mr Bennet, I believe I know who it was who wished to take over my lease on Longbourn. I do not understand. You were actually on Elba when he escaped. I heard a rumour that you were spending the winter in Scotland. I swirled Mr Bennet's brandy in my glass and sighed. And my plans were changed rather abruptly. And thank heaven they were. Indeed, so. Bingley cleared his throat. Miss Elizabeth, how, uh, how? I held up a hand. I've chosen not to question it, but to simply bask in the outcome. I cannot imagine what might have come to pass had either of us not been there for the other. Mr. Bennet chuckled. Oh, to hear my Lizzie tell it, Mr. Darcy, it was you who saved her, by carrying her out on your back, as I recall. And what was this about? Unicorns? I reddened. Hmm, yes, well, I have her to thank for the intangibles that are so much more difficult to quantify. I believe it is fair to say I... I narrowed my eyes and let out a slow breath. I saw things more clearly when I saw them through her eyes. Well said, Mr. Darcy, Mr. Bennet replied. And I dare say you have found a worthy mind to engage. Would that all men could be so fortunate. He finished with a mild snort as he sipped from his glass. 
"'What I want to know is what you mean to do about that Holt fellow,' Bingley put in. "'And those children?' "'Miss Elizabeth and I have agreed that we will care for them to the best of our ability "'until Lady Holt should claim them. "'We cannot very well keep them from their mother. "'But their father, that is another matter. "'I have people investigating the affair, and I hope to learn more very soon. "'In fact, I regret, Mr Bennet, that I shall have to return to London almost immediately.' It grieves me to leave Miss Elizabeth behind until our nuptials, but naturally it is for the best that she remain with her family. It gave her great joy to be reunited with you. Bennet nodded and rose from his seat. Well, of course, Mr Darcy, and now I fancy you both would like a moment of privacy to fight over me and whatever else might be betwixt you, like two dogs with a bone. I've no stomach for such things myself, so I believe I will go and see if Mrs Bennet has returned to find out what she thinks of our new son-in-law. He favoured me with one more smile, straightened the front of his jacket, and left us alone. Bingley was staring at his drink, biting his lips together, and blinking rapidly. I glanced at the bottom of my empty glass and set it aside. "'I've not yet asked forgiveness,' I began, a little roughly. "'Assuredly, it is in order.' "'Oh, leave off, Darcy!' Bingley sighed impatiently. "'Well?' I looked down. I cannot force you to hear my apology, certainly. I mean that you have nothing to apologise for. It was myself, truly. He finished his glass and set it on Mr Bennet's desk beside mine. I heeded your advice because I believed you had my best interests at heart. And so I did. It was my assumptions that were faulty, not my intent. And when you discovered you were in error? I cleared my throat. By then I had enough faults of my own to be sorry over. I judged many things wrongly, and felt that I had cost myself the very thing of which I had unwittingly robbed you. Perhaps I felt that to be my penance. I assumed, again wrongly, that there was nothing more to be done by either of us to set matters right. So I could only hope and pray that you never learned the full measure of what was lost to you. And when you did, and discovered that I was to blame, why, I justly deserved your wrath. Bingley shrugged and shook his head, fiddling with his thumbs as he did so. "'Oh, Darcy, you know very well that I cannot hold a grudge any longer than sand in my palm. I was only grieved to lose your friendship.' He sighed, and his eyes found mine. "'Do you know, it was seeing you in London that made the difference.' I shifted in my chair. "'How so?' "'Well, I saw your carriage down in Wapping. I assume that must have been when you were preparing to sail for France.' and it put me in mind of things I'd tried to forget, and so I had my solicitor inquire after matters in Meryton. I was considering whether I ought to try to return to Netherfield or give up my lease. That was when I learned of how matters were for the Bennets. So, really, Darcy, I do have you to thank, in a manner of speaking. I drank in a long breath, and a smile found my lips. I am glad to hear it all came right. His face beamed in genuine pleasure, Indeed. I say, were you really in love with Elizabeth Bennet all last year? I should never have guessed it. Neither did she, I grunted. You ought to have seen how shocked she was when I confessed it at last. No, oh, I cannot imagine. I trust you will tell me the rest some day. I smiled. Once I have a ring safely on Elizabeth's finger, I will be a little more comfortable examining all my follies and missteps. But for now... I rose and poured some more of Mr. Bennet's brandy for each of us. Let us begin the negotiations. I beg your pardon? I handed him his glass. We have a dispute to settle over which of us shall be the one to hold the lease on Longbourn, so the family may live here in comfort. And I am determined to outbid you. Elizabeth, you really stayed in the home of Napoleon Bonaparte. Jane had yet to unlink her arm from mine, but it would not have mattered anyway, because I could not have got up from the sofa without disturbing Poppy on my lap, or tripping over the assortment of hat boxes and fabric samples Kitty had laid out at my feet. Yes, really, I confessed with a small laugh. I hope you spat in his eye, Kitty said, with a little jerk of her head. She would do better to comport herself with decorum and dignity, the better to exhibit the sort of modesty and humility that the Emperor himself is lacking, Mary observed. Well, I'm afraid I did neither, I replied. 
I did not offend his person, but you know me too well to think I could sit demurely by. Oh, Lizzie, tell me you did not tease him, Jane cried in horror. Only a little. I squeezed her hand and smiled. But tell me, I have yet to hear how you came to be married while I was away. What happened? Jane blushed and giggled. Oh, Lizzie, you will not believe it. I think it was only a week after you left. We had just settled into the dower house. Papa was hardly speaking to anyone, and Mamma was weeping in her room, lamenting how you were lost to her. I was hardly in a better state. Why, when I think how puffy my eyes were that day. But my dear Mr. Bingley presented himself at the door and said he had heard of our misfortunes and wished to make amends for last winter. He has put Miss Bingley out of the house for her behaviour. She's living with some aunt in rather reduced circumstances. He thought I despised him, Lizzie, as he would have come sooner. He still loved you, I whispered. Oh, Jane. He did. She toyed with the ring on her hand and smiled softly. I was hardly fit to be seen, and I certainly had no expectations of encountering him again. Oh, but Lizzie, he was so dear, and I could see that he was utterly sincere in his words. Then when he went to Papa and said that he had spoken with the person who was leasing Longbourn and desired to purchase the lease from him so our family could return to the house... That is precisely what Mr. Darcy wished to do. Fancy that. I expect they are in Papa's study even now, arguing over who has the better right to be our family's saviour. He really is the sweetest man alive, Jane gushed. Then her face reddened. Oh, Mr. Bingley, that is. I suppose I cannot speak for Mr. Darcy, but I... Well, I confess, I never would have thought to call so imposing a man sweet. He can be, I said with a wicked grin but most of the time he's quite vexing indeed, in all the best ways. Jane's brow puckered. How can a man being vexing be a good thing? Oh, I shrugged vaguely, but caught Emily's eye across the room and winked at her when she snickered. He manages it. We all looked up at the sound of a carriage outside, and Kitty hopped to her feet. It's Mamma. Oh, Lizzie, you should hide. I extricated my arm from Jane's, and was in the process of dislodging Poppy from my lap. Whatever for? Kitty was peering out the window. Because she's counting the carriages in the driveway, and she's already spotted one wealthy carriage too many. Oh, mark my word, she will be calculating the size of the owner's fortune and has already selected one of us to match to him. Oh, Kitty, even Mamma is not... Oh, my dears! Mamma's voice echoed in the hall. You will not believe it. Such a fine carriage. Oh, why, he must be in speaking with Mr. Bennet now. Does anyone know who it... She stopped at the door of the drawing room and her handkerchief dropped from her hand as her mouth fell open. Lizzie! I stood sheepishly and began to tiptoe across the maze of Kitty's fashion accessories all over the floor. Good afternoon, Mamma. Oh, Lizzie, I knew how it would be. She flung herself across the room, heedless of the scattered garments. Oh, my cleverest girl, you have come home, and in such a carriage. Oh, do tell me, my dear, is he handsome? Has he a fine house? Is he everything he ought to be? I laughed and kissed my mother on the cheek. Yes, Mamma, he is. Epilogue Darcy, six months later as I watched the red billiard ball roll neatly into the corner pocket, Richard leaned over the table, expertly lining up his shot. The satisfying clack of balls colliding punctuated our conversation. There will be another treaty signed by Autumn. They're talking of sending that tyrant somewhere he shan't be able to sail away from, he muttered as he shot his ball across the table. Some island deep in the South Atlantic. It'll take him a couple of months to even get there, and to say nothing of staging another escape. I cannot see why they did not do so in the first place, I snorted. Why did no one ever think that leaving Napoleon Bonaparte only a few dozen miles off the Italian coast, within easy distance from Marseille, was not the height of foolishness? I moved into position to consider my shot, and lowered my cue into place. One hundred days was far too long to let him ravage the continent again. Richard grunted. I only wish we'd have seen it sooner. The general talked of nothing but that for weeks— he even wanted me to go to Elba myself to see if matters were brewing, but we both knew a colonel would not be welcome there. 
I almost had him talked out of the idea entirely, until he thought of begging you to go. And a lot of good that did, I grumbled as I stepped back from taking my shot. Still, I smiled as I made space for Richard. I cannot complain about how it all came out. I sent a glance up over my head, indicating the upstairs rooms where, even now, Elizabeth was probably waiting for me to leave off playing with Richard and retire to the warmth of her arms. You might be the only one who came out the winner after that affair. Well, you and Elizabeth. Richard took a step back to admire his handiwork, as another of his balls found its target. He grinned in satisfaction, then stepped back to pour a fresh glass of brandy. You know, Holt's trial was all anyone could talk about for weeks. Exiled and stripped of his titles. A fitting punishment for the blackguard, I'd say. Thanks to Wendell's testimony, I replied, taking the drink he offered. The details that man uncovered were nothing short of damning. Worse even than I expected— his account of Holt's financial dealings made the conviction inevitable. Richard raised an eyebrow, sipping his drink. Calvin's always had a knack for these things, but it was you Holt railed about the loudest during his sentencing. I nodded, my eyebrows jumping as I added some chalk to my cue. For good reason. I doubt anyone would have thought twice about him had I not seen some of his odd behaviours on Elba, particularly that girl he was with, revealing herself to be a Bonaparte sympathiser. I think if he had not so obviously tried to get me drunk, and had not drugged Elizabeth, I still might have been willing to dismiss it all as happenstance, but that was too much ill intent to overlook. I'm surprised he did not simply shove you into her room with her instead of locking you in the study. An inebriated gentleman, closed up in a room with a lady in an opiate haze, it might be days before anyone heard a word from either of you. I tossed my cue stick to the opposite hand and glared at him. I appreciate your vote of confidence in my honour. Oh, it is not your honour, I would doubt. I've learned in recent months that your lady is not one to be gainsaid when she sets her mind upon an object, and I've been the unfortunate witness of moments when that object is you, and as opium can have certain beguiling effects upon a person, especially when that person's state of self-control is already compromised by a powerful infatuation— by the by, you never did tell me which of you seduced the other one first. I narrowed my eyes and bent over the billiards table to line up my shot. There was no seduction. Ha! I don't believe that for a moment. For one thing, Miss Emily has told me some things that nearly made my hair fall out. And you believed a thirteen-year-old child? That one, yes. He leaned on his cue stick and tilted his head to examine the table. I received the final documents back for their trust. How clever of you to think of asking the general to include it for approval, with the lot for army widows and orphans. No one even blinked at it, even when an unnamed source was liquidated to fund it. Holt ought to bear the responsibility of supplying his own daughter's diaries, I grunted, as I evaluated the way the remaining balls were arranged. Twenty thousand pounds each will be a handsome settlement for them, more than enough to ensure a reputable future— as they are to remain our wards indefinitely, and the trust is anonymous, no one should ever link the name of Baron Holt to those girls. They ought to be safe from his disgrace. You never said what became of Lady Holt. She wasn't alongside her husband during the trial, and I still cannot understand why she's not appeared on your doorstep asking for her daughters. A humorless chuckle left me. No, but I did receive an audacious letter from her solicitor upon her brief return to England— demanding compensation. Richard snorted. Compensation? For what? I shrugged and lined up my shot. For robbing her of her children. A poppycock! She abandoned them! And that is precisely how my solicitor phrased my rebuttal letter. How can a mother be so unfeeling? If she really was their mother, Richard bit out sourly. You said yourself she liked to use them to look maternal and respectable, Maybe she bought them. I shook my head. I doubt that, but it doesn't matter. They're safe with us now. And their mother is somewhere in Italy, living comfortably off the thousand pounds I sent her. Richard sputted his drink all over my billiards table. You what? I shrugged. If that sum keeps her occupied and perhaps lures another unsuspecting man into her grasp, it's a price I'm willing to pay, I admitted although do not think I do not feel soiled by the association. 
It's the girls who matter, not my pride. Shaking his head, Richard clapped my shoulder. Always thinking ahead. I raised my glass with a rueful smile. To protect the innocent. Elizabeth. The gentle hum of the Pemberley household, like a lullaby, grew distant as I entered the girls' room. A few minutes more, and I meant to be tucking someone much taller into bed, someone who smelled like bay rum and saddle leather, whose laugh rumbled in his chest like rocks rolling in a stream, and who had hands soft as goose down, and a rather comprehensive understanding of how best to employ them. But for now, it was time to bid the girls good night, and as usual, a tableau of bedtime mischief greeted me when I opened the door. Poppy, up on her tiptoes, was reaching for a beloved plaything, perched precariously on the top shelf. Her face was etched with determination, as a stool wobbled beneath her. At least Bee was in bed, propped up against her pillows, utterly absorbed in the pages of a new book. Emily simply watched from the window seat, a contemplative look on her face. Poppy! Oh, I never was good at sounding stern with them. The corners of my mouth always twitched and gave me away. You cannot possibly think that's a good idea at this hour. She turned her hazel eyes to me, blinking innocently. Just one try, Lizzie. I promise I'll be quick. I shook my head. It is never just one try with you. It is time for sleep. How about we play with it first thing in the morning? She pouted for a moment before relenting. Oh, very well. Tomorrow, then. I scoop Poppy up in my arms for a good tickle before plopping her into bed. One kiss tonight and that is all. Promise. Poppy grinned, freckles dancing, and her fiery red hair scattered wildly across the pillow. Two. One. Good night. I kissed her cheek and straightened to observe B. What are you reading now? Her pale blue eyes blinked, as if only just then noticing my arrival, but then she smiled and held up the book. Samuel Johnson? M- Mr Darcy said I might read it. He does have excellent taste. Come now, you shall have to put it up for tonight. Five more m- m- minutes, she pleaded. I set my hands on my hips and sighed. How could I refuse? B was finally asking for things for herself, and her stutter was becoming less obvious all the time. Fitzwilliam and I thought between ourselves that it was mostly due to feeling safe and heard, but she was also feasting her active mind on every book she could get her hands on, and I could not possibly curtail that. Very well, five minutes. B's face lit up with gratitude. Thank you, Lizzie. With those two momentarily settled, I approached Emily's seat at the window, noting the pensive tilt of her head. Penny for your thoughts. She met my gaze, her fingers tracing a light fog on the inside of the glass. I was just thinking, we're to stay at Pemberley for good now, are we not? I lowered myself into the seat beside her. Yes, unless we go to London. But as it is the autumn season, I expect we will stay here for some months. What is it? Well, I was just thinking. I am thirteen now, so don't you think it's time I had a room of my own, like Miss Georgiana? I bit back a chuckle. Miss Georgiana is a lady, with the manners of a lady. Most of the time. Do you think you can live up to that measure? Yes, she said matter-of-factly. I smiled. Well, then, thirteen is most decidedly too old to be sharing your room with a child of seven. Emily shrugged, her demeanour all seriousness. I think so. We will chat about it with Mr Darcy over breakfast, all right? She seemed satisfied with that, nodding her agreement. I rose and turned to go, and my hand was on the latch when her voice stopped me. Lizzie? Pausing at the door, I looked back at her. Yes, dear? She hesitated, as if gathering her thoughts, then slipped out of the seat, her nightgown rustling softly. Closing the distance between us, she wrapped her arms around me in a tight embrace. Good night, she whispered. I blinked, my arm slack for an instant. But in the next breath I was hugging her close and kissing her hair. Good night, Emily. Sweet dreams, love. The clinking of billiards was enough to tell me exactly where to find Fitzwilliam, 
Of course, he was still knocking balls around with Richard. I sighed as I leaned against the door and listened to their conversation, laughed when Richard jested about locking us in a room together, touched my lips and blinked with pride as Fitzwilliam told of how he'd protected the girls. And then I decided I'd heard enough. Richard, I said from the doorway, it's my turn now. Colonel Fitzwilliam turned round, his brows arched. Well, well, so it is. He clapped Fitzwilliam in the chest with his billiards cue. Hate to disoblige the lady of the house, Darcy. Put that up for me, will you? Fitzwilliam chuckled as he took it, and Richard sauntered close. He held out his hand, asking for mine, and when I gave it, he kissed my fingers. He's had quite enough brandy to soften him up, Richard murmured in my ear. Go easy on the man, eh, Elizabeth? I laughed as the door closed behind him. Good night, Richard. Fitzwilliam was wiping the chalk from his hands, a smile deepening on his cheeks as I walked toward him. I thought you would be in bed already, he said gently. I wrapped my arms up around his shoulders. Disappointed, are you? No. He laced his hands around my waist and kissed my forehead. I can ravish you here as well as there. Oh, can you? I'd like to see that. Then you shall. He picked me up and turned, sliding my backside onto the billiards table, and then he braced his arms behind me in a kiss that bent me backward and bared my throat to his mouth. Oh, I loved it when he did that, and I knotted my fingers in his hair to show him that much. Aren't you going to carry me upstairs now? Cause a scene to make the servants whisper. I gasped when my fichu hit the floor, followed by some of the pins from my hair. Of course, afterward, and then I mean to feast on you all over again, he rasped in my ear. No complaints, I hope. I pushed his head up a fraction to look him in the eyes. Fizzy, you're drunk. What's your point? He trailed his lips down my throat to my collarbone, tightening his arms around my waist. You've never complained about any of the unusual locations we've found ourselves in before. I'd be disappointed if you started now. Never, I agreed, sliding my hands down his broad back. The man really was delicious. His laughter rumbled against my skin, sending shivers into all the places only he could reach. Then he tangled his fingers into the hair, spilling from my pins, and pulled back to look into my eyes. And he went entirely still for a moment. I touched his cheek, smiling softly. Fitzwilliam Darcy, are you even breathing? He turned his face to kiss my palm. No, I've died and gone to heaven, love, carried away on the four winds, off to unknown shores, and I found you there, waiting for me. This has been Mr Darcy and the Governess, written by Alex James. Narrated by Stevie Zimmerman. Copyright Winsome Wit Publishing. Copyright Winsome Wit Publishing. 2023. Production Copyright Winsome Wit Publishing.